we're moving on to book five. Apparently in no apparent order, <laughs> we are on the book of manuscripts. I hope you enjoy. If you're new, please subscribe to the channel. Um, this is Colbrum Bible Book 5. Thank you for the supporters and our new Patreon members and our new channel members. Um, you are helping us level up tremendously. Please share, comment, and like if you enjoy this. Uh, let's get right into it. The Book of Manuscripts Men forget the days of the destroyer. Only the wise know where it went and that it will return in its appointed hour. Chapter 1 Scroll of Imad The writings from olden days tell of strange things and of great happenings in the times of our fathers who lived in the beginning. All men can know of such times is declared in the Book of Ages, but the gods had their birth in events and things which were in the beginning. It is told in the courtyards, and there was a time when heaven and earth were not apart. Truth echoes even there, for heaven and earth are yet joined in men. It is written that God once walked the earth with a man, and dwelt within a cave above a garden where man labored. God encompasses all that is and cannot be contained in a cave. Look to the sacred writings for truth. It is told that woman made God angry, and he took himself into the sky, removing heaven from man because of his disgust for woman. It is also told that man offended God by imitating him. These are tales made by man. This is not wisdom, for the sacred writings reveal the plans of God, and these things cannot be as told. It is the talk of the courtyard. It is the knowledge of the outer place. Men talk of the land of Oban from whence they came. Not from Oban towards the south came men, for the great land of Ramakui first felt his step. Out by the encircling waters, over at the rim it lay. There were mighty men in those days and of their land. The first book speaks thus. Their dwelling places were set in the swamp lands from whence no mountains rose, in the land of many waters slow flowing to the sea. In the shallow lake lands among the mud, out beyond the great plain of reeds, at the place of many flowers bedecking plant and tree, where trees grew beards and had branches like ropes, which bound them together, for the ground would not support them. There were butterflies like birds, and spiders as large as the outstretched arms of a man. The birds of the air and fishes of the waters had hues which dazzled the eyes. They lured men to destruction. Even insects fed on the flesh of men. There were elephants in great numbers with mighty curved tusks. The pillars of the netherworld were unstable, in a great night of destruction. The land fell into an abyss and was lost forever. When the earth became light next day, man saw man driven to madness. All was gone. Men clothed themselves with the skins of beasts and were eaten by wild beasts. Things with clashing teeth used them for food. A great horde of rats devoured everything so that man died of hunger. The brain eaters hunted men down and slew them. Children wandered the plain land like the wild beasts, for men and women became stricken with a sickness that passed over the children, and issue covered their bodies which swelled up and burst while flame consumed their bellies. Every man who had an issue of seed within him, and every woman who had a flow of blood, died. The children grew up without instruction, and having no knowledge, churned to strange ways and beliefs. They became divided according to their tongues. This was the land from whence man came. The Great One came from Ramakui, and wisdom came from Zador. The people who came with Nadi were wise in the ways of the seasons and in the winsome of the stars. They read the book of heaven with understanding. They covered their dead with potter's clay and hardened it, for it was not their custom to place their dead in boxes. Those who came with the Great One were cunning craftsmen in stone. They were carvers of wood and ivory. 
the high god was worshipped with strange light in places of great silences. They paid homage to the huge, sleeping beast in the depths of the sea, believing it to bear the earth on its back. They believed its stirrings plunged lands to destruction. Some said it buried beneath them. In Ramakui, there was a great city with roads and waterways, and the fields were bounded with walls of stone and channels. In the center of the land was the great flat-topped mountain of God. The city had walls of stone and was decorated with stones of red and black, white shells and feathers. There were heavy green stones in the land and stones patterned in green, black, and brown. There were stones of Saka which men cut for ornaments, stones which became molten for cunning work. They built walls of black glass and bound them with glass by fire. They used strange fire from the netherworld which was but slightly separated from them, and foul air from the breath of the damned rose in their midst. They made eye reflectors of glass stone which cured the ills of men. And they purified men with a strange metal and purged them of evil spirits and flowing fire. We dwell in a land of three peoples, but those who came from Ramakui and Zador were fewer in numbers. It was the men of Zador who built the great guardian, which ever watches, looking towards the awakening place of God. The day he comes not, its voice will be heard. In olden times, when men lived in the ground, there came the great ones whose name is hidden, son of Hem, son of the sun, chief of the guardians of mysteries, master of rites and the spoken word, judge of disputes, advocate of the dead, interpreter of the gods, and father of fishermen. From the west, beyond Mandi, came the great one arrayed in robes of black linen and wearing a headdress of red. Who taught men the secret of writing and numbers, and the measurements of the years? Who taught the ways of the days and the months? Who read the meaning of clouds and the writing of the nightlights? Who taught the preservation of the body, that the soul might commune with the living, and that it might be a doorway to the earth? Who taught that light is life? Who taught the words of God which spoke to men and hid things from them, which stood in the place of truth for those with understanding? Which spoke to the priests, the scribes, and the people differently according to their enlightenment? Who taught that beyond the visible is the invisible, beyond the small and the smaller, and beyond the great and the greater, and all things are linked together in one? Who taught the song of the stars? which now no man knows, and the words of the water which are lost, who taught men to grow corn and to spin, to make bricks and fashion stone after a cunning manner, who taught men the rituals of seashells and the reading of their mysteries and the manner of their speech, who taught men the nature and knowledge of God, but in the years left to him could not bring them to understanding, who then veiled the great secrets in simple tales which they could remember, and in signs which would not be lost to their children's children. Who brought the sacred eye from the distant land and the stone of light made of water, by which men see God, and the fire stone which gathers the light of the sun before the great shrine? He died in the manner of men, though his likeness is that of a god. Then they cut him apart, that his body might make fertile the fields and took away his head, that it might bring them wisdom. His bones they did not paint red, for they were not as those of the others. These are the words of the sacred writings, recorded after the old custom. As they are, so let them be, for that which is recorded remains with you. The stone of light and the fire stone were stolen in the days of disaster, and none now knows their resting place. Therefore, the land is empty. Chapter 2 The Scroll of Kamushahre In this fertile black land, there are those who worship the sun, and they call it the greatest and the most bountiful among all gods, the seer of heaven, the orb of glory. They tell many tales about the coming of the sun people and of the land from whence they came. 
They also tell of the squalid manner in which men dwelt before the Golden One led his people hence. He came to this fertile land. Now, it is a pleasant place with many great cities and contented villages. There is the great broad river of fresh water which rises and falls in its due seasons. Channels there are and waterways which lead the fertilizing waters unto the great growing things, the herbage and the trees. There are flocks of sheep and herds of cattle on the green pastures. It was not ever thus in the days before Haretka came. All was barren and desolate. Not divided the wilderness from the swamplands filled with reeds. Then there were no cattle or sheep, and the land knew not the hand of man. It lay untilled and unwatered. No land was sown, for they who dwelt in it knew not the making of waterways, nor did they know how to command the water and make it flow at their behest. There were no cities, and men dwelt in holes in the ground or in places where the rock was cleft. They walked in their nakedness or clothed themselves with leaves or bark, while at night they covered themselves with the skin of wild beasts. They fought with the jackal for food and snatched dead things from the lion. They pulled roots from out of the ground and sought for sustenance among things that grew in the mud. They had none to rule over them, nor had they leaders to guide. They knew not obligation or duty. None spoke to them about their manner of life, and none knew the way of truth. They were truly unenlightened in those days. Then came the servants of the sun, and he it was who brought the people together and put rulers over them. He set Ramur up as king over the whole land. He showed them man and woman how to dwell together in contentment as husband and wife, and he divided their tasks between them. He instructed men in the sowing of corn and the growing of herbs. He instructed them in the tilling of the ground and the manner of cutting the waterways and channels. He it was who showed men the ways of the beasts of the field. He instructed men in the working of gold and silver and making of vessels from clay. He instructed men in the hewing and cutting of stone and the building of temples and cities. The making of linen and dyeing of cloth that forms garments ever pleasing to the eyes, he did not teach. The making of linen and the dyeing of cloth that forms garments ever pleasing to the eyes, he did not teach. Neither did he instruct them in the making of bricks or the working of copper. Then. When he departed, he bade the people not to weep, for though he went to his father, the son would adopt them as his children, and all could become sons of the son. Thus many became sons and servants of the son, and they believed what they had heard, that the son was their father and the light of goodness, overlooking the whole land. It is this light that sustains all living things, but within it the greater light which sustains the spirit. It is the light that enlightens the hearts of men. There are lesser lights that guide men about their daily tasks and shield them from harm. There are unseen lights that influence men for good or ill. But it is the great light that banishes coldness and makes all men warm. The warmth it bestows ripens the harvests of man and makes his herds yield their increase. It oversees the whole activity of men on earth as it journeys the skies from one end to the other. Thus, it knows the needs of all men. Therefore, be like the sun. Be far-seeing and foresighted. Be regular in your comings and goings while about your daily tasks. When their guide and leader left, the people knew themselves as children of the sun. They were warlike and subdued other people in its name and brought them under its rule. Then, great temples were raised up to it, and for a time it displaced the greater gods which the people of this land had set up in their ignorance. The one true God, it never displaced. For the true God was ever hidden from the eyes of the profane and ignorant. Then some priests among those who followed the rule of the sun stole its spirit and brought it down so that it enlivened the statues and images of their gods. Thus the spirit, which enlivens all the lesser gods, is but the one spirit held in captivity, and not many as the other people think. 
Then came the wise ones, the wise ones from the east, and they caused the people to have other thoughts. They were men who knew the ways of heaven and asked of the people, Is the sun spirit indeed supreme? Is this not a thing requiring much thought? Consider its movements. Are they not more like those of one who is directed in his comings and goings? Does it move about freely as it wills, or is it restricted and held to its appointed path, like a yoked ox or as the ass treading out corn? Does it rise up from the netherworld as it wills or go down into the cavern of darkness by its own decree? Is its path not more like that of a stone hurled forth by the hand of man? Is it not like a boat controlled by the will of a man, rather than a free-ranging god? Is it not more like a slave under the direction of a master? These things disturbed the hearts of the people. Some pondered upon them, but others, in the manner of men, cried death to those who deny the truth of these things. However, because of the things said, the worship of the older gods grew in strength, for the people had never turned from Sira, who was with them before the first water channel was cut. He was not the god of the highborn, but of the lowly people. This is a land of two peoples, of two nations, two priesthoods, two streams of wisdom, and two hierarchies of gods. It is a land where the light of truth burns brightly, though hidden away from the eyes of all but a few. It is the land of dawning on earth. Chapter 3 The Destroyer Part 1 Men forget the days of the Destroyer. Only the wise know where it went, and that it will return in its appointed hour. It raged across the heavens in the days of wrath, and this was its likeness. It was as a billowing cloud of smoke enwrapped in a ready glow, not distinguishable in joints or limb. Its mouth was an abyss from which came flame, smoke, and hot cinders. When ages pass, certain laws operate upon the stars in the heavens. Their ways change. There is movement and restlessness. They are no longer constant, and a great light appears redly in the skies. When blood drops upon the earth, the destroyer will appear, and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ashes. Trees will be destroyed and all living things engulfed. Waters will be swallowed up by the land and seas will boil. The heavens will burn brightly and redly. There will be a copper hue over the face of the land, followed by a day of darkness. A new moon will appear and break up and fall. The people will scatter in madness. They will hear the trumpet and battle cry of the destroyer and will seek refuge within dens in the earth. Terror will eat away their hearts and their courage will flow from them like water from a broken pitcher. They will be eaten up in the flames of wrath and consumed by the death of the destroyer. Thus it was in the days of heavenly wrath, which have gone, and thus it will be in the days of doom, when it comes again. The times of its coming and going are known unto the wise. These are the signs and times which shall precede the destroyer's return. A hundred and ten generations shall pass into the west, and nations will rise and fall. Men will fly in the air as birds and swim in the seas as fishes. Men will talk peace with one another. Hypocrisy and deceit shall have their day. Women will be as men and men as women. Passion will be a plaything of man. A nation of soothsayers shall rise and fall, and their tongue shall be the speech of learned. A nation of lawgivers shall rule the earth and pass away into nothingness. One worship will pass into the four quarters of the earth, talking peace and bringing war. A nation of the seas will be greater than any other, but will be as an apple rotten at the core and will not endure. A nation of traitors will destroy men with wonders and it shall have its day. Then shall the high strive with the low, the north with the south, the east with the west, and the light with the darkness. 
Men shall be divided by their races, and the children will be born as strangers among them. Brother shall strive with brother, and husband with wife. Fathers will no longer instruct their sons, and the sons will be wayward. Women will become the common property of men, and will no longer be held in regard and respect. Then men will be ill at ease in their hearts. They will seek they know not what, and uncertainty and doubt will trouble them. They will possess great riches, but be poor in spirit. Then will the heavens tremble and the earth move. Men will quake in fear. And while terror walks with them, the heralds of doom will appear. They will come softly as thieves to the tombs. Men will not know them for what they are. Men will be deceived. The hour of the destroyer is at hand. In those days, men will have the great book before them. Wisdom will be revealed. The few will be gathered for the stand. It is the hour of trial. The dauntless ones will survive. The stout-hearted will not go down to destruction. Great God of all ages alike to all who sets the trials of man, be merciful to our children in the days of doom. Man must suffer to be great, but hasten not his progress unduly. In the great winnowing, be not too harsh on the lesser ones among men. Even the son of a thief has become your scribe. Chapter 4 The Destroyer Part 2 O sentinels of the universe who watch for the destroyer, how long will your enduring vigil last? O mortal men who wait without understanding, where will you hide yourselves in the dread days of doom? When the heavens shall be torn apart and the skies rent in twain, in the days when children will turn gray-headed. This is the thing which will be seen. This is the terror your eyes will behold. This is the form of destruction that will rush upon you. There will be the great body of fire, the glowing head with many mouths and eyes ever changing. Terrible teeth will be seen in formless mouths and a fearful dark belly will glow redly from fires inside. Even the most stout-hearted man will tremble and his bowels will be loosened for this is not a thing understandable to men. It will be a vast sky-spanning form and wrapping the entire earth, burning with many hues within wide open mouths. These will descend to sweep across the face of the land, engulfing all in the yawning jaws. The greatest warriors will charge against it in vain. The fangs will fall out and lo, they are terror-inspiring things of cold, hardened water. Great boulders will be hurled down upon men, crushing them into red powder. As the great salt waters rise up in its train and roaring torrents pour towards the land, even the heroes among mortal men will be overcome with madness as moths fly swiftly to their doom in the burning flame. So will these men rush to their own destruction. The flames going before will devour all the works of men. The waters following will sweep away whatever remains. The dew of death will fall softly as a gray carpet over the cleared land. Men will cry out in their madness. O oh, whatever being there is, save us from this tall form of terror. Save us from the gray dew of death. Chapter 5 The Destroyer Part 3 the doom shape, called the destroyer in Egypt, was seen in all the lands thereabouts. In color, it was bright and fiery, in appearance changing and unstable. It twisted about itself like a coil, like water bubbling into a pool from an underground supply. And all men agree it was a most fearsome sight. It was not a great comet or a loosened star, being more like a fiery body of flame. Its movements on high were slow. Below it swirled in the manner of smoke and it remained close to the sun, whose face it hid. There was a bloody redness about it, which changed as it passed along its course. It caused death and destruction in its rising and setting. It swept the earth with gray cinder rain and caused many plagues, hunger, and other evils. 
It bit the skin of men and beast until they became mottled with sores. The earth was troubled and shook. The hills and the mountains moved and rocked. The dark smoke-filled heavens bowed over earth, and a great howl came to the ears of living men, borne to them upon the wings of the wind. It was the cry of the Dark Lord, the master of dread. Thick clouds of fiery smoke passed before him, and there was an awful hail of hot stones and coals of fire. The doom shape thundered sharply in the heavens and shot out bright lightings. The channels of water were churned back unto themselves when the lands tilted, and great trees were tossed about and snapped like twigs. Then, a voice like ten thousand trumpets was heard over the wilderness, and before its burning breath the flames parted. The whole of the land moved, and mountains melted. The sky itself roared like ten thousand lions in agony, and bright arrows of blood sped back and forth across its face. Earth swelled up like bread upon the hearth. This was the aspect of the doom shape, called the destroyer, when it appeared in days long gone by, in olden times. It is thus described in the old records, a few of which remain. It is said that when it appears in the heavens above, earth splits open from the heat, like a nut roasted before the fire. Then, flames shoot up through the surface and leap about like fiery fiends upon black blood. The moisture inside the land is all dried up. The pastures and cultivated places are consumed in flames, and they and all trees become white ashes. The doom shape is like a circling ball of flame, which scatters small fiery offspring in its train. It covers about a fifth part of the sky and sends writhing snake-like fingers down to earth. Before it, the sky appears frightened and it breaks up and scatters away. Midday is no brighter than night. It spawns a host of terrible things. These are things said of the destroyer. Read them with solemn heart, knowing that the doom shape has its appointed time and will return. It would be foolish to let them go unheeded. Now, men say, such things are not destined for our days. May the great God above grant that this may be so. But come, the day surely will, and in accordance with his nature, man will be unprepared. Chapter 6 the Dark Days The Dark Days began with the last visitation of the Destroyer, and they were foretold by strange omens in the sky. All men were silent and went about with pale faces. The leaders of the slaves, which had built a city to the glory of Thom, stirred up unrest, and no man raised his arm against them. They foretold the great events of which the people were ignorant and of which the temple seers were not informed. These were the days of ominous calm when the people waited for they knew what not. The presence of an unseen doom was felt. The hearts of men were stricken. Laughter was heard no more, and grief and wailing sounded throughout the land. Even the voices of children were stilled, and they did not play together, but stood silent. The slaves became bold and insolent, and women were the possession of any man. Fear walked the land, and women became barren with terror, they could not conceive, and those with child aborted. All men closed up within themselves. The days of stillness were followed by a time when the noise of trumpeting and shrilling was heard in the heavens, and the people became as frightened beasts without a herdsman, as asses when lions prowl without their fold. The people spoke of the god of the slaves, and reckless men said, if we knew where this god were to be found, we would sacrifice to him. But the god of the slaves was not among them. He was not to be found within the swamplands or in the brick pits. His manifestation was in the heavens for all men to see, but they did not see with understanding. Nor would any god listen, for all were dumb because of the hypocrisy of men. The dead were no longer sacred and were thrown into the waters. Those already entombed were neglected, and many became exposed. They lay unprotected against the hands of thieves. He who once toiled long in the sun bearing the yoke himself now possessed oxen. 
He who grew no grain now owned a storehouse full. He who once dwelt at ease among his children now thirsted for water. He who once sat in the sun with crumbs and dregs was now bloated with food. He reclined in the shade, his bowels overflowing. Cattle were left unattended to roam into strange pastures, and men ignored their marks and slew the beasts of their neighbors. No man owned anything. The public records were cast forth and destroyed, and no man knew who were slaves and who were masters. The people cried out to be Pharaoh in their distress, but he stopped his ears and acted like a deaf man. There were those who spoke falsely before Pharaoh and had gods hostile towards the land. Therefore the people cried out for their blood to appease it. But it was not these strange priests who put strife in the land instead of peace. For one was even of the household of Pharaoh and walked among the people unhampered. Dust and smoke, clouds darkened the sky and colored the waters upon which they fell with a bloody hue. Plague was throughout the land, the river was bloody, and blood was everywhere. The water was vile and men's stomachs shrank from drinking. Those who did drink from the river vomited it up, for it was polluted. The dust tore wounds in the skin of man and beast. The glow of the destroyer, the earth, was filled with redness. Vermin bred and filled the air and face of the earth with lonesomeness. Wild beasts afflicted with torments under the lashing sand and ashes came out of their lairs in the wastelands and cave places and stalked the abodes of men. All the tame beasts whimpered, and the land was filled with the cries of sheep and moans of cattle. Trees throughout the land were destroyed, and no herb or fruit was to be found. The face of the land was battered and devastated by a hail of stones, which smashed down all that stood in the path of the torrents. They swept down in hot showers, and strange flowing fire ran along the ground in their wake. The fish of the river died in the polluted waters. Worms, insects, and reptiles sprang up from the earth in huge numbers. Great gusts of wind brought swarms of locusts, which covered the sky. As the destroyer flung itself through the heavens, it blew great gusts of cinders across the face of the land. The gloom of a long night spread a dark mantle of blackness with extinguished every ray of light. None knew when it was day and when it was night, for the sun cast no shadow. The darkness was not the clean blackness of night, but a thick darkness in which the breath of men was stopped in their throats. Men gasped in a hot cloud of vapor, which enveloped all the land and stuffed out all lamps and fires. Men were benumbed and lay moaning in their beds. None spoke to another or took food, for they were overwhelmed with despair. Ships were sucked away from their moorings and destroyed in great whirlpools. It was a time of undoing. The earth turned over as clay spun upon a potter's wheel. The whole land was filled with uproar from the thunder of the destroyer overhead and the cry of the people. There was the sound of moaning and lamentation on every side. The earth spewed up its dead. Corpses were cast up out of their resting places and the embalmed were revealed to the sight of all men. Pregnant women miscarried and the seed of men was stopped. The craftsman left his task undone. The potter abandoned his wheel and the carpenter his tools, and they departed to dwell in the marshes. All crafts were neglected, and the slaves lured the craftsmen away. The dues of Pharaoh could not be collected, for there was neither wheat nor barley, goose nor fish. The rights of the Pharaoh could not be enforced, for the fields of grain and the pastures were destroyed. The high-born and the lowly prayed together that life might come to an end and the turmoil and thundering ceased to beat upon their ears. Terror was the companion of men by day and horror the companion by night. Men lost their senses and became mad. They were distracted by frightfulness. On the great night of the destroyer's wrath, when its terror was at its height, there was a hail of rocks, and the earth heaved as pain rent her bowels. Gates, columns, and walls were consumed by fire, and the statues of gods were overthrown and broken. 
people fled outside their dwellings in fear and were slain by the hail. Those who took shelter from the hail were swallowed when the earth split open. The habitations of men collapsed upon those inside, and there was panic on every hand. But the slaves who lived in huts in the reedlands, at the place of pits, were spared. The land burnt like tinder, and man watched upon his rooftops, and the heavens hurled wrath upon him, and he died. The land writhed under the wrath of the destroyer and groaned with the agony of Egypt. It took itself, and the temples and palaces of the nobles were thrown down from their foundations. The highborn ones perished in the midst of the ruins, and all of the strength of the land was stricken. Even the great one, the firstborn of Pharaoh, died with the highborn in the midst of the terror and falling stones. The children of princes were cast out into the streets, and those who were not cast out died within their abodes. There were nine days of darkness and upheaval, while a tempest raged such as never had been before. When it passed away, brother buried brother throughout the land. Men rose up against those in authority and fled from the cities to dwell in tents in the outlands. Egypt lacked great men to deal with the times. The people were weak from fear and bestowed gold, silver, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, and copper upon the slaves and to their priests they gave chalices, urns, and ornaments. Pharaoh alone remained calm and strong in the midst of confusion. The people turned to wickedness. They turned to wickedness and their weakness and despair. Harlots walked through the streets unashamed. Women paraded their limbs and flaunted their womanly charms. Highborn women were in rags and virtuous were mocked. The slaves, spared by the destroyer, left the accursed land forthwith. Their multitude moved in the gloom of a half-dawn, under a mantle of fine, swirling gray ash, leaving the burnt fields and shattered cities behind. Many Egyptians attached themselves to the host, for one who was great led them forth, a priest prince of the inner courtyard. Fire mounted up on high, and its burning left with the enemies of Egypt. It rose up from the ground as a fountain and hung as a curtain in the sky. In seven days, by Remoir, the accursed ones journeyed to the waters. They crossed the heaving wilderness while the hills melted around them. Above, the skies were torn with lightning. They were sped by terror, but their feet became entangled in the land and the wilderness shut them in. They knew not the way, for no sign was constant before them. They churned before Nashari and stopped at Shokoth, the place of quarries. They passed the waters of Maha and came by the valley of Pikaroth, northward of Mara. They came up against the waters which blocked their way, and their hearts were despair. The night was a night of fear and dread, for there was a high moaning above, and black winds from the underworld were loosed, and fire sprang up from the ground. The hearts of the slaves shrank within them. For they knew the wrath of Pharaoh followed them, and that there was no way of escape. They hurled abuse on those who led them. Strange rites were performed along the shore that night. The slaves disputed among themselves, and there was violence. Pharaoh had gathered his army and followed the slaves. After he departed, there were riots and disorders behind him, for the cities were plundered. The laws were cast out of the judgment halls and trampled underfoot in the streets. The storehouses and granaries were burst open and robbed. Roads were flooded, and none could pass along them. People lay dead on every side. The palace was split, and the princes and officials fled, so that none was left with authority to command. The lists of numbers were destroyed, public places were overthrown, and households became confused and unknown. Pharaoh pressed on in sorrow, for behind him all was desolation and death. Before him were things he could not understand, and he was afraid. But he carried himself well and stood before his host with courage. He sought to bring back the slaves, for the people said their magic was greater than the magic of Egypt. The host of Pharaoh came upon the slaves by the saltwater shores, but was held back from them by a breath of fire. A great cloud was spread over the hosts and darkened the sky. None could see, except for the fiery glow and unceasing lightings which rent the covering cloud overhead. 
A whirlwind arose in the east and swept over the encamped host. A gale raged all night, and in the red twilight dawn there was a movement of the earth. The waters receded from the shore and were rolled back on themselves. There was a strange silence. And then, in the gloom, it was seen that the waters had parted, leaving a passage between. The land had risen, but it was disturbed and trembled. The way was not straight or clear. The waters about were as if spun within a bowl. The swampland alone remained undisturbed. From the horn of the destroyer came a high, shrilling noise which stopped the ears of men. The slaves had been making sacrifices in despair. Their lamentations were loud. Now, before the strange sight, there was hesitation and doubt. For the space of a breath, they stood still and silent. Then all was confusion and shouting, some pressing forward into the waters against all who sought to flee back from the unstable ground. Then, in exaltation, their leader led them into the midst of the waters through the confusion. Yet many sought to turn back into the host behind them, while others fled along the empty shores. All became still over the sea and upon the shore, but behind, the earth shook and boulders split with a great noise. The wrath of heaven was removed to a distance and stood upwards of the two hosts. Still, the host of Pharaoh held its ranks, firm and resolved before the strange and awful happenings, and undaunted by the fury which raged by their side. Stern faces were lit darkly by the fiery curtain. Then, the fury departed, and there was silence. Stillness spread over the land while the host of Pharaoh stood without movement in the red glow. Then, with a shout, the captains went forward, and the host rose up behind them. The curtain of fire had rolled up into a dark, billowing cloud which spread out as a canopy. There was a stirring of the waters. But they followed the evildoers past the place of the great whirlpool. The passage was confused in the midst of the waters and the ground beneath unstable. Here, in the midst of a tumult of waters, Pharaoh fought against the hindmost of the slaves and prevailed over them. And there was a great slaughter amid the sand, the swamp, and the water. The slaves cried out in despair, but their cries were unheeded. Their possessions were scattered behind them as they fled, so that the way was easier for them than for those who followed. Then the stillness was broken by a mighty roar, and through the pillars of cloud the wrath of the destroyer descended upon the hosts. The heavens roared as with a thousand thunders, the bowels of the earth were sundered, and earth shrieked its agony. The cliffs were torn away and cast down, the dry ground fell beneath the waters, and great waves broke upon the shore, sweeping in rocks from seaward. The great surge of rocks and waters overwhelmed the chariots of the Egyptians who went before the footmen. The chariot of the Pharaoh was hurled into the air as if by a mighty hand and was crushed in the midst of the rolling waters. Tidings of the disaster came back to Rajab, son of Thomas who hastened on ahead of the terrified survivors because of his burning. He brought reports unto the people that the host had been destroyed by blast and deluge. The captains had gone, the strong men had fallen, and none remains to command. Therefore the people revolted because of the calamities which had befallen them. Cowards slunk from their lairs and came forth boldly to assume the high offices of the dead. Comely and noble women, their protectors gone, were their prey. Of the slaves, the greater number had perished before the host of Pharaoh. The broken land lay helpless, and invaders came out of the gloom-like carrion. A strange people came up against Egypt, and none stood to fight, for strength and courage were gone. The invaders, led by al Kenan, came up out of the land of gods, because of the wrath of heaven which had laid their land waste. There, too, had been a plague of reptiles and ants, signs and omens and earthquake. There also had been turmoil and disaster, disorder and famine. All with the gray breath of the destroyer sweeping the ground and stopping the breath of men. 
Ansura gathered together the remnants of his fighting men and fighting men who were left in Egypt and set forth to meet the children of darkness who came out of the eastern mountains by way of the wilderness and by way of Yathnobis. They fell upon the stricken land from behind the gray cloud, before the lifting of the darkness and before the coming of the purifying winds. Rajeb went with Pharaoh and met the invaders at Herosher, but the hearts of the Egyptians were faint within them. Their spirits were no longer strong, and they fell away before the battle was lost, deserted by the gods above and below. Their dwellings destroyed, their households scattered, they were as men already half dead. Their hearts were filled with terror and the memory of the wrath, the wrath which had struck them from out of heaven. They were still filled with the memory of the fearsome sights of the destroyer, and they knew not what they did. Pharaoh did not return to his city. He lost his heritage and was seized by a demon for many days. His women were polluted and his estates plundered. The children of darkness defiled the temples with rams and ravished women who were crazed and did not resist. They enslaved all who were left, the old, young men, boys. They oppressed the people and their delight was in mutilation and torture. Pharaoh abandoned his hopes and fled into the wilderness beyond the province of the lake, which is in the west towards the south. He lived a goodly life among the sand wanderers and wrote books. Good times came again, even under the invaders, and ships sailed upstream. The air was purified, the breath of the destroyer passed away, and the land became filled again with growing things. Life was renewed throughout the whole land. Kyre taught these things to the children of light in the days of darkness, after the building of the Rambudeth, before the death of Pharaoh Ankit. This is written in this land and in our tongue, by Luadar, who himself chose it for saving. It was not seen until the latter days. Chapter 7 Third Egyptian Scroll this is the manner whereby the sacred records shall be kept, and their number is twelve books and four hundred and forty-two scrolls. Four copies shall be made, and each shall be rolled on a stick of blackwood. Each shall be enclosed within a pickled skin and bound with a leather throng. It shall be placed with spices in a box of copper, which shall be enclosed in a box of wood bound about with hide and pitched. At each of the four appointed places, shall be four hewn masonry receptacles, within which shall be contained the great arcs. They shall be kept by the guardians at the four quarters of the earth, and no copies shall be made except one be destroyed. Nothing shall be added, and nothing taken away from the books, except to be done according to the books, and the signs of the books shall be counted according to the custom of writing. Chapter 8 Fourth Egyptian Scroll Man directs his life by the laws of God and the statutes of men. The statutes of men, which are for the good of men, are to be upheld by the children of light who shall not live for the next life alone. These laws, though stricken on marble and set up on everlasting pillars at the gateways of the temples, are but diversions for the eye and exercise for the tongue, unless graven also on the tablets of your heart. Thus, you shall not fall into error. A man does not obey the statutes because they are the law of the land, but because they are accord with his nature and inclinations. The true nature of man stems from the godly directive within and is therefore above the edicts of kings. In upholding the laws and statutes, the chief concern should be a man's good intent. If he intends well and is diligent, he can be forgiven much, but if he intends well and is thoughtless, then he shall not be looked upon so kindly. Remember, men do not dispense justice. They can but hope to serve it. God alone knows who is good or wicked within his heart. Therefore, he alone can dispense true justice. These are the laws by which man will live. A man will not have intercourse with a woman child. A man may not rob another with violence or plunder or steal. A man will not slay willfully. 
a man will not cheat another or act deceitfully towards him. A man will not utter lies to lead another into error. A man will not carry off food so that another is deprived of the fruits of his labor. A man will not utter words of blasphemy or use foul language. A man will not trespass upon the privacy of another or violate the sanctity of his household. A man will not pillage the grain land or spoil the pastures. A man will not listen in secret to the speech of others. A man will not practice degrading things. A man will not slander another. A man will not have intercourse with the wife of another man. A man will not pollute himself. A man will not leave his household to go abroad about his task unwashed. A man will not terrorize the unprotected or unreasonably attack any man. A man will not break the just statutes of the land. A man will not stir up strife maliciously. A man will not make women and children weep in fear. A man will not commit any deed of impurity. A man will not pass judgment hastily or in the grip of wrath. A man will not unnecessarily associate with half-men or cowards. A man will not be foul running waters. A man will not curse the sacred things. A man will not reject his kinfolk or leave his children unprotected. A man will not use what another has used after his death. A man will not lie with a pregnant woman three months before she gives birth. A man will not revile his parents. A man will not mock the afflicted. A man will not expose his nakedness to maidens or children. A man will not torment the helpless or corrupt the young. A man will not associate with thieves and deceivers. A man will not harbor an adulterer. A man will not pander to the lusts and weaknesses of others or seek to profit by them. A man will not raise a harlot above her chosen station. A man will not desert the path of duty, even though it lead him down to death. A man will not turn a blind eye to wickedness. A man will not speak in language of slaves. A man is ever a man. He abides by these things because he is a man. If he turn aside from even one of them, may he be cursed with the triple curse. Chapter 9 The Half Scroll of Jesup A man is not a man in the eyes of God according to the standards of men, but according to the standards of God. A man is silent and calm. He stands steady like a rock amidst the tumult of raging waters. He bears himself patiently before the temper of a wrathful man and controls himself in the presence of a fool. His decisions are made clearly and without undue haste. He is prepared for whatever may befall. His reckoning embraces both success and failure. A man judges all men equally by one standard and expects each to act according to his capacity. He is prepared to meet strength with strength. He does not shirk the issue with violent men, nor does he suppress his wrath when the cause is just. A man safeguards his reputation and challenges those who would steal it from him. He is prudent and wary. He is not easily beguiled. He weighs all things in his mind and concludes all things by reasoning. A man receives the stranger with hospitality and politeness. He gives generously to the needy and eases the burden of the heavy laden. He is cheerful under difficulties, and his face is never sullen or mean. A man never fawns upon his superiors, nor does he oppress his subordinates. He is neither a hypocrite nor a coward. He does not mock the afflicted, and his arm is ready to their assistance. If he sees evil men at work, he does not turn aside. A man is impartial in his dealings. He is fair and just to all men. He understands the duties and responsibilities of a man and places these before his own welfare. He does not seek the places of pleasure when there is a task at hand. A man befriends the friendless and oppressed. He supports the man in want. He respects the aged and infirm. He acts for the ignorant and shields them from the designs of crafty men. He instructs the unlearned. He makes peace when the peace is just and war when the war is just. A man never betrays a friend, nor does he avoid him in his time of trouble. His friendship is not a thing of thistledown, to be blown away before the first puff from the winds of adversity. He is vigilant in the cause of justice and swift to right a wrong. A man acknowledges his ignorances and welcomes the teacher. He is ever eager to learn. He gives bread to the man who is hungry and drink to the thirsty man. 
he provides a bed for the wayfarer and provisions for the victim of misfortune. A man does not avoid his debts or shirk his obligations. He is resolute in the face of adversity. He is not humiliated in defeat or cowed by greater strength. A man is gentle at home and forceful in the field. He is yielding at play and determined in the chase. He does not provoke a fight, neither does he avoid one. A man remembers his manhood at all times. A man who is a man treats a woman as a woman. Chapter 10 Scroll of Kulak, Section 4 These things are wicked and must be opposed. Fornication and seduction, for they degrade womanhood. Lies and deceit, for they sear the soul. Unclean ways and lewd speech, for they corrupt the body and lead along the path of unwholesomeness. By these laws you shall live. A man shall not uncover his private parts unduly before men or expose them before any woman not his wife or before any child. If he do so, he shall not go unpunished. A woman shall not show her nakedness to any man or appear unduly clad before any man. If she does so, she shall be whipped and secluded. A child being able to walk shall not go naked. A woman child shall not uncover her private parts before any person. Neither mother nor father shall uncover themselves before their children, nor shall they permit their children to reveal their nakedness. If they do so, they shall be punished at the task. If any man touch the private parts of a woman child for lust, he shall be branded and whipped and cast out forthwith. If any man use a man child for lust, he shall be branded and cast out forthwith. Any man using a beast for lustful purposes shall be removed from among the people, that he may live among the beasts of the wasteland. Any man being cast out or removed from the people shall lose all his possessions, which shall become the property of those to whom he caused harm or disgrace. Chapter 11 64th Egyptian Scroll the voice of the people cries out for the blood of the learned, and upon their heads the blood shall be. It is a time of sorrow. It is a time of distress. It is a time of tribulation. It is the dark night of wickedness, when ignorance covers the earth. Yet though the pillars of heaven fall, though the great abyss open, the earth shall not end until its purpose is fulfilled. This is no new thing, for the darkness of ignorance has often followed the bright days of spiritual illumination. But we who dwell under the shadow of darkness see not but the sorrows of our times. When the sunship lies at anchor, then will dawn the day not followed by darkness. Look in the places of judgment. They are filled with the low people, and unclean feet rest upon the footstools. Priests grow fat on riches bestowed for the preservation of the body, while those who speak of the preservation of the soul are tormented. Men talk of the delights of life but who cares for the eternal life of the spirit. We are as carrion yet unseen by the vultures, or as a tomb laying open to the despoilers. Our doctrine is as a leprosy upon us, for the life of a man who cannot impart his knowledge to another is futile. Men live to learn and also to teach. He who learns but does not teach takes all and gives nothing. Dark looks are cast upon those filled with the ancient wisdom. The people's pleasure is with those who perform deeds of deceit. Then there are those who seek acclaim and lewdness. When they perform some filthy deed, the people say, This was the custom of our fathers and our fathers' fathers before them. Therefore is it not permitted even before the one God. But they reason wrongly, for he cannot condone any deed of filthiness or evil, and he abhors unclean ways. Men say, Our eyes cannot deceive us. The eye sees that which is real. That which the eye sees is not unreal. Foolish people, who know not how little the eye sees. The real is real of itself. Neither the eye of man nor his understanding makes it real or unreal. Is a stone a thing unchanging, or is a star always a star? Who among you, people of ignorance, can see the bond between star and stone. Yet there is kinship in all things. 
The stars hanging above are not wholly apart from the heart of man. In the law of all things are united. It gives stability to everything. To it all things conform. Even the great God, for he will not break his own law. Man cannot, for even in his working of wonders and deceit he must conform to the law. Our doctrine is the teaching of the law. That and no more. He who seeks to know the great secrets or probe hidden mysteries must first pass through the purifying fire of the law. Without having done so, he might as well seek to tie down the sun or cast a net around the stars. Behold the secret places of the great God. There, no magic is performed. There, no wonders displayed. There, all is peaceful and normal. There, silence reigns. The great temples shall pass away. The tumult and shouting of the people shall fade into the silence, and their habitations shall be ground into dust. Then shall still remain the hidden place of the great God, and still it shall be peaceful and normal. Stand in the concourse of the people. Does not good appear weak and wickedness powerful? It is true, but ten generations, a hundred generations hence, there will be more good on earth, for generation by generation good eats evil. Men say, There are many gods, therefore which among them shall be worship? We cannot know. They are confounded by their own foolishness, for choice is easy. They worship where they find inward peace and contentment. For spiritual illumination is found in more than one place. The pillars of all wisdom are numbered as the fingers upon a hand. Five things alone are the concern of man. What is man? Where does he begin and where does he end? Why does he exist and how can he conduct his life in a manner best for him? The earth at his feet, the heavens above. The great god of gods or the unreal gods of men, the night dreams, the inhabitants of the netherworld, the spirits good and evil, all things seen and unseen are no concern of man unless they affect him for good or ill. That which does not affect man is of no importance. This alone is wisdom. Chapter 12 87th Scroll Our deeds are as thistle down launched upon the wind. We know not whence the winds of chains will bear them, or whether they will take root or be borne away, as though they were never there to begin with. Our works are as edifices of mud built upon the river banks, which are swept away by the rising waters. The one certain thing in life is change. Men make plans. They are as not. They are as words written on the waters, as commands given to the winds. Wise is he who knows the plans of God, for to them the whole earth conforms. Men cry out at the tribulations of life, not knowing that by adversity alone can they find their souls. They say, Why are we beset with trial and tribulation? For they cannot understand the contest. They say, Why must we seek and never find? Knowing not that life is not but a search, and at the end man can discover nothing except man. O man, gaze well upon the earth. See, is it not by its nature a place of labor and not a garden of pleasure, or a panderer to your weaknesses? Truth is found in the book of life, but it may be understood just by degrees. For who among men receiving the whole would not be overwhelmed and destroyed? In general, men are childlike. Give the people deceitful things, and they will rejoice like children. Show them amusing things, and they will acclaim their pleasure. The gods of fear are held in reverence, but the great god who banishes fear they despise. O oh, foolish people! O oh, foolish generation! With dust on my head I mourn your ignorance. With loud lamentations I decry your folly. Yet the path you have chosen, you have chosen freely. Ease and comfort appear to be your end and purpose. The gods of deceit have temples of splendor. Their priests are well clothed and overfed. But the great god of truth has no more than a hidden cavern. His servants are garbed in rags and their bellies are empty. The gods of lust and cruelty have storehouses of treasure. But the god of kindness 
has not even a field. The people worship gods that oppress and ignore the God who frees. They give to the gods that take and spurn the God who gives. Oh, misguided generation. Oh, blind and ignorant people. To cherish the stone gods of death and to mock the God of life. Oh, misguided generation to clasp to its breast the things that inherit decay and spurn the things that inherit everlastingness. Let the destroyer come as the whirlwind of the barren places in the dread day of its appearance. The works of ignorance shall go down to the everlasting. Chapter 13, 93rd Scroll a man shuns the deceitfulness of the wanton woman, for her words are like honey, but her beauty is to men as the flame to the moth. Her skin may be smoother than oil and her caress gentle as a feather, but her heart is hard and her ways are shameful. Her feet tread the ways of disease and death, and she is a decoy for the eater of souls. Her steps incline not towards the joyful path of life, and her hand leads the trusting to misery and loneliness. A wanton woman is man's greatest affliction. She wanders and is unpredictable. Though she be bathed in perfumed waters and anointed with its sweetness, painted and clothed in fine linen, her adornment is no more than the crust over a quicksand. Within herself, the betrayer of womanhood is unclean and polluted. What is the desire aroused by the deceitful beauty of the wanton woman but something spawned in wickedness? Her provocative eyes may stir your manhood. Her moist lips may call to you in the stimulated language of love. And her lithesome form may quicken your heartbeat. But what is the lot of all the harlot has? Not more than one loaf of bread or a measure of corn. Yet, her cost is the wholesomeness of man. A man may not handle hot coals and remain unburnt. The harlot is the destroyer of manhood. She blights the soul. She is the dweller in the antechamber of unclean things, the servant of horrors, the handmaiden of disease. The womanliness of a harlot is as a silken robe on the back of a swine. The forces of whoredom are strong. They have servants in the fortress of man's body. They strike when he is weak. They rob and they destroy. They take that which cannot be replaced. Flee from all harlots as from a leper or those with the disease of running sores. Let not the pollutions of harlotry enter the household of your body. A man who is a man is worthy of a chaste wife, clean in body and pure in thoughts. Her wholesomeness shall gladden his heart, and in her hands his contentment is secure. With her he shall find fulfillment and joy. Marry a chaste woman, that you may have a faithful wife and live in peace among men. Let not the nights of your journeyings be spent in sleeplessness and doubt. Rejoice and be content in the love of the wife of your youth, for it has been established. The foolish man disregards the proven love for the shadowy love that may melt under adversity, as the morning mists melt before the sun. Through all the eternal ages, women who are lovely and wayward have been and will be the sorrow and ruination of man. Envy not the man who rejoices in a beautiful wife. She may be his secret sorrow. Far more to be envied is he whose wife brings him contentment and joy. He who finds a good wife is fortunate above the man who finds riches. He who treats a good wife with indifference is as a man who leaves open the door of his treasure house. The husband who harbors an adulteress is both weak and wicked, for he encourages adultery in others. He is selfish, for he thinks of one man and not of all men. He condones the mockery of love, and his weakness contributes to the sorrows of better men. The wrong is not great when a hungry man steals bread, and less when he steals it for his hungry children. The adulterer steals that from which he gets no benefit, and in doing so brings sorrow and shame on the heads of the innocent. 
Where is the joy when he gathers a woman to his breast, not in peace and contentment, but in the manner of a thief? Furtive love is false love. At the best, it is love betraying itself. Stolen bread is often the sweetest, and hidden waters the most pleasant, but under the hand of the adulterer, the sweetness putrefies, and the pure becomes unclean. Is it not written in the statutes and in the nature of man that if a man come upon his wife in adultery and in his just wrath shall slay, then he commits no great wrong? It is the duty of a man to protect his home, but he owes a greater duty which decrees that he uphold the sanctity of every home. He who lets adultery go unpunished condones it and mocks the things a man should cherish and honor. The lion maintains the sanctity of his mate. The jackal is indifferent. A man will follow the ways of men, a cur the way of curs. My son, the day comes when your heart reaches out towards women and you desire a wife. It is well to choose her with prudence, to select carefully without passion and without lust. Who is the woman who claims the heart of a man, whose love is the sun of his dwelling, and whose pure radiance he delightfully bathes? She is modest and quiet spoken. Sweet, womanly innocence blooms on her cheek. She is diligent in seeking work, for her hands and foot do not stray from her household. Observe her in the house of her father. Note her ways with care. She takes delight in simple pleasures. Her demands are moderate, and she behaves with decorum. Lewdness is silenced before her glance. She is attired with neatness, and her adornments are not over many. Her voice is low, gentle. Decency and mildness of speech are virtues from which she never departs. She walks with prudence on one hand and chastity on the other. Before her go discretion and decorum. In her eye is the light of love, and her smile is the caress of affection. Her overwhelming virtue grips the tongues of lewd men, and they are silenced. When the mouth of scandal is abroad, the doors of her ears are closed. Her delight is not in the misfortunes of others, nor does she find pleasure in the retelling of their misdeeds. Her thoughts are a fountain of purity, and she remains unsullied by the wickedness splashed by others. When she marries, her dwelling becomes a haven of peace for her husband and a well of wisdom to quench the questing thirst of her children. Her delight is in the care of her household and her good management a joy to her husband. She fashions the thoughts of her children with example and the words which fall from her mouth are heard with obedience. Withal, her character is strong. Were it not, she could not be as she is. Fortitude and courage are not the least of her qualities. How joyful man who calls her wife. How joyful the man who calls her wife. And joyful the child who calls her mother. Among all earth's treasures, she is the greatest and too often the least valued. Chapter 14 96th Scroll I am ashamed. For naked bodies are exposed to lewd glances and lustful looks. There is foolish laughter and foul words spoken among the onlookers. Yet it is not the naked body that is degraded, for bodies are things of beauty. In the beginning God molded the body to its shape, knowing that in the days to come this spirit would dwell therein when entering the matter of earth. It was shaped slowly with care and foresight. Loving hands wrought its wonderful form, and the day dawned when it became the abode of a living soul. Then God commanded, Respect this, the vessel of the ever-living spirit, for it is a great and delicate thing meant for communion one with another. It is my supreme achievement upon earth. Therefore, though the body be not supreme, it is a thing of greatness. It is a glorious temple meant to be the residence of a god. It can speak, and words bring it into companionship with other souls. It reflects without the spirit dwelling within. The smile, the laugh, the eyes, they reveal it. The body is a thing of glory. It is the greatest of all material creations. Man and woman embrace and unite. Two bodies and two spirits join together in the search for another servant of the Supreme Spirit. There can be no greater responsibility 
for their task is to find a worthy one. To man and woman has been given the power of creation. They can use it for good or for ill. The beasts know not what they do. They mate in blind ignorance, impelled by desire and desire alone. Yet never do they bring forth creatures unsuited for their purpose. Man and woman, with freedom of choice and knowledge, do not do so well because, impelled by unworthy desires, they choose unwisely. Where are the thoughts of men when they mate? Upon themselves or upon their children? That which causes man and woman to forget their responsibility, which arouses in them desires and thoughts, which they cannot control, is not a thing of goodness. It is an instrument of evil. Why should men cover their bodies and women hide their nakedness? Not because naked bodies are things to be ashamed of, but because of what the eye of the beholder makes of them. The God made eyes see beauty, but the man fashioned thoughts interpreted lewdly. Did the sight stimulate him to goodness? It would be good, for all that serves good is good. The simple and thoughtless woman may display her secret charms in innocence, for she cannot see into the thoughts of lewd men. Her wrongdoing lies in the fact that she feeds their lustfulness and panders to their evil thoughts. Anything a woman does which stimulates goodness in men is good. Whatever she does to the contrary is wrong. Oh, change our thoughts and outlook, that our feelings may become servants and not masters that they may serve the cause of good, which is the cause of man, and not the cause of evil, which is the degradation of man. Make our bodies wholesome residences and not foul prisons. Purify our thoughts that they may properly direct our bodies and dedicate them as fitting vehicles for our journey through life. Let this glorious material creation be fittingly inhabited and let it be illuminated from within with the flame of a pure spirit. Chapter 15, Scroll of Kulak, Sections 2 and 3 Thus it is written on the tablets of fate, Whatever may be accomplished at the sun rising, let not the sun setting find undone. When you build, build as forever, and your fame shall be sung among the great in the everlasting halls. He who has done you with one good churn will be more ready to do you another than will the one to whom you have done a good turn. Expect not that the deeds of men should accord with the dictates of reason or be ruled by the consideration of right. There are men who live for themselves alone, and their souls are smothered in the deadly winding sheet of selfishness. There is no greater loneliness than that of a man who lives for himself alone. He looks about him and says, All men seek to do me wrong. All men seek to be over me. His life is a problem and his days are filled with anxiety. He says, What if tomorrow I shall not eat? And furtively steals from his friend. He hoards that which he cannot use. His soul is twisted and ugly. His countenance is mean. His days are a burden and his nights sleepless. He deals harshly with those under his hand for secretly acknowledging his own inferiority. He distrusts all men. These things are written in the third section of the scroll of Kulak. Consider the petty man. His deeds are mean and his manner servile. His heart shakes in a small breast. See him among the concourse of the people and his eyes shift from side to side. He shuffles about his affairs and his path is not straight. He is spiteful and malicious. Like a snake, he crawls into the dust, ever ready to strike blindly at those above him, not knowing that their eyes are fixed far above his element and he is unseen. He gossips and prattles like an idle woman, and men look down upon him, for his ways are those of a half-man. His pettiness is an irritation to all. His residence is a place of torment, for his wife despises him. And his children are wayward. He has no friends, and men visit him for naught but their own benefits. His time is occupied with matters of small moments, and bigger undertakings overwhelm him. The deeds of greater men he cannot understand and therefore derides them. Consider the vulgar man. 
His voice is loud and his words body, like the ass he laughs without understanding. His tongue rattles in his head. He makes noise, but not sense. In his ignorance, he pushes himself forward, when, with his meager talents, he should remain behind. The tongue of a vulgar man betrays him and holds him up to mockery. His companions are petty men and hypocrites. He is jovial in the midst of sorrow and speaks loudly when others whisper. He is a man afraid of silences. He is a man afraid of himself. He has no understanding of the innocence of children and no respect for the modesty of women. He is a man well left to himself. Consider the cowardly man. His mother does not grieve at his absence, for she is ashamed of his face. His father shuns him, and he becomes the companion of hypocrites. His wife goes in fear of every man, while her thoughts turn to better men. His children are mocked, his father insulted. His son has to establish his place, and his daughter commands no respect for a coward to marry his wrongdoing. He has no friends, for all men avoid him. His manner is furtive and he slinks from place to place. He can put on a bold front and may deceive foolish women, but underneath his heart is craven. Put to the test by men, he is found wanting. Consider the man of no account. He is improvident. He is wasteful. He speaks of his own importance but deceives none but himself and the foolish. The easiest person for any man to deceive is himself. The man of no account walks the marketplace to buy a stone. Without merit himself, he appeals to the deeds of his forefathers for credit. What good is it to the blind man that his father could see? What benefit to the illiterate that his father could write? In what way can it raise the standing of a man of no account if his father's father was of good standing and repute? Is it not more to his discredit that he is what he is? He who walks in the shadow of his father's reputation has none of his own. He who establishes his reputation upon that of another erects a building without foundation. The ass of Pharaoh is still an ass. A worthless man does worthless things. His death removes an encumbrance from the earth. Now consider the man of honorable estate. His wife is fully married and not made ashamed by a life under the double law. His household is well fed and his servants obedient. He uses his strength to protect the weak and his arm is swift to right an injustice. He remembers that the greatest injustices are wrought in the name of justice. He does not permit the weakling and hypocrite to rise to high position by cunning. He seeks out wickedness to destroy it and cannot remain passive in its presence. He does not permit the weakling and hypocrite to rise to high position by cunning. He seeks out wickedness to destroy it and cannot remain passive in its presence. His children are dutiful and obedient. His fields are well cared for and his estate prosperous. His treasures serve the good of the people and promote contentment and harmony. His riches are not spent selfishly or foolishly. Consider the courageous man. His wife holds her head high for she is proud of her standing. She fears not the lewd looks of base men nor the mocking smiles of women. The courageous man has many friends and men turn to him in times of trouble. He is as a rock among raging waters. He is the shield of the unprotected and the sword of the weak. His arm is steady. His thoughts clear. He walks among the people with head held high, for he fears no man. Lesser men give way before him, and he is followed by the admiring glances of women. Consider the half-man. His ways are the ways of women without her charms. He sickens the stomachs of men, and women churn from him in disgust. He is ever treated with scorn and contempt. He fawns and makes himself lowly, that he might please true men. He is unclean within, and filth lurks on his lips, ever ready to fall and pollute. He is small-hearted and seeks his pleasure among vile things. He is an abomination to true men, for he is a man in form alone. As his vile thoughts mold his speech and actions into a mockery of womanhood, so do they twist his soul into an image of horror. He who is not wholly a man is no man. He who is the companion of a half-man is a half-man himself. 
Chapter 16 Scroll of Whore Make It This is the revelation of the All-Glorious One, who was with us on earth as a master and now dwells in the place of eternal brightness. I am as I was, the devoted friend of the friendless, the servants of those who sat at my feet, and the lover of all. I dwell amid brightness and endless joy in the place of blending, for when flame unites with flame there is but one flame, and when waters mingle with waters there is but one water. When all is merged in one, then the difference is removed. That which was once heavy is now light, as once I was in the body so am I now in spirit. All that was once impure has been purged away, the painful darkness of earthly life is no more. The heavy burden of restriction has gone. I am free. The deluded eyes now see clearly. The stifled tongue is freed and the insensitive ears are opened. Life is an everlasting melody of glory. The falsehoods taught by the body no longer hold me in bondage. The fetters are struck off my limbs and the bandage removed from my eyes. I no longer seek the things unearned, nor do I refuse the enjoyments of my gains. I stand alone in wisdom and peace, beyond the range of earthly senses. The past is no longer a shackle at my ankle. I am garbed in my own true, changeless form. I stand forth in truth, and all may see me as I truly am. I am firm and changeless, unalterable in time. I perform the tasks that come to my hand, and amidst inactivity I perform unceasingly. I am not apart from bodily activities, for that which once held me captive has been exchanged for a form infinitely more glorious. The heart-gladdening enjoyments remain, and the nectar of wisdom still feeds me. I am nourished by knowledge, and the way of inquiry remains open. I am unrestricted in movement and see through limitless space. I am as a prisoner unbound. That which is seen by you is seen by me. That which is unknown to you is not unknown to me. I know the nature of the firmament which came forth from God and of which all things are made. I know the nature of the forming force which unceasingly shapes things out of formless matter. I know not past or future. Yet I am not without them, and all merged into the present. In truth, I know not eternity yet, for that still remains beyond my reach. It is there, just beyond my horizon. It is the attainable goal, not yet reached, the end of the journey. I am freed from earthly cares, and no longer bound by the demands of the body. I am free. I am pure. I am established in glory. I am the self-formed one. I am the arisen one. I am the glorious one. I am the victorious one. All is in me and I am in all. I can spend 10,000 earths or dwell within the heart of a moat. There is no here and yonder. The far is near and the near far. I can move in matter, but I cannot manifest. I cannot rend the veil between matter and spirit yet I can commune soul with soul. There is about me an infinitely vast expanse of unmolded space wherewith to labor, and this is a place of unending toil and gratification. I stand on the strand of a formless sea. Earthly words are unavailing for expression and lead to falsity and confusion. It is like trying to pour the Nile through a straw. You ask for words to guide, and I answer thus, Be still quiet. Rest in silence with tranquility of heart. Calm the restless surges of unbidden thoughts, the oppressions of uncontrolled desires. There, in the stillness and silence, you will be a shining, motionless, unflickering light, like a flame of a candle on a windless night. That is the pure flame of self, the light that guides towards divinity. It is a small light of eternal wisdom lit from the infinite flame of truth. Of all things on earth, truth is the hardest to find. Men who have not expended effort say they possess it, but it is not for them. Truth is the supreme reward for those who have successfully passed an almost unendurable test. It is not a prize awarded in a simple contest. 
Chapter 17, Scroll of Netzertat. Your servant, Netzertat, priest at the temple of the seer of heaven at Nethom, found this writing when he was the opener of doors for Penikin. It is a writing so old that few could be found who knew the nature of its signs, and they know more than servants of the Kohar. Yet, one who has enjoyed peace within your shadow undertook the task of reshaping them with pleasure. For as fire is born of the spark, so are the joys of his life kindled by the brightening countenance. The writings of old declare the wisdom of our forefathers, which is the treasure trove of man and the inheritance of our days. Thus it is written, All things on earth are compounded of two flowering powers, the right-hand power and the left-hand power. The first predominates in men and the second in women, where they fall nearly equal. The being is neither holy man nor holy woman. The spirit of life resides in the air men breathe and is shared with the beasts, the trees, and the things that crawl, the birds, the fishes, the herbs, and the grass. It quickens the living hearts of men and is diffused through the blood of the body. Man sleeps when his spirit departs for refreshment at the font of its being. Even as his mortal body must sustain itself with things of the earth, so must his spirit seek sustenance in the place of its being. In sleeping, the spirit of man departs in part alone. It goes not wholly or as one awakened. When his God calls him away, his soul goes to the place of decision where fate is decreed. And there, by the underground river, the good are separated from the wicked. But the river is not a river of water. In that, all things are made known and the river is the river of life. Outside of man, between God and man, is the reflection of God, which men call nature. It can be disturbed by man and distorted, even as the reflections in a pool of clear water are disturbed by the drop of a pebble. Nature accords exactly with the greater needs of men, with their desires and beliefs, and with that they have deserved. It is also a modifying force operating under the conditions of their testing, it is the breath of God expressed in living things. It is to God as the material web of the spider is to the living thing. They are separate and unalike, yet one. There is a fine, unbreakable thread, one end of which is secured in the spirit center, wherein dwells the everlasting being, the eternal one. The other end is fastened to matter. And between the two is the web of creation, spun out of the single thread of invisible substances by the forming power of God. All that we can know as mortals exist within the sphere of mortality. All was originally compounded from the fiery dust, the first expression of the outbreathing of God upon which the forming power operated. As hair grows from the skin of the head, which is nothing like hair, as a tree sprang up from the soil, which is nothing like a tree, as the spider spins its web and then withdraws, so does mortal matter come forth from the immortal spiritual substance. As the shadow is to the object that gives its form, so is the material to the spiritual. All things are held together by the spiritual womb web. The form is there, but the shape is here. Nature is the spirit of God manifesting in matter. It is a spirit form seeking outlet and expression in matter. It is the maker, the means of making, and the thing made. Though all these activities are in subordinate capacity, spirit is not nature. Spirit is the source of all consciousness, which experiences both pleasure and pain. The spirit of a man, when in contact with nature, feels the ever-changing conditions of nature. He who understands that activity anywhere is but the working of nature and that God oversees this labor and understands the truth, nature is never still, it is ever moving. Man is a creature bound to things ever changing. On the great scales he is balanced between the eternal adversaries, good and evil. At death, the senses perish, but the memory of them endures. The spirit roams the morning land free with all its beliefs its desires and its memories, all intact. The arisen man awakes as from a brief sleep and finds himself in the place of decision. And there, 
a body awaits him as substantial as the one he has discarded. Chapter 18 Prayer of Hapu O my Lord of Wisdom, I have been laid low by sickness and smitten by every disaster that can befall a mortal man. No priest or diviner and no wise man can deliver me by purification and rites from the great wrath which has descended upon me. I have prayed, I have made sacrifices, I have chanted in procession, I have paid all due tributes, and I have not cheated any man. Yet though everything I have done was good, all men avoid me because of the presence of evil about me and the shadow of misfortune that hovers overhead. Am I a man deluded in thought? Can it be that the things men dream to be good are evil in the light of your greater insight and understanding? My plowlands and pastures are like a woman without a husband, and I diligently search my heart to discover wherein I have failed, that this should be my lot. Am I the prey of powers and causes beyond my understanding? Oh my God. Illuminate my heart with wisdom even as your glorious shield lightens our path through the day. I seek an answer so that I may understand, but I am mocked by the muteness of silence. I speak from the inner recesses of my heart and say, How shall I commune with my God? Where shall I seek Him? What offerings will He accept? I ask others, but they know not. I seek the counsel of the wise, but they talk in riddles. I am told that my wickedness is the barrier between us, but what have I ever done to hurt you? What could I, a mere mortal man, do to have ill effect upon the greatest of all divinities? If in my ignorance I did wrong in your sight, it was not my will, it was an illusion, it was thoughtlessness, bad temper, or beer. The weak are led astray by stronger men, even when asleep men are led astray to sin. Therefore, O mighty one, overlook my errors. How shall I call upon you, my Lord, I who am the ever loyal and loving one, I who have remained constant under oppression and adversity? I have faith, not without doubt, yet I am not dismayed. I can see that to progress man needs both, for he who has but one unleavened with the other is easily misled. Though no sign has ever been given me, I am not cast down. For I have not known one who has enjoyed the full splendor of inner vision and the communicating ability. Where do we differ, he and I, in your sight? I search my heart truly, and I can find no great wrong done to others. What small wickedness I have committed have been done in hot-headed haste, or while led astray by strong drink, or in thoughtlessness. I have never willfully done harm to another fellow being. What is there in man that sends his thoughts afar, seeking the unknown? Who first struck the spark of life and sent it forth on its mission to fill the earth with its glorious burning flame? My pen sets down these words, and behind the pen is my hand. Behind the hand are my heart and will, and behind them my loving spirit. What stands at the other end of the chain reaching upward from these words? Can it be that man is unable to see you are the directing power within his thoughts? because his thoughts are themselves within you. Is it that the within cannot see the without, though the without sees the within? Are my thoughts in a tangled skine which I lack the ability to unravel? Though not a scribe, I write because my father wrote. Yet I am not a learned man. Can it be that things hidden from me are known to other men? Whatever directs the thoughts of men does not leave them free from doubt. It arises strongly when a man dies. For some say he still is, while others say he is not. Which, O oh my God, is true. Teach me, let me know, that I may tell it unto other men. Is there an inborn thing in man which never dies? Is there an everlasting part in men, or are they all heirs of decay? Men seek assurance and are told to have faith. They want a substantial God they can see and therefore make an idol of wood or stone. Can this be so very wrong? Men need a rule of life, 
something in which they can repose absolute trust. They want sincerity. They want love. I cannot blame you, my God, if you have turned your back on men, for they have deserted the path of righteousness shown them by the men of olden times. Truth is with us no more, and men choose the pleasant paths of ignorance in preference to the more austere and profitable one. The pure worship, which once filled this land and guided its people, has fallen prey to greedy and ambitious men. Its cornerstone is no longer the rigorous life of devoted service, which brings its own revelation. Its centerpiece is no longer the dark chamber of austerity where great spirits sought the light, but the pomp of elaborate but empty ceremonial and futile sacrifice. It is a thing of well-organized but barren ritual, the perverted tool of unscrupulous priests. The temples have become refuges for those who seek to avoid the trials of life. How can such as they ever be true servants of God? Where except from among them can he find servants? I see, I understand, but my God, it is hard for one who suffers such as I to face the truth without bitterness. Am I, who did not ask to enter this place of sorrows, to suffer for the wrongdoing and ignorance of others? Is there no dividing line between those who remain loyal and those who have deserted you? Perhaps this too I understand, for are we not taught that all are brothers, and men stand and fall with their kindred? I do not erase the words I have inscribed with heavy heart and a spirit overburdened with grief and perplexity. For through the enveloping mists of sorrow I perceive a light dimly. This is my message to those who follow and who may be tossed on the turbulent waters of despondency and despair, my pitiful contribution to the great total of inherited wisdom. If you seek God and find him not, then the blame lies with men and not with God. For the spirit of man has begotten something which has stepped between to stop the ears of the everlasting inner man. He is blinded by the thick mummy wrappings of muttered ritual and vain ceremonial, misled by ignorant and hypocritical priests. Yet God is still merciful. For knowing those destined for darkness and error in the life to come, he showers success and good fortune upon them here. Knowing those destined for life as glorious ones, he further refines and tests them with sorrow and affliction, that their glory may be greater. I know, for in declaring my trust, by setting forth these things, my heart has suddenly been filled with an indescribable light of spiritual illumination. And now that I know greater things beyond any hint of doubt, I too am awakened. Chapter 19, 113th Scroll The boat encircling rope is half chafed through. The chariot hand is broken and bound. The door socket is splintered and plastered. My son carries sands to the terminals and my daughter sits at home. I wander warily across a spiritual wilderness tormented by deluding mirages of truth. Nothing is whole. Nothing is right. The ways of a man are always right in his own eyes, but they deceive him, and unless he has guidance of the law, he is led astray. Where is the law today? Is it where it should be, inscribed on the living hearts of the people? Or is it a thing written on dead scrolls rolled up and discarded? We make of our lives what we will. Destiny supplies us with the yarn which we weave into a pattern of beauty and utility or tangle up into a hopeless, wasteful confusion. Where are the craftsmen spinners today? A wise man is one who bathes in the waters of wisdom. A fool is one who wallows in the filth of folly. The well of wisdom is not a public place from which anyone may draw without discrimination. Its entrance is barred to he of the loudmouth, but opens to receive the calm and silent one. Where today are the men of quiet manner and calm bearing? No wise words or well-phrased writings are needed to inform men that the light of the sun exceeds that of the moon, or that he who has toiled through the heat of the day will not lie on a bed of sleeplessness. Those are things experienced by a few that are unknown to the many, that have to be explained. Such are spiritual things. 
But where today are those who have known and experienced them? Who can explain them to others? Today, men seek to gather where they have not planted. They desire the increase, but disdain the effort. They seek to benefit through the toil of others, and unproductive tongues move vigorously, while skilled hands are idle. Men must learn that no more can be taken from the storehouse than was placed there. Where are the men of self-assurance, the men of straight tongue, of constant speech, that were known of yore? Today, if an ass were king, men would bray. This is the day when fine speech flourishes, but it lacks substance. It falls from the tongue and is lost on the wind. The words of the night are soaked in honey, but as day dawns, they melt away with the dews of morning. Even the words of lovers are sweet for but a day. Tomorrow they turn to bitterness and gall. Oh, oh for the days that were, the joyous days now past, when words were things of substance with but one meaning. Now my days are without object. They are spent in stringing and unstringing my lyre, while the song I wish to sing remains mute in my heart. I do not look for the overthrow of evil. I do not bewail the existence of wickedness. These will always be while man remains mortal. Wickedness will flourish even in the house of God, for he has not ordained the law, which permits a poisonous weed to flourish among healing herbs. Neither do I seek for any undue reward, nor do I consider my goodness deserves it. Goodness is the seed we sow in the soil of mortal life on earth to reap in the sunshine of heaven. Yet I would enjoy some pleasure undiluted with sorrow. Now, even at the bottom of my rare cups of joy lie the dregs of bitterness and sorrow. I have never failed to come to the aid of the poor and lowly. I have obeyed the laws of God and man. Goodness has always been honored in my heart, and I have constantly read the sacred writings. Yet never have I found these things consistent with the mortal well-being, because my tongue did not turn around corners and twist back on itself, because the words I spoke came from my heart undiluted with any malicious thought, because I chided the rich for their selfishness and inconsideration, their wasteful living and meaningless activities. They became my enemies because I called upon the powerful to live accordingly to the laws they professed to uphold and the words declared to be sacred, I was seized and imprisoned. When I protested the injustice to the ears of the people, I was beaten with rods. I was branded as one who seeks to destroy the stability of the land. I, who tried to set an example of goodness, to lead a life dedicated to my God to convert the wicked to righteousness, am myself declared wicked by the workers of evil. Why is this? My God, have I to my sorrow and undoing weighed the values of life wrongly? I, who was once a man of estate, am now poor. I have been deprived of all that I possess. I supported the oppressed against the powerful and lent my arm to the lowly. I threw my own riches into the balances to counter the injustices of the rich. What has been my reward? To whom I gave aid and succor. Do they not mock me and hold me in contempt? Am I not called a fool even by them? I am thrown crusts of bread in pity. But no man calls me friend. I speak to men. They become restless and remember things which call them away. The sight of me causes men to quicken their steps and change the direction of their journey. Has goodness then become a plague in the land? Yet I have sought but to turn others from wickedness and to replace their misdeeds with deeds of goodness. I have sought to revalue virtue so that it becomes honored among men, not merely a plaything of words, but a treasure held in the heart. Yet men mock me. They say, these are things in which we too believe, but no man can wholly live by them. They are not the substance of life, and none but a fool discards the substance for the shadow. Where is my dwelling? Is it not occupied by one who wrings tears from widows and steals the food of orphans? The wicked one sleeps on a bed of comfort. The righteous one lays his head upon a stone. Where's my tomb? Does it not await one whose 
The foot is heavy on the necks of the humble and whose yoke bears down intolerably on those who labor. The wicked one contemplates his end with contentment. A place of honor awaits him. The righteous one will mingle his bones with those of dogs and cattle. Where are my servants? Do they not toil for one who deals with them harshly, who rejoices at the sweat that pours down on their labors? The wicked one sits on the seats of comfort. He wallows in an overabundance of good things. And the righteous one squats in the burning sun. He is grateful for a few crumbs and a little water. Where is my wife? Is she not cast into bondage, an object of abuse and amusement? Is her master not a man of many useless words, one who dispenses lewdness for pleasure? What misery and degradation she suffers. The wicked one never lacks the delights and services of women. The righteous one lacks even a smile of compassion, a hand to touch his head. And where are my children? The comfort and consolation of an old man. Do they not labor with bitterness of heart, bearing the scorn poured upon the gray head of their father with unrewarding fortitude? The wicked ones display their riches and mock my children, saying, All this is ours to enjoy or give others at our pleasure. Where then is your reward? The righteous one cannot give even a piece of rag to patch the garments of his offspring, or a morsel of food to ease their hunger. Where are my riches? Where is my estate? Are they not enjoyed by the avaricious and haughty, the sly man and the cunning man, the hypocrite and deceiver? The wicked ones have no thought of righteousness and virtue. They are clad in comfort and filled to fullness. The righteous one has half a garment, and his next meal is unseen. Is earth the heritage of the wicked or the heritage of the good? If goodness is to be won for earth by example... Then what must I do? If by words, what more can I say? If by weapons, can an unarmed man fight a multitude? Where have I failed? I do not know. I have no answer. I believe, I hope. I am an old man bowed down with the cares of an old man. The fires of youth are burned out, leaving just the gray, comfortless ashes when men ask, I answer, I do not know. Can any man answer more truthfully? Ramotip, son of Yagab by Ilipa, daughter of Pasanesu, commander of the royal protectors, found him by the road to Besiros as he journeyed to meet the great bride. Ramotip took him to the shrine of the flame at Nozab. He had come home. The name Ramotip is honored forever, gold and silver, there was none. He came to the mooring post among friends, two alone in the house of the Lady of the Sycamore remained steadfast on the hard, grim road. They are protected by her illustrious mantle, they are hidden in her shadow. His scroll is placed among the scrolls that last forever, though it be but a splash in the Nile, it is his memorial. His name is on the great scroll, his success was in his failure. In trying to change others, he changed himself. Each effort was a shaping stroke to glory. Earth is as it should be. It cannot be changed. But if a man would change himself to his own benefit, he must ever strike and seek to change it. The message of this writing is not one of futility, but one of hope. No man could have better shaped his future. These are the later days, yet things remain unchanged. The good suffer while the wicked prosper. Whose fault is this? Certainly not God's. This is a man-made state. It was built by strength, and strength must smash it down and rebuild. The good have been too passive. Arise from your knees and look the foe in the face. Strike a blow for God and for good. Chapter 20 Commentary of Frater Astoros from the days of the ancients have been heard the lamentations of the woeful and disheartened, and they ask the winds, Where have we failed for the God we pray to to remain unresponsive? 
They air their goodness and virtues and ask why these have gone unrewarded. It becomes a grievance with them, and they know not where to seek the answer. In this generation, our generation, goodly men have been robbed of their estates by warlike strangers, and their wives have been ravaged by men who have studied the ways of weaponry. Their possessions have been sold to provide earthly pleasure for those who revel in things of the earth, and their households have been despoiled to give pleasure to fornicating fighters. In their dire despair, they seek to lay the blame upon a god. Who does not strike down wrongdoers and seemingly rewards those who are earthwise? Wherein have they failed? This is the echo in the corridors of the ages. They have failed because they have left to God the things which they as God's overseers on earth should have accomplished. It is men in the mass who permit evil to flourish in their midst. Their woeful lamentations ascend to heaven and call upon the heavenly hosts for aid. But better by far would it be were they to call upon their own resolution and fortitude and fight the good fight, to bring about the rule of right and justice. All that is wrong with the world has its genesis in men. And if evil stalks the land, then it follows the attitudes and acts of men. Therefore, it is men who must make recompense for their lack of effort-producing concern. If the people establish the way of iniquity as their way, then it is the wrongdoers who will be rewarded with bounty. And this is not God's will, but man's. If the people lament and are disenchanted with the way things are, then it is time for action rather than a time for prayer. Pray not for heavenly help, but for a strong right arm and righteous wrath and resolution. The gospel of despair is for weaklings. If evil be established by the sword, then it is because the swords of the good have lacked strength and numbers. Those who petition the great God for help must be sure they have lacked nothing in their own preparations. They must fight strength with strength, and where they lack numbers, then they must fight with subtlety, but above all else they must fight. This is the law they have ignored and their woe-begotten lamentations are as a stench to the Most High. Chapter 21 The Night Fight Restless man, strong in his dauntless courage, weak in his pleasure-seeking, the headstrong child of Mother Earth is a creature of few days, and they are filled with toil and tribulation. They are laden with labor and care. He awakes on Earth like a flower opening to greet the dawning. He welcomes life as the unfolding petals welcome the sunrise, then, even as the flower fades while the sun declines, so does he weaken as life draws towards its time of departure. The wind blows over the places he roamed. Then it is gone, and knows him no more. Nothing remains but a fleeting memory. Then it too passes, and all is ended. A mortal being has passed away like a shadow, lingering for a brief moment in the sunlight of life. A man has passed like the shadow of a cloud across the arena of earth and has left scarcely more impression. A mere handful of dust has been swirled upward by the winds of life to hover briefly in the still air of earth, then fall back to the place from whence it came, back into the embrace of its mother. Life, fleeting as a shadow, comes with the daybreak and departs with the evening gloom. It is a thing without substance, a shadow born in the light of sun. Like a bird, it stirs the dust to brief motion. It passes, and the dust lies inert, as though it had never been moved. Consider from whence man came. His place of origin is like the clay pit, where men toil to dig the raw materials used by the potter. A piece of clay is dug out and separated. It comes from the darkness of the pit in the light of day. Even so is a man born. The clay is cast on the wheel to be turned. The wheel is life. The wheel spins and the soft clay is molded into shape. If the shape be good and pleasing to the eye, it will be kept and cherished. If it be ill-shaped, it is cast aside, discarded and unwanted. A useless thing. The potter is man, and the clay is soul. The wheel is life. Swift and fleet of foot is the brief life of mortal man, though it be numbered in days and counted in years. Yet he lives from moment to moment and knows not whether he has a few or many days left to squander or utilize. Can it all be futile, all in vain? Can life, when it passes, be as though it never were? Are the days of man no more than wind whispers among the trees or fish trails through the waters? 
The days of men are as a strong breeze sweeping a boat swiftly towards harbor. The journey is soon over. The voyage is quickly ended. He arrives at his destination weak and weary, heavy-limbed and toil-worn. The sun is setting. Night hastens on with quiet footfalls. The darkness gathers in the remains of the day, and the homesick wanderer finds peace. The labors of the day are ended, and the craftsmen lay down their tools and depart one by one. They each go their own way and are seen no more. The light-skinned ladies withdraw within. Their gilded adornments cease to entrance. Their glowing glances no longer lure. The gathering gloom darkens the window, and the protective shutters are closed. The night wind seeks out the unsteady door and shakes it in its socket. The breeze murmurs among the latticework and whispers through the eaves. Within, all is secure and silent, and the night movers commence to stir restlessly in the descending darkness without. The mistress and maidens withdraw to their resting places. The men drowse by the night lights, and the serving women stand by, eyes heavy-lidded, scarce aware of the task. Without the dwelling, the heavy darkness of night gathers. The rustle of life is stilled. The mantle of blackness closes about the weary-footed wayfarer who is nearing the end of the journey to his everlasting abode. He arrives and enters through the welcoming portals with a great sigh of relief. He casts aside his dust-stained garments and sinks down into the soft couch of forgetfulness. The wanderer is home. The tired, hoary head has found its place of peace. And now the flame that once burned so brightly is no more. The lamp is snuffed out, and its comforting light no longer shines. The earthenware bowl drops to the floor, it shatters and falls apart. As the days come and pass, it will be ground back into the dust from whence it was drawn forth. That which was lit by a spark from the eternal flame has returned to the place from whence it was generated. That which was raised up from the dust has returned from whence it came. All is as though it had never been. All who are kindred of the one blood return to the same home. The wayward son and wanton daughter are assured of a welcome there, brief though their stay may be. Who among men knows what moves the spirits of men, and who understands the true nature of this homecoming? Like a falcon soaring up into the sunlight, man, for a brief span in the immensity of time, is borne upward on the wings of life. Then the high flight is over. He descends, the wings are folded, and he seeks the solitude of his silent resting place. There is an end to all earthly things, and all men must come at last to the appointed place. None has gold or treasure enough to buy even one more day of time. There is no way back. It is the place of no return. And here, the prince and the bondsman are alike. Here they stand side by side, and none can tell who was the man of high rank and who was the lowly one. That which distinguishes them now is something not of earth, though that is where it was acquired. As the waters drain away from the land into the channels and from the channels into the river, to be borne away and lost in the great green sea, so does man sink down into oblivion, never to rise again on earth, never to return as himself. He has gone from earth forever, back to the place from whence he sprang, back to his eternal home. I tremble and am afraid. What man has not his doubts? What man can say with the conviction of knowledge of this I am certain. Our fathers of old and the twice-born had the confidence of certain assurance, but I am no more than a humble scribe whose life has been devoted to the fulfillment of his trust. I sought no great reward and received none, but I was content. Perhaps that contentment was my undoing. I am like a pot holding a precious draught, none of which belongs to it, or a chest containing a treasure it cannot utilize. What eyes see in the dismal darkness of the tomb? What breath stirs the heavy dust? What flower of love flourishes there? What voice can echo in its silence? What does any glimmer ever enlighten the oppressive gloom? Does any memory ever arise to soften the stark surroundings? The thoughts of an old man taunts him when the security of youth is left behind. 
Youth traverses the sunlit valley of carefree indifference, but age enters the gloomy cavern of doubt. What kind of stars encircle the vault lying low above? What companions lightens the burden of the never-ending night? What whisper breaks through the dark solitude? How many sleepers lie enwrapped in the dusty silence whose voice will awaken them, and on what distant day? With what greetings will they be called forth? Those things I myself cannot know. Yet I search the old scripts and am reassured, for they who write did so from certain knowledge. There were things known to them which are lost to our days. The sleepers sleep not, for their time is past. It was not counted as men count days and hours. They awakened even as one awakes from a sleep. They awoke in their day of destiny to a future of radiant glory or one of the disgraceful shame and shapelessness. I can add nothing to the great scripts in my keeping, for I am no more than a mere writing instrument. No sublime thoughts arise in my heart, and I, who myself lack the strength of assurance, can scarce presume to impact it to others. I serve as best I can as a guardian and transmitter of the wisdom from olden times. I labor in secret places, and I hide a secret life within my breast. This is a miserable and misguided age. When corruption stalks the land and the soul of man swims like a fish in an ocean of sin and wallows like a pig in the mire and mud of lust. It is a time of constant soul danger. In this age of wickedness, neither good works nor faith nor spiritual wisdom have any value. They who should instruct and guide the people mislead them with deceitful words and hypocritical ways. They have become corrupt of heart, and their eyes are blind to their wrongdoing. Their deeds done in the name of righteousness are as the filth which pollutes pure waters. The goodness that may once have bloomed within is withered away, and their spirits are as shrunken and wrinkled husks. The greed of the great is without bounds, and they oppress the poor beyond endurance. They take away the milch goat of the fatherless and seize the widow's ass for debt. And the scripts of the wise, it is said, as a man sows, so shall he reap. But I seek vainly for its truth in this age. Is this beyond my understanding? Yet I shall pass on undiminished the treasure with which I have been entrusted. Let those with greater wisdom make of it what they will. It is proven poor fare for an empty stomach and a cold covering for the lonely night. Yet... It has brought me its own strange consolation, and I am not without comfort. Think of me sometimes, when I am dust and you are even as I am now. If, in greater wisdom, you have solved the problems that now perplex me, look not upon me with scorn, for I am the child of my age. Meager though my offering be, it extends to the limits of my capacity. More I cannot give. Now, as his days reach fulfillment and he awaits his destiny, your servant salutes you. Chapter 22 Scroll of Lady Nephrimachet Who knows what secrets the wind whispers to the waters, the comforting wind of the evening, or what mysteries the sailors of the king discuss with the moon and the channel of the night skies? What are the words in the song of the locust, and who hears the speech of the trees? Life is a treasure house of hidden things, with so much mystery and beauty about them. Why do hearts of men incline towards sordid things? Beauty is mine. It attends me as a handmaiden, but it also restricts me as a warden. What bounty has beauty poured out for me? Has it not proven a false-fronted friend, a prison and not a palace? Has it brought me light-hearted joy or loaded my heart with sorrow? I am sold into shame and degradation as a slave girl is sold to servitude. I, who am of royal blood and rank equal to the highest-born lady in the land, am lower than the pitiful harlot who lurks in the street shadows, on sale for bread. What are the jewels about my brow and neck but symbols of my shame? 
what are the bangles of gold and silver on my arms and legs but fetters of humiliation? Are not the fine garments that clothe my shamed body but indications of my price? Truly, the higher a woman's position, the greater her fall. In my luxurious girlhood, I was the spoiled prize delight of my father's eyes, the minor queen of his household. As I stepped over the threshold into maidenhood, great musicians composed delicate songs on sweet, soft, stringed instruments extolling my beauty. They did not say of me, she is the supreme flower of loveliness, the essence of maidenly charm, the reflection of beauty's perfection. What were the words of their song? Were they not, she is the delightful incarnation of the inspiring spirit of innocent love sent down to dwell among men on earth to test him, to be their delight or doom? What today has become of all this promise? I have sold myself into a loveless union that clothes my heart in garments of shame. Without, I am bedecked in priceless ornaments and symbols of power, but within, I am hung about with the degrading shackles of womanly humiliation. Would that I were an unfeeling one who knows not the depths of her own degradation. No greater curse can be laid on a woman than to be cherished for her beauty alone, unless it be to have beauty and nothing more. Even then, perhaps it is better, for such a beauty clothes a dead, unresponsive thing. Oh, the curse of being lovely and unloved, of being loving and unloved, of wanting and being unwanted. What am I but a jewel of the state, a pretty plaything to delight the eye? Oh, to stir the heart of a true man in genuine love. Can a lovely woman ever know true love? Can she ever be assured of it? How can she know she is loved for herself alone and not for her beauty? People say of me, how can she who has everything lack contentment? True, I have beauty beyond the hopes of most women, riches beyond estimation, power and position above any other. I am envied by all. Yet I lack that which even the poorest shepherdess can attain. Gladly would I change places with the least of my handmaidens, were she but truly beloved. And I unduly discontented, having so much and sighing for one thing I lack. Judge me not unless you can read my heart and know the anguish of an overladen storehouse of unwanted affection. Say not that with such beauty such as mine I could claim the heart of any man. Could I claim it with honor? Could I take it in honesty? What think you I need, a man or love? A dead and empty embrace will not suffice. I am not a she-dog in heat. Should I degrade the glory of love to snatch a fleeting pleasure? I would be unworthy of the very thing of which my heart yearns. O oh, miserable one, who having so much, lacks everything she desires. Sad is the lot of one who, while yet young, must look beyond the grave for her goal. I labor under the burden of beauty. Oft have I heard the unspoken question asked, Can one so beautiful ever love truly, or would her love be fickle as the whims of a butterfly? And in my heart are tears, as I cry to myself, Can a lovely woman ever know true love? She may, but can she ever be assured of it? Messanita lacked both beauty and wit, Yet she never doubted she was truly loved, nor did she ever have cause to doubt. O oh, fortunate woman! Why are beautiful women, though fickle and wayward, honey-baited traps to lure men to sorrow? Why do other women seek to see them in the role of temptresses? What was it Galapi said of Meritari? that she was a temptress flaunting her beauty and challenging all men to come and take that which every woman guards so invincibly. How wrong! A truly lovely woman neither flaunts her beauty before men nor uses it to tempt them, 
for thereby it is sadly lessened. Beauty, like riches and power, carries a heavy burden of responsibility, and woe to one who lacks the strength to bear it. But unlike riches and power, little preparation and tuition are ever given for its use and purpose. Therefore, why blame the possessor when it is used thoughtlessly? Do men who love truly ever seek the love of a beautiful woman? Experience cries against it. Yet, surely, the dew of a true man and a true love should be the constant love of a beautiful one. Would that a man could love me for myself alone and not for the lovely covering that hides me. To such a man I would give a love undying, a love everlasting. For it would not be established in the flesh that fades and perishes. He would have won the soul type of true love, that which binds spirit to spirit. That which binds flesh to flesh is not love, nor yet even its imitation. What, after all, is beauty but the jewel box that hides the jewel within? Though how often is it empty and the jewel lacking, a thing of superficial display and nothing more? Envy me not, my sisters, for life lacks savor for me. I am neither contented nor joyful. May better times dawn when things are different. Chapter 23, 122nd Scroll O Egypt, great fertile black land amidst the encircling red plains, what have you now done? You have departed from the light to wander in twilight. You have turned to gods that are not but the spirits of men returned to dwell in wood and stone. What can such as they do for men? The great self-generating God gave you all you have and hold. The people of the West cannot oppress you. The people of the South cannot afflict you. Nor can the people of the East command you. The dwellers in lower regions are subject to your powers. Turn not from your true God. It is He who gave you the adornment of waters and greenery. He built you up in the midst of the fertile waters. He sends you the fertilizing floods in their due seasons, the fine fish-bearing waters which nourish you, the dark waters that fertilize the field pastures and fruit-bearing trees. The dark waters that fertilize the field pastures and fruit-bearing trees. You are not as other lands. Your borders are closed to the people of the East, whose hand stays their march. Your borders are closed to the wild men beyond the cultivated land, whose hand holds them back. Your borders are closed to the ignorant men of the South, whose hand restrains them. Are not the waters to the North as a wall? Forget not the God within your gods. He is the heart and soul of the land. He saved you from every evil of the Dark One in the days gone by. His servant is the great light of day, God given to you that you might dwell in its light. He darkened your face, that you might not be barren as other lands. He thrust the clouds from off your brow. The cool north wind is bidden, caress your cheeks. Truly you are the favorite among nations, the chosen one among all lands. Chapter 24 An Early Egyptian Scroll A craftsman in the words of God and teacher of writing, the grand scribe of his lord, a faithful servant of a noble master, before times keeper of the royal writings, whose father's father's father was chief overseer of the great pharaoh, follower of the wise one, whose wisdom and goodness reveal the divine essence. Son of the master of the secret ceremonies, captain of craft in the journey to the islands of the outer seas, may you live forever in prosperity and health, and may life bestow its favors upon you. May the protecting spirit spread its wings over you, and may your rewards hereafter exceed your expectations. May your servants dutifully transport sand for your fields, and may your form in the unseen place be that of a god. And to my brothers in wisdom, who follow the sacred path, may your may be made smooth and the yoke be lifted from your neck. May you dwell forever in the celestial mansions. 
in the month of rising waters, while all men yet bore the signs of lamentations for the departure of Pharaoh's father, and the great gates remained barred to wayfarers, the ships were prepared and pitched, and all was done as the king decreed. None but he who commanded our movements knew the preparations within the preparations. Then, to the place of mooring, I was carried in a high chair of ebony inlaid with brass, the bearers of which were of chesanam, wood bound about with cowhide, on the ship which had come laden with merchandise from the land of Pontus, lion's tails, cowhides, spices, worked and unworked ivory, blackwood, oils, and paint. From the land of Egypt went wrought copper and pitchers, stoneware, linen, and the finery of women and men. There were instruments for dwelling places and corn in jars, beer and stones and the works of craftsmen. I boarded and was greeted in a befitting manner, for my renown had gone before me. I am the one who stands fast under assault, who does not waver at the crisis nor run from the foe, whose arm is cunning in battle and never strikes twice to slay. With the craft were men of the Kadanas, a host of men fierce of countenance and bold, the vessel was one hundred and fifty cubits less, ten overall and in beam fifty cubits. With us there were one hundred and fifty men of the sea. The other craft with us was one hundred cubits overall and in beam thirty cubits, and had ninety men of the sea. Past Kabas, we sailed to the Akar of the two ports, to await the tidings of Shumar. The waterless city we left behind under the restless stars, and we came up to Nasin where we stood at our post three days. The seas mounted up on high, and the waters rose in wrath. Northwards we went, and all but one vessel was lost, all but one boat sunk. I subdued the raging waters with cunning, and the clouds were cleft by my skill. After many days were passed, we came to the land in peace. We were not cast upon the shore, no man came near us when we hammered our posts. We set up altars, and none denied us our rights. The god of that place made our god welcome. Then I went by way of the land of Sedek, which lies beyond Taxe, to the lord of Torka, an Egyptian, the second-born greatest of twins who ruled the people of Maiga. Here there are high mountains and great trees, and the roar of lions is heard in the night. The same Lord Torka is he whose father, now in port, took his vessel south of Pontus from Ophir towards the sun setting, past Kindia to the land of Pomer. He returned when the waters had risen four times and fallen thrice, and sorrow gave way to rejoicing. To the rim of the great circle he went, to where the fires of the netherworld were revealed, and men who were the brothers of dwarves. He it was who brought back the great hairy giant who rests with Thosis. Now, my lord is one hundred and ten years of age. I alone among his men understand the hidden words of the gods and the secret ways. I alone know the writing within the writing. I alone know the nature of the lords of the celestial mansions. Therefore the words of God come to you by the hand of the servant of the great God, the guardian of the book. Thus you may know all that has been made known to those who have slept in the house of the gods. Keep the writings as they now are for your children and your children's children. Nothing is perfect on an imperfect earth, but that which flows down and reaches us from the heart of God comes the nearest to perfection. The pure waters are sullied only by the imperfect and impure vessel in which they are caught. As it is written, so let it be rewritten. As it is written, so let it be done. Chapter 25 Song of Sacrifice They came like spoilers to the tomb. They came in the night. They were as robbers carrying foul deeds in the darkness. They came as night creatures fearful of the light. Rasmus they slew in the antechamber. He died not from the blows before his face, but from the steward's knife behind. Evil men lurked within and without. He died in the midst of his manhood strength, and his spirit was not unaccompanied in its journey. Neferlehi they took. They carried her off. 
proud and upright, she went to die in a foul place by the terrible hooks of the tormentors. Her greater loveliness will live forever in the halls of eternity. It will exceed the radiance of the sunlight and enfold the heart like the pale glory of the moonbeam. The son of Rasmus and his children, they slew and tormented. His residence, they defiled and laid in ruins. They sought the abode of the great god within its walls, but found it not. Brick and stone cannot fashion a residence for the true god. But they were sightless men. They did not see what lay before their eyes. Beauty and strength have been destroyed. The love that once adorned earth now graces a greater place. All things pass from earth. Nothing remains but the never-ending struggle of the great god which everlastingly transmutes earthly things. To it, we are what grains of sand are to the whirlwind that whips up a sandstorm. The records were not exposed to the workers of wickedness. They survive, they journey on, and they come to you. They come not that you might live, but that you might die. They bring glory and beauty to the soul. Can these be obtained except by suffering? Can clay be made beautiful except through scars? Can metal be fashioned to form except by fire? We journey towards a light we cannot reach and fall into a pit of darkness to find it at the bottom. We gaze on the beauty of the stars and think them above high when, behold, they are within our hearts. Man is not born to play, but to labor. Life is a basket which must be filled with sustenance for the future. The fool fills it with empty, unwholesome things. The wise man fills it with things of substance. Earth is a place of unreality. That which seems substantial here may have no true substance. That which seems desirable here may not be wholly desirable. That which serves here may not serve everywhere. Man is born to live, but he is also born to die. It is no more natural for him to live than it is for him to die. Death is no harder than birth. It is no more difficult than life. The best of today is gone. We console ourselves. Better will arise tomorrow. The earth gets better or it passes away. Men improve or perish. That is the law. May you find eternal springs of strength and courage welling up in your soul at the time of your testing. We, your brothers, go our destined way, and we shall not meet again in the same likeness. May your future amid the fountains of light be glorious and beautiful. And may you span the great gulf of the eternal years in splendor of form and spirit. I commend you to care upon it. May he protect you and keep you from evil. Chapter 26, The Scroll of Kabel, Section 1 The words of the great scribe of the universe by Laman, keeper of the water gate by the outlines. To the children of Laka at Kemwar, keepers of secrets, wise in the words of God, greetings. May your days be long in prosperity and peace. May the great sun of life endow your years with greenness. May you walk always with a feather in your heart, and may the wild fig tree flourish in the sand of your courtyard. Success in your journey to God's land. The guardian of sand wayfarers protect you along the road. These are God's words on the hidden portal, struck by one who slept within the temple and who knows the will of God. If they be heavy, they are also sound. My children shall pass across the wilderness and sea, and my wisdom shall go with them. The whirlwind shall not strike them, nor shall they be consumed by the sea monsters. When all this generation and its children shall be as swathed bodies in their coffins, my children shall not be at rest. They shall come to a land of many waters, where gold is found and there is copper in abundance. There they shall erect a temple to be the glory of God, and they will prosper and increase. Their women shall be honored by the water beast and be joined in their good fortune. These are the words they shall remember and strike on marble at the temple gate. These are the words they shall engrave forever. Good deeds must outweigh wicked ones on the great scales. Otherwise, the spirit is doomed to darkness. A man is expected to strive for perfection on earth, but not to achieve it. Let him be judged according to his efforts. Bewail not if prosperity departs from you, 
it passes from the good, for they have passed its test. The day of the destroyer will come again, and the land shall be laid waste. It will strike out of heaven at a time when there is prosperity and peace, though the minds of men shall be perplexed. It will be a time when men worship the works of men and say, There is nothing greater than these. When women are as men and men as women, when the hearts of men are in turmoil and all men seek pleasure and gain, when craftsmen are inefficient and workmen are idle and all men seek ease and comfort, be alert and strong, my children. Be ready for the day of the next visitation, when doom reaches down from the skies and man is blasted with irresistible power. These are the laws in which you shall find the strength to survive. Throughout the days of your hardships, remember them well, for they will bear you up. No man shall eat to excess or drink until he staggers. No man shall waste his substance in fornication. No man shall cut himself after the manner of the Easterners or suck blood. No man shall act with man as man acts with woman. These are the rules by which my children shall survive. They are not for the survival of each man or for everyone, for many must perish. Where some must die that others live, the weak shall die and the strong shall live. Where the choice of death is between man and child or woman and child, the child being instructed and capable of survival, shall live. The means of life shall be placed with the child or woman, and the man shall take his chance. Where the choice of death is between a woman with child and a woman without child, the mother shall live. Where the choice of death is between young and old, the young shall live, and the old shall die. But if the young be weak and the old strong, then the old shall live. Where the choice of death is between the wise and the foolish, the wise shall live, and the foolish shall die. Who shall decide? The foolish think themselves wise, and the wise are weak-voiced. Let one who is to die decide who shall live. Where few among many can hope for life, the craftsman shall survive the unskilled man, and the wife shall survive the maiden. The husband shall survive the fighting man, and he who has no wife. The child, being capable and instructed, shall survive the parent. The scribe shall survive the craftsman, and the sister shall survive the brother. The magistrate shall survive the priest, and the learned man the unlearned. The whole man survive the maimed man, and the whole woman the maimed woman. Knowledge shall survive strength, and skill shall survive fitness. Goodness shall survive wickedness, but who shall judge between them? Let the most instructed in wisdom and the writings decide. Joy shall survive gloom, and he who carries himself cheerfully shall survive he whose countenance is sad. Love shall survive hatred, and they who love shall be spared. He who serves better shall survive he who serves less, and the selfish man shall not live while the unselfish man dies. Woman shall survive men, but the common woman shall not live and the craftsmen die. Let the one serving best be the one to live. The strong man shall survive the weak, but the fool shall not live and the wise die. Neither shall the unskilled survive the skilled. Where there is a chance for life, the strong shall take that chance and leave the certainty to the weak. The kind shall survive the selfish but the brickmaker may not survive the scribe. All things shall be done to this end, that though men die, man shall live. If a priest says, Am I not the best to live? Say, Are you not the best prepared to die? These are hard things, but neglect them not. Men say, Let us pray we never have to use the sword but they do not let it rust. When cast upon a strange shore, Lucius chose in this manner. He lived who, by living, served best. He lived who had the best hope of life. He lived whose life held the most promise. Chapter 27, Unnamed and Unnumbered Scroll.
O companions in suffering, raise your heads and cease your lament. Misery and sorrow, trial and tribulation are the appointed lot of men. It is not the end. Let the test not be your endurance. This spoke with the voice of the God and said, All who worship the unknown God must be brought to judgment. Then it was the God's will they should be taken out into the wilderness, where none should see them die. Does he come to us as a friend or as one who would place a knife in our backs? What do we know of his thoughts? Is he with us? Even though he be ignorant of our ways. Let caution take priority. Let prudence be our guide. In the night, the voice of God spoke on the west wind through the columns at his mouth and said, Though not one of us, he serves us well. The feather is in his heart. Even the little gods weighed down heavily when asked to speak, and he found favor before them. He found favor in strange places. This is not the hour to cry the tidings in the concourse of the people. Be not unduly impatient. Every new thing has the hour of its birth. Many generations shall yet live and pass into dust before the child now conceived shall be born. Let it not be disturbed within the womb. Therefore, deal not with things best left alone. Arise, be strong in heart. Go from one to another. Gather the companions in suffering and let them come this way. Say to them, This is not the hour, nor is this the generation of the test. Gaze upon the warden of the night. Does he falter on the path? Is it not written that he shall be the herald for the coming of doom? Where then is the sign? Therefore look not unduly towards your destiny in the netherworld. Remember that the image of all that there is is also here. We are like fish beaten towards the enclosure. The eyes of men know the fish, but to the fish the men remain unknown. Yet we shall not be caught at the narrow end. One comes seeking us, but we are not here. His hand reaches out into the redlands, but we are not there. He searches round about, but we are inside, and when he comes within, we are without. Beyond the sea of blood, there is death. Turn downstream towards the land of waters. Carry the sacred writing into the lands of the strangers, even unto the land of the long days. There, they will receive the wisdom that the great people reject. The end here is a beginning in another place. Death here is birth elsewhere. Life is a wheel with no more than a mark between birth and death. May the great governing powers be gracious towards you, and may your paths be covered with grass. This is the beginning, not the end. Farewell. Chapter 28 Two Sections of an Unnamed Scroll Praise to the great lords of eternity who, once such as we, now sits in the everlasting halls. Sanctified forever be the name of the one God, to whom alone shall be given reverence and glory, who alone is worthy of worship. Greetings, my companions in suffering. May the sun ever rise in glory over your fields. May you enjoy peace and prosperity here, and rise in splendor to a life of beauty in the region of light. May your servants be ever dutiful and your sons upright. May the women of your household be ever diligent and neat, chaste and modest. Two generations have passed into judgment since the wild dogs came swiftly in the night and scattered the seeds of wisdom to the winds. The great land shall no more know the true greatness of wisdom. The black soil shall not nourish its seed. The seed shall spring up and burst forth into leaf in foreign lands among strange people. Our destiny lies northward, and such is foretold in the sacred writings. I go and my household, and Jothan the Sartesian with his household, my brother Kabel also and his daughter with Kerub and Agab of the house of Moshes. We go by way of Cambuses and the waters of Jabel, over the wild wilderness to the mountains of winds. Beyond them we journey into Kinzia, where there are pines. We shall take the records of Eastern Quarter and the guardians who remain with us. 
None among all who know our ways shall be forced to go, neither shall we condemn those who remain. The scrolls in four chests and the books of wisdom in their canopies go with those who depart. Our thoughts remain with Semlis. May he hail in peace with moderate winds and find everlasting glory and beauty in the netherworld. Written at his master's behest by Thomas, scribe at the quarter gate of Ephos. Chapter 29 Second Scroll of Kaisen I am Kaisen, son of Nesubat and Nektorab, a citizen of Akarnak. I am he who brought the sacred writings from the swamplands and gathered men together, who are the sons of light. Now the wisdom of olden times is replanted in the land, though it sits without in the courtyard. Yet among those behind the pillars, many know who among them sees clearly. Great secrets are hidden deeply, but they are not unknown, and the day will come when the soil will give up its treasures. I am not one who takes his ear in his hand when darkness clouds his heart. I came from out of the land of security to a place where all men would raise knives against me, where their eyes opened. In baskets of barley on the backs of asses came the sacred writings containing words to guide the wise and knowledge to dispel the powers of darkness. No magic could prevail against the superior spells I carried, and the treasures remained unseen. Men sit beneath the trees and nod their heads solemnly and roll out long books to read things that evaporate in the air. I deride not the books, but one blow of the sword can destroy ten thousand strokes of the pen. Those in high places persecute us, not because of the whole of the writings, for much is common to all, but because we seek to change the established order of things. We seek to change the ever-present state of affairs, because, too, we have a God who is not the holder of property, or a God of the rich and powerful. Who benefits from the riches and estates of other gods? The gods? Or their priests? Would they who benefit therefore welcome the words of God? Such is not the nature of men, and we have the nigh-impossible task of changing the natures of men. We proclaim that riches and high estate carry corresponding responsibilities. Is this doctrine to be welcomed by those high ones in the land who seek just to gratify their desires and lavish their riches on pleasure? Therefore, we either speak openly and die, or become enslaved, or we serve secretly and live. Can a dead man serve or a slave move freely among the people to gather men of spirit? I am a man of movement, and a hardy one, who is not easily set back. It was I who rekindled the flame. I brought to safety the four great books, of which one is the book of the Master's words, and one the book of the Master's deeds, one the book of the Master's ways, and one the book of awakening to life in the dawnlight. With them were the books of beginning and end, and the two and seventy scrolls. Not one was lost. I came back. I stood before the mother of the king in the great place and was unbowed, though I gave homage, for without my life all was lost. I took the truth even to the palace and was undefiled there. I returned to my dwelling place among the trees and dwelt beneath the great cow, near the temple where men worship the calf of gold. I leave my abode and my eyes are blinded. Therefore, when the earth is as if dead, I prepare my books, and men come and are refreshed in the coolness. Yet men who sit with books and men who do deeds are not alike, and each has his task. Therefore let not one despise the other, but let both go forward together, each bearing his own burden. Now I make ready to go downstream to the abode of light, that wisdom and truth may be carried to the appointed place under the everlasting stars, and there made secure to men in generations yet to grow up in the light. They will be seen in generations to come. I shall go on the wings of the sun before the retinue of the breaker of heads. I am one acknowledged as being peer of hands, and shall be with those who serve under the head of the Great One. My name henceforth shall be Hemnatar, and I shall not eat of fish or beans until I come to the place appointed to fit my station. I shall wear linen, and my sandals shall be made of grass, so that none shall perceive my greatness. I will hide great things within my heart, and a bridle will ever hold my tongue in check. 
I shall pray among the empty-hearted, but my prayers will not be as theirs, but as those offered in the days of our fathers, who sat and folded in silence two hours beforehand. Now the marks are changed by the hypocrisy of men. With me shall go Methumim, my brother, but Nephanathrith shall remain and provide for our father in faith. We shall be with he whom men call Nanpeka, for his foolishness in his father's abode. Kanamun shall be with us as chief overseer. Behind us we leave many in sorrow, but our stature shall not diminish, for greater things are always believed of those who are distant. Nofret, I depart from you in sorrow, but are not great loves increased by absence, while little ones diminish. Parting is the test of love. Let the years speak and enlighten us unto ourselves. Have we spoken truly one with the other? My son, my unseen little one, now asleep in comfortable darkness, gathering your strength for the coming struggle. May the great God of life add his strength to your strength. You will be a great one among men, for you were conceived in love and not in lust. Within the guardian of my heart you remain as a wonderful mystery. I am overcome with awe, for within you there is something God-inspired. It bestows strange powers upon you, so that at the appointed time you fight for air and light. You will be a man of courage, for such men are born to the fearless and good. Strength and beauty, courage and modesty have mated, that you might be the heir of their gifts. Your heritage was chosen by those who gave you life. It is your fate, my son, as a child born of woman, to fight and grasp, to grimly hold on to life as you reach across to this side of the earthly portal. There are dark powers that would drag you back, but you are not for them. Let the great light be ever with you, as a watchman's fire on a lonely road, when the evil powers beset your way. I pray, from the very inmost recess of my heart, that the lords of form walk with you and ever protect you from the formless ones. As you grow, may your thoughts ever seek to inquire. May you be filled with the heady wine of gods, the gift that spurs men to venture forth into strange places, seeking the unknown, which leads them to seek green pastures beyond the desert, the dawning over the sea rim, and the light beyond the circle of darkness. Adversity may be your lot, but your adversity is the greatest tutor. It is something welcomed by men as the measuring stick of their manhood. Adversity calls men forth to seek God and truth and drives them upward along the great path. May you ever seek the unknown and strive courageously against the unseen. May your spirit be high on the journey in this place, where so many men grow weary on the road. Be not one who sits following the ways of other men, but one who moves along a path of his own choosing. Keep the love of life given men, or life is lost, but cast aside the fear of death, for it is a small payment for a life well lived. Rejoice in living and walk in the sun, avoiding the shadows. Remember that though life is to be enjoyed to the full, its enjoyment is ever subordinate to duty. Be a man, my son. Be not a man of unbridled wrath, for such are rarely without trouble, though righteous wrath will lend strength to your arm. Be a man above pettiness and greed, above meanness and deceit. Keep forever the joys of friendships well made, and serve your friends well. Never betray friendship or turn it to serve your own ends, lest you become something less than a man. Carry high gladness in your heart, and never cease to wonder at the marvels of life. Not a day shall pass, but you will see something new to enrich your thoughts. Look at life as a man and not as an ox. Wonder at the great and awesome manifestations of God, such as sunlight and thunder, the dew and the stars, the sandstorm and the murmur of waters. Never let your eyes become dulled to the growth of trees, to the rising of the waters, and to the return of the harvests. Let your heart be hungry, hungry for knowledge, and your hand be ever seeking some skill. Hate lies and shun the coward. Walk with the men and learn manly ways. I know you will do the right thing, my son, for a bird does not beget a crab. I must tread a path you may not follow for many a year. 
I go, ashamed to leave you in surroundings unbefitted to your blood, but so it must be. Can the wilderness hold down the eagle or waters restrain the wild goose? No, neither can a true man be ensnared by his condition and circumstances. I go, my son, for go I must. I cannot delay. I kiss the lovely forehead of your noble protector. It will soon be the time of farewell. I will not be here to greet you, to welcome you at your first cry. I will know you not before I depart. Woe to a sorrowful father who can bestow not upon his unprotected child but a piece of stone and some writing. These are my words to you, my son. Live the life of a man, such as if all other men lived likewise, the great God himself would leap out of his heaven to welcome their race into the realm of gods. Live not as other men do live, but as they should live. Fare you well, my son. A good morning and a clear dawn. May the great wings enfold you until we meet. My old friend, upon you I have laid a charge not unworthy of your integrity. For you, the days of deeds are near past, and you therefore now stand on the threshold to the years of wisdom. Age should not think while youth should act, but youth needs the considered guidance and restraints of age. Old men for counsel and young men for action. You have aged wisely and carry no regrets, therefore is your counsel ten times valued. Then too you have lived well, and is not the old age of an eagle better than the youth of a sparrow? I leave you the two garments becoming to you, and one for your wife as a departure gift. Mine henceforth shall be those of the pure-handed. You know the things that are written on my heart. From Kaisen in the land of cedars by the hand of Ketilus to those who journey on across the great green waters by Jamulus to Sofer called the stranger, peace be with you and with your household. May your God be blessed as he blesses. Prosperity attend you and a safe journey. I kindled a fire for you, and the smoke arose straight up with the savor of the meat, and my heart rejoices for your protection. Now I say, declare these words clearly and with a true tongue. Neither suppress any, nor add to what is written. Nebuchadnezzar shall go with you in my stead, for he is as a young lion, while I lie sickened with the worm. It is a land of strangers with strange ways, where men pass water standing while women sit, where sons labor for their father's sustenance and women are not household mistresses. Among these people women are not respected. Ravish one, and the wrong is against the father and her father's house. Ravish one married, and the wrong is against her husband and her husband's house. Are men better under such laws? Unless the soil be treated with a husbandman's care, can the fruits from the sown seed be bountiful and good? There is no stability of rule, and princes strive one with another. The seasons come and go uncontrolled, and there are no records of harvests. In the public halls many men talk, but none write. The speech of the people is an uncouth babble. Thieves go unpunished, and those who slay buy their freedom with gold. Robbers purchase wives with their spoils. Sons do not obey their fathers, and daughters are willful. Harlotry is practiced in high places. You who leave are better served than I who stay, for I am able neither to go forward nor go back. I am not a man wise in words who counsels, but a man of movement and deeds. But of what good is a fig when a worm inhabits it? The broken pot does not go to the well. So go in peace, and fare you well on the way. If the sea journey be not smooth, then console yourselves, for it will strengthen the faith of those who waver. There are many who doubt the existence of God in fine weather, but quickly recover their faith as the winds and waves rise. Take Nebor Toret, for it is fitting that he go. He is one well favored for such a venture. He is one who, if he fell overboard, would come up with a fish in his mouth. If God fell from the skies, it would fall at his feet. I have rewritten what I found in four parts. 
be it not well done, I could do no better, for much was lacking, and the letters are strange. Chapter 30 Scroll of Panubis To Osirahes from your servant, Panubis, may the one God grant you long life and contentment. May Nebetnif be your everlasting joy. May strife ever depart before your shadow. Your servant writes with difficulty, for his heart has become small within him, and few are those whom he can trust with tasks of importance. In considering the events occurring in the land, few are the words of assurance that can be written. Things do not get any better. From year to year they get worse. The secret writings remain with us, but they are lightly regarded by those who should cherish them. Few still walk in their lights, and in all the land the right way of life is avoided. The path of righteousness is spurned. It is beyond the strength of men today. Here, at its heart, the land is distressed. Better by far to dwell at the edge of the pool where none but the strongest ripples reach, and they as no more than a slight disturbance. Men cry aloud with sorrowful hearts, for their lives are churned over. No longer are their institutions respected, and like wild dogs man seeks to snatch the sustenance of men. Contentment and trust have departed, peace has gone, and hope is no more. Mornings come, and the men arise to greet them with anticipation of change, but this passes with the early mists, and the sun goes down on despondency and despair. Your servant is heavy laden with care, he is burdened with sorrow, but adjusts his life to the times. Better by far would it be if he were many days journey away. The burdens of yesterday remain while those of today are added to them. Those of tomorrow already weigh heavily. Your servant wearies under the load, but he carries on without falter. The mouths of all men remain mute. They speak not about that which afflicts the land. The hearts of all are disturbed, but their tongues remain silent. Strange gods have entered upon the land, such gods as have not been known before. Who are gods of sorrow and despoilation? The silent strength hidden in the heart of the land, the spirit of its life, the secret of the one God has not been sufficient. Men have failed to bear up under the blows of misfortune. The calamities have overwhelmed them. Their wills and spirits are weak. Alone of all in the land, the devoted in God remain firm and stout-hearted. Yet wickedness covers the land as waters at their rising. This is the testing time for men. This is the trial of their strength, but their frailty is established and they fail and fall. Those who should be resolute and firm to maintain the order of things are weak and faint of heart. They are weaklings, their wickedness has eaten their manhood like the people. They seek not but the easy way. Their desire is to live in ease and comfort untroubled by the times. They care not that greatness has departed from the land. Affliction besets men on all sides, it encompasses their days. In the morning, they open their eyes to tribulation and suffer it the whole length of the day. The rich man robs the poor, the strong oppresses the weak, the unprotected virgin is seduced, the widow is ravished, and the orphan defiled. Greed and lust range wide through the land. It is a time of heart testing. The tongues of men wag with strange tales, and it is difficult to remain silent when falsehood stalks boldly throughout the land. In such times the ignorant and foolish lend their ears to any falsity. How can the wise reply to the ignorant when wisdom is exposed to ridicule and truth to persecution? To expose the folly and wickedness of the powerful brings down rods of wrath upon long-suffering backs. The ears of rulers are closed to words of wisdom. The doors of their hearts are bolted against truth. To reply wisely or give good counsel from the books of wisdom is to invite scorn. Men no longer worship at the shrine of Sabaoth. The servant no longer devotes himself loyally to the affairs of his master, and where the arms of many are needed at the task, it is abandoned. Men no longer toil at the task with cheerful hearts. They no longer labor in accord. Men are tied down by their own inability. They are shackled by their own fears. They've become timid, fearful, 
even the halls of judgment are no longer inviolate. The decrees are cast forth to be stamped underfoot by ignorant men. Even things that sustain the spirit now serve to prepare sustenance for the belly. Records are falsified so that no man knows the truth from false. The tallies of produce are no longer taken and corn becomes the property of any man. He who lies readily gets the best. He who acts the deceiver gets most. Ignorant men have raised themselves to high estate by falsehood and deceit. None raise his hand or voice against them, and therefore their ways are acclaimed and emulated. Truth is mocked and justice vilified. A man fears his brother as a foe and his son as a betrayer. He plows his field bearing shield and sword. Men walk abroad girded for battle. But now the day has dawned when henceforth even manly defense is denied them. When a man is slain by the side of his own brother, he who lives flees to save his limbs. When a woman is ravished, they who see turn away. The screams of maidens fall on deaf ears. Spearmen gather in bands, but the standards they bear are not those of justice and truth. Bowmen stand alert, and arrows are loosened in their quivers. The men of blood exult, for it is their day. If a man of high estate be unguarded, he is slain, and if rich, he is robbed. If a high-born woman be unprotected through lack of kindred or gold, she becomes a harlot. In the marketplace, men say, better a well-fed harlot than a goddess dead from hunger. Even men who are not men have their place in these days. Would that I could journey to a land against the rim of earth. Men of no estate and landless men become the lords of men, and strangers become masters of slaves and servants. They stir up strife among the people and say, This is because we are protected by the gods of power. By what are you protected? The people know not that the power of gods is sustained by the spiritual devotion of the people, and their power flows from the strength and goodness of their worshippers. When a people fail their god, that god fails the people. I am a man instructed, and know this is a time of strengthening affliction, but my heart troubles me. Will the people understand this? Will they rise to meet the challenge or go down the path of ease, the fair path of flowers and fragrance? Is this the land of leaders, wherein will be erected the temple of truth and the stairway to heaven? Would that I could peer through the door of the unborn days. Strange bowmen have entered the redlands and they spoil the people. They are men whose delight is in suffering. They are men whose pleasure is destruction. They tear down, but they do not build. The roads are covered and the water channels opened. The craftsman no longer interests himself in his craft, for that which he makes is taken away. He who reaps does not store the corn, but he who is without a plow never lacks a full storehouse. The harvests go unrecorded, and he who toils not eats with he who has labored at the ingathering. The man without cattle eats meat while he who owns them eats herbs. The water rises and falls away from the land, but none plows or sows, for men say, the events of tomorrow are not unknown, and who knows what man will reap where we have plowed and sown. The scribe is stricken and dies on his stool. His writings become a mystery and are disdainfully trodden underfoot. The fruit of many days' labor become kindling. The wisdom and knowledge of generations becomes fuel for fires of destruction. The weaver has abandoned his loom, and robbers lie in wait to strip men of their garments. The keepers of storehouses are stretched out before the doors, and storage places are empty. Charcoal has gone from the land, and the watermen have left their hoists. Slaves wander without masters, and children roam begging for bread. No longer do men sail northward, and there is no cedar wood for those who have departed. Gold and silver have gone back into the soil, and copper is hidden in the ground. Ships that leave return no more. The roads are places of danger, and he who journeys with goods reaches a strange destination. He who is unarmed or undefended becomes the plaything of brutal men. They who rob become lords, and they who once ruled with riches wander in rags. 
Chests of ebony wood are smashed open and fine furniture is broken and burned. No man possesses vases or things of metal. No door is closed and no dwelling secured. The mysteries of the temples have been taken away. Such is the state of the land wherein your servant dwells. It is a land of sorrow. It is a time of tribulation. When Thumis came to me with your letter, my heart grew big with gladness, for it told me you had reached a secure mooring. My heart spoke to my spirit and said, Where in the land is left another such as he, one who judged with impartiality, whose head never inclined towards a bribe, who ever stood firm for truth, who saved the lowly man from the oppression of the powerful and the humble man from the hard hand of the arrogant? Such men no longer serve in the land. I am one who is instructed, and therefore I know that the life of each man has a set span, and from this knowledge I gain courage. I know that from whence the Spirit came, there it will return. Each night my soul goes to pastures of the Spirit, and there sustains itself and is refreshed at the fountain of eternity. I arise renewed in vigor to face the trials of each new day. The state of the land has been made known to you, and therefore I ask that you take into your charge the sacred things and writings, which are now guarded here. Daily our task grows more difficult, and we live in fear of two-tongued men among us. Also your servant lacks the knowledge and wisdom that reside in you, and he fears because of his inability to deal with the situation. Now the guarded things can be conveyed to you though this is beset with difficulties and danger, but if there is delay, nothing can pass out of this land. Here things cannot change for the better. If you ask your servants to continue with his charge, he can but reply that the floodwaters already lick at the foundation of the walls. The hostile ones gather before us. Can Opiwa to be kept from his dwelling place or Ray from his descent? Therefore this goes in haste with Thumis, who has the means of passing through the land. He knows the roads and the waters. The sand wastes do not shut him in. I leave all things in your hands. May sorrow never stretch out towards you. May you live forever in a form of glorious perfection. Your servant hopes to see you, but submits to his master's will. Chapter 31 Scroll of Thotis. These writings are dedicated to the great God who is eternal. May they live forever among things that survive to serve man. May they be an enlightening lesson and a warning to those who follow. For now a dark night of ignorance and fear overshadows the land. Your servant bows to your will, O great God, who is benevolent towards those who serve with purity of intent. We who remain loyal glorify you not with mere words, for the time of hypocrisy is past, but in our innermost thoughts and in our deeds. We remember you as the sun rises to your glory in the morning, and as in the evening it sets into your peace. Teach us that there is joy in being your servants. Keep us under your protecting wing. Great Spirit who made the Nile flow, the great water which never wearies or ceases from its journeying, Its movement is as everlasting as the wind. May the stream of my life be filled to overflowing with the waters of righteousness. Loose the shackles of wickedness, which hold me captive. Let not the string of my lutes be broken while I play, and let not my labors be ended before their fulfillment. Though men hail me for a greater thing than any that has been done before, it will not be my memorial. Time will eat away my name, but let many mornings dawn on my waking, that I may complete the task entrusted to me. Remove the fears that lurk about me in the solitude. Cut off the bonds of affliction that binds me down. Let my spirit roam free. We who remain loyal know your laws and the great law, which is as firm as the hills of immortality. In the days to come, great songs will be sung unto you, even as they were sung in the old days. The priests can no longer be held in restraint by Umotif, and dark days threaten us. It is a time of foreboding, yet there is peace throughout Kahemu. The state of men in high places is such that the beauty of truth has to be concealed from them, lest they profane even her purity. 
Under the shelter of her mantle, even those strengthened by the visions seen in the eternal chambers are liable to lapse into many wickednesses. They would say in their hearts, being one who is purified, I am safe. I can cleave the dark waters of evil as a seabird does the ocean and rise, all wickedness falling away from me as water falls from the back of the soaring bird. Thus it is today, and was even in the days long gone, for such things are written in the old manner on a scroll found at Hanu. The first land on earth wherein men dwelt was not Kahemu, it was a land out beyond the salt waters. To this land came the immortal spirit in the form of a radiant one from heaven, who had left his more enlightened place to dwell among the beasts in the lower kingdom of sorrow. In some mysterious way, he became incarnated as man. How? We know not, but he founded the race of man. It is not as recorded in tales told for the ignorant. None knows in truth the old motherland or where it was. There are tales, but they disagree. The nine bows say it was southward. The learned priests are not united in thought. Some say towards the west where the sun now sets, while others say towards the east where the sun rises. Southward are great mountains and forests, monsters and men covered with hair. Here, winds are formed within the earth and issue forth from a black cavern. It is a place of chaos where water, soil, and air are not separate. The old motherland could not have been there. To the left-hand side there is a great wilderness, the land of Amua. The old motherland could not have given birth to such as these. To the right hand is the wide plain of man-eaters, which stretches out to the far reaches of old Kahemu. This was barren even in the oldest times. To the north of the wilderness the land is occupied by deformed men and dwarfs, where amid this could have been the fertile pastures and plow lands well watered from the Sky River where men lived in peaceful content. The old motherland was never there, nor, as some say, in the waters beyond, which boil at the extremity. Beyond the wide river there was once a land graced with all riches needful to men, crowned by many walled Meru, but it was not the land of our birth. Northward is the home of the cool breeze, but beyond the lands which skirt the salt water are the one-eyed peoples and the giants with white hair and eyes. Here, the rocks and stones are of the whitest marble, and the trees bear white fruits. Thus in the whiteness the eyes of men are blinded in their truth, for even the grass grows white. Before this is the land of Asugia, a place unproductive and barren, where fruit never appears on trees and crops will not ripen. How could the old motherland lie in this direction? In the old books, it is said that the old motherland was ruled by the Queen of Lights, who was supreme above all. The temple tells tale that the lesser gods came to dwell among mortal men when the Mistress of Brightness ruled in Kalathi, that they were sheltered in temples and priests were appointed to minister unto them. It is said that places of instruction were set up within the temples, but few men were taught the inner knowledge. It was rightly held that it would be a danger to those without wisdom, and it had to be safeguarded. Is this not the tale told in the Book of Beginnings? It is said that Kelathi lay within the borders of Kahemu. But could it not have been the land of similar-sounding name outward from Pontus beyond God's land? It is not said of both that they were engulfed in fire and water. In the Book of Beginnings, it is said, the generations passed and a vast amount of knowledge and wisdom was accumulated and preserved in purity. It was the heritage of mankind, but though a man had learned to cherish the light of truth and walk wisely with it, nevertheless, then as now false priesthoods flourished. They pandered to the carnal desires of the undeveloped and exploited the weaknesses of the ignorant. Their iniquity built up a vast weight of evil in the netherworld, which projected itself into the material of earth, so that the powers which upheld it became unstable. This caused all the southern parts of the old land to sink down into heaving waters. The disaster was brought about through the ascendance of evil. Rites which awakened the dead were rife among the carnal-minded and ignorant, while those who remained steadfast on the harder road of spiritual development had fixed their eyes on the light ahead, ignoring the pitfalls at their feet. It was then, even as now, 
will men ever learn? This was the aspect of the disaster, as written in the book of the beginnings. There were openings in the land from which evil vapors poured forth as a mist, descending upon the people like a mantle. It spread out and covered the whole face of the land. The tongues of the people were stopped and they became dumb with fear. The ground trembled beneath them and great tongues of flame shot up. The whole land heaved and rocked like an ocean wave. As it rose and fell, groaned and shook, the fires which strove burst forth to meet with shafts of lightning striking down from heaven. A thick black cloud of smoke filled the land, and men were smothered in dust. As the setting sun rested on the horizon, it could be but dimly seen beneath the cloud as a fiery red ball. When it had gone, a gray dense darkness prevailed, lit only by great sheets of lightning. The waters broke heavily over the land, sweeping it clean. The plains and cities were covered, and new shores formed around the mountains. The waters mounted up until all that moved and lived was covered. The land was submerged. Mountain tops alone remained above the rush of uplifted torrents. Whirlwinds blew and brought cold winds which cleared away the dust and debris. Mud banks were formed, and a mountain mouth remained open to spew forth vile vapors. During one long, awful night, the doomed land was torn apart, and southward sank out of sight forever. A wise man has written, This was not mountain girth Kalathi, or age-old Ramukui. This was the land out in the green waters where the sun sets beyond Keftu, near the lands of Henbua. It is then said, they came through the marshes and across the wild mountains beyond the barren places of stone into a new land called Anketa. Here grew the great life tree, known even in the days of our fathers. This is a tree of strange aspect, like unto no other, though in the days of our fathers it was barren and enclosed in flames. Now we know that the life tree grew in Talius, which is towards the lands of Don by Pontus, Therefore could not the old motherland have been found hereabouts. Not all was inundated. It is said, Men came out of the devastation. Behind them the land sank and the earth shook, mountains split apart and crumbled. Where once there had been a valley now stood a mountain. The air was filled with smoke and hot rocks were hurled down from out of the sky, men choked in brimstone. Great winds howled like a thousand unearthly wild dogs. They left all behind them and came across the wild places to the land of refuge. Was not Kahemu once known to some men as a land of refuge? Therefore the whereabouts of the old motherland is not unknown. It is said that when men came from the old land, the everlasting stars rested where earth meets heaven. But none knows how many lifetimes have passed since then. Thus, it is not impossible to discover where the old motherland lay. Therefore, there is hope, and men need not despair, for the secret may be rediscovered. When once again the sacred things rest in the old land from whence they came, the days of disturbance will cease, and once again men will live in peace. Men go forth to seek the road. All is not lost to us yet. Now the great house of the hidden places stands in Kahemu. It is built to last forever and stands up strongly towards heaven, high above the heads of men. It is covered with white stones. The white stone of Rehakom was cut for it, and above it topped with copper. It is not the copper of men, but the copper of God. Within it lies the womb of rebirth used by the twice-born of the enlightened ones. Men enter its portals to die and come out restored to life, reborn as gods. Beside it stands the temple of the radiant ones, many pillared and walled about. Here is the great portal of entry into life, and above it, on a great stone, these words may be seen. From the children of God to the children of men, behold, we found you in bondage to mortal bodies and bestowed upon you the gift of everlasting life. My brothers, these are days of distress, and no man knows the outcome of the strife that rends the land. For long generations this was a land of peace, a land blessed with bounty, but now men have wrought evil upon it. 
they who have gone to save it may not complete their journey back, and not shall have been achieved. Therefore I say unto you, Prepare to depart hence, even as it is written, Let the things that are more valuable than life be brought to safety. Above life and land is God. He is above life and land. Chapter 32 Scroll of Harmotiv Odedef of Onekefu found many scrolls from the olden times. The inspector of temples discovered writings from the days of the wise ones, many things from the past and utterances by lords of the Kohar. He caused them to be copied and placed in the houses of record. Some were guarded from the eyes of men. The writings dedicated to the name of the great god were sought out. Nekat, a scribe at Yano, wrote them down. They are set forth by his hand. They are not lost and will live when he and his sons and his sons' sons rest in Morningland. He will abide in Amentuth in peace. The physician must know the courses of the watchers. He must know their times and their comings and goings. He must know the secret of the Lord of Forms and the way of the guide of souls. He must know who are the owners of forms and who are the formless ones. He must know their abode. He must know the road and the four ways of entry. He must know the nature of the devil power. He must be a master at drawing forth the spirit. He must know the outside of man, the things which flow over it. He must know the inside man, the substances which fill it. He must know the heart, the muscles that move out from it, controlling every action of the body. These are words to fill the ears of the physician. These things are written on his heart. The physician sits on a throne of silence. The physician absorbs the pains of the sick through his ears. If any man opens the door of his heart to the physician, the tongue has no knowledge of what the ears have heard. The inmost room is open to the silent man. The heart of the physician is not puffed up because of his knowledge. He talks with the simple man as though he were wise. The words of the physician are as healing herbs. The physician bears himself so that when the eyes of the sick fall upon him, they are half cured. The eyes of the physician see through the flesh. And when he sat before his master, he learned to bear patiently the chastisements for his own failings, and now he can justly reprove another for his. The tongue of the physician is dipped in honey, not in guile. Where truth adds to suffering without benefit, then he may veil it, but never will he do so without purpose or care. The physician does not fear the god above the stars. He does not shrink before the face of death. He is a man of wide wisdom. He knows the nature of the lesser gods. The lesser gods are the limbs and attributes of the great god and form his members. He will not seek to raise up the dead. He will not seek to speak with them. He is beyond the urges of gold. He knows the laws of the great god. They cover countless years. They are fixed and unchangeable and never fail at their times. The physician knows the measurements of the hours and the movements of the days. When the vital, God-given breath is stopped by demons, the body becomes restless and hot. They stir the heart. They drive out the body water containing the life. The demons must be made inactive and put to sleep with one of the sleeping droughts. The body is to be made cool, for the demons of heat are expelled with coolness. They will enter into a vessel of earthenware, if it be warmed and can then be destroyed. If a man be slain in battle or by the body being pierced, the destroying demon enters through the blood. The body is broken and it enters through the opening. The breath is stopped. Breathing ceases. The outward senses are discarded. The spirit departs to find its memories intact in the keeping of its spirit twin. The liberated spirit is united with its spirit twin and it dwells in another sphere. It is a place of fulfillment, not unlike earth. The physician must not hamper the departing spirit once breath has left the body. He must not bind it. The spirit does not pass to the morning land awake. It awakens there as from a sleep. It does not unite with its spirit twin until judged according to its color. When united together, all over there appears alike to all here. All past hopes and desires appear before the Risen One. The gods that have been worshipped are given form there. 
they arise before the eyes of the Risen One. The worship of strange, lesser gods is not forbidden, for it helps purify the heart. It makes wholesome the heart. And the words spoken before unhearing images are not lost. They are heard by greater ears than men can conceive. The great God made ten lights or rays which flow forth from his midst. Each shines in the form of his power. His thoughts have imparted to it. They are shed everywhere and contained in all things. The physician is wise if he is master of the rays. A man is melancholy. It is not that a demon has made its abode in his body. It is not a sickness of the body. See if his land is feeble. Look at his crops. Have they failed? If the wife of a man be unfaithful, his crops will not grow. If his sister be unmarried and unchaste, he will suffer infertility in his herds. The trees of his garden will not bear fruit. Corn and wheat will not yield their bounty. A man's daughter being unmarried and unchaste, his birds and beasts will waste away. He will become downcast in spirit. His eyes will become dull. The cure is not within the man. His body is not unsound. No demon abides there. The cure is in the daughter. The man must brand her with burning brands. She must be branded in stripes. She must name the man who made her impure. And she must denounce the one who made her a fountain of impurity. Her impurity afflicts her father. It goes forth invisible as air to lay hold on his birds and beasts. If she would be tested, she is given a drought. It is gall of dog, juice of aloe, ashes of goatthorn, each one measure in five measures of water. If she throws up the evil, she is purged and purified. If there is no evil, it does not come up. She makes an image of the man who made her impure. He brought evil into her. She burns his image in purifying fire. Into the ashes go all her thoughts and longings for him. She is free from evil. A woman knows an adulteress and locks the secret in her heart. She does not denounce the adulteress. Her male kindred go to war or to hunt. They will die or be wounded. The knowledge hidden in her heart becomes like a barb in living flesh. It becomes putrid, a thing of evil. As putrid flesh gives off an aroma of corruption, which pollutes as it festers and spreads evil, so does hidden knowledge of evil fester in the subtle essences. It spreads abroad, and as blood cries to blood, it reaches the blood of a man under strain. This woman must be branded in stripes and purified. She must denounce the adulteress. The adulteress will be dealt with, then like an unchaste woman purified with the water of maidens. The blood of a guilty man must be spilt to save the blood of one who has done no wrong. The physician does not punish, and he does not seek out one who deserves punishment. The art of the physician is to heal. Men suffer sickness of the heart. They become sad. Their birds, their beasts, their crops are stricken, but the evil springs not from evil festering in women. The evil is within themselves. Their household is in disorder. They are confused in thought. They say one thing when they mean another. None is at peace with them. They become hot ones. They must no longer strive to dwell in the north wind. They must labor for another or take up the tools of a craftsman. Better a life long in poverty and peace than a short life weighed down by riches and care. A man is in pain or it becomes you to cut into his flesh to remove a demon's abode, or to draw together bones that have parted. Then is the time for putting forth the spirit. He may be given the drink of slumber. It is for you to decide. You will move the gabulik before his eyes. You will call forth his spirit. You will move your hands downward over his body, spreading the power of your spirit. Your voice will give him instructions. The power will enter his body. It will close all doors between his spirit and his body. His body will breathe. It will live. But he will be as one dead, for his spirit is called forth. You will place the eye of horror upon him. It will bind him. He cannot move. He is fast. You will speak to him. You will ask of him the thing he cannot know. Yet he will answer. If his spirit be called forth, it will know the thing he cannot know. 
You can tell him you will sleep the sleep beyond sleep. You will tell him there is no pain and that doors between the body and the spirit are closed. His eyes do not see. His skin does not feel. His flesh is soft. You can enter his body with an instrument. If he have the abode of a demon within him, you pierce it. You draw forth the demon in the fluid, and it runs away. The seat of the demon falls upon itself. You close it with a thin rod of copper made of hot. It is purified. You draw the flesh together. You fold it back. It is covered with long boiled satish. You leave the man enwrapped in the eye of horror. You tell him to awaken. All decisions are yours. He awakens not as Osiris, unless it be the will of Osiris. A man is plagued by a demon, which has made its abode in the innermost recesses of his body. It cannot be found. He talks loosely, his tongue lacks control, his thoughts are wrapped in shadows, his heart moves quickly, water flows from his body. He finds no peace in sleep, his hands tremble, there is pain in his head, he relishes no food. He is a man of many thoughts, but knows not what to do. You call forth his spirit. You will place him in the chambers of silence. You will enwrap him in the healing aroma. The doors between his spirit and body are shut. You place the eye of horror upon him. He sleeps in the eye of horror. It fills every recess of his body. It seeks out the demon. It destroys the demon in its abode. The demon is not called forth. You speak with the spirit of the man. Is it at peace? Is it restful? You decide the time of awakening. This is the healing sleep. You, the physician, are the master of sleep. Of all physicians, sleep is the greatest. The pupil asks, what is sleep? It is renewal of spiritual energy. The spirit returns to its source, to the fountain of its being. The body lapses into sleep. The spirit is easily recalled. It is not far away. A man lacks sleep. He cannot sleep. He becomes sick. His body is heavy, his footsteps slow. He lacks strength, his thoughts go from him. His limbs ache, but he has no point of sickness. He cannot say what ails him. His pillow is a place of torment, his bed a wilderness of wild thoughts. Small things of little moment loom before him as mountains. You decide. If it be simple affair without himself, an affair of his household, a problem at the task, a soothing drought will suffice. Let the spirit obtain the substance for its forces peacefully, and it will renew its vigor. It will be well. If the sickness comes from within, if it come from something entered within, then the healing sleep will bring a cure. A man fears the nightcomer. He fears to sleep, lest the nightcomer sees him. He builds an abode of sickness with bricks of fear. He has opened a window into the place of terror. He must be purged. He must be purified with incense. He may eat while the overseer of heaven rises upward, but not while he descends. When night approaches, he must dance around his habitation until weary. He will bathe himself in warm waters to be purified. His misdeeds will fall from him. They will no longer attract the nightcomer. It will not rise from the dark abode to haunt him. A man has a festering sore. He has a wound. It is unclean and it turns yellow, and then it darkens. There is evil beneath the hardness. Salt is dissolved strongly in water and made warm. The sore and the wound are bathed. The hardness is softened and is taken away. The yellow which has come up is taken away. Hamu leaves are pounded. They are sprinkled with brimstone. They are placed on the wound and they are bound up with linen. A wound is large or a battle wound. It must be made clean with liskin wood and water. If the maggot sees on it and consume the evil and the blackness, it can remain. When the flesh is clean and bright, it must be covered up to stop the entry of unclean things. And the sixth sign must be on top. There is benefit if the wound be left open to the sun. A man is burnt. The skin blisters, it gives out water. The skin is consumed. The flesh is raw. It is not black. The flesh is soft. The burned is laved in cool waters, and it is sprinkled with the water of the susumen. It is not bound up. A wound does not heal, a burn does not heal. You take yellow dried powder of luba. The powder is placed in water. It remains yellow, then cast it out. It turns red, then use it forthwith, but do not keep it with you. A woman in childbirth. 
a man wild with fever. Water made hot with stones is poured on the tree of life. It soaks during two nights. It is given often and drunk deep. It is the basis of many things. It can be kept. The tree of life is pounded. It becomes pulp. A joint swells filled with pain. The pulp is applied. It sticks. It is not bound. The rectum becomes a place of evil. It bleeds. The evil stirs up inconvenience. The pulp of the tree of life, four measures. The pulp of poppy fruit, one measure. Oil of sufan, one measure. Moon oil, two measures. A man becomes sluggish in the grip of fat. His body is encased in fat. He is in a state of sickness. His body is silted up with fat as the water channels are silted up with sand and soil. Fat is the adversary that eats away a man's welfare. It chokes his body as weeds choke a waterway. He who walks with fat is a man who ever carries a load of sand. He is purged day after day. He shall be given little water. He shall walk long distances in the heats of the day and bathe in uncool water. A shallow pit shall be dug during the cool of the morning and left during the rising of the sun. As the sun declines, the fat man shall be put in the pit. The sand will cover all but his head. He shall be left during the declining of the sun in the evening. His meal shall be small. This he will do many times. He shall not eat of sodden foods or foods which grow and are hard. All that grows and is soft shall be eaten, but shall be unsodden. Learn dancing and movements of the body, so that the soul and body may develop in harmony. Let nothing enter the mouth or come forth from it except to be controlled by moderation. A hungry man exposes the wickedness of others, but an overstuffed one does no less. The body of a hungry man is abused through no fault of his own, but the abuse wrought by an overfed man is his own doing. Never forget to call upon God in your sickness, and you will find he comes with fond compassion. When his power enwraps you, sickness is overcome. The Egyptians were wise, but their ways were not our ways. The cures of their physicians were for them and not for us, as our bodies, being sustained in a different manner, are unlike in their humors. The substances which bring about a cure can be obtained only from the surroundings in which the body moves. Anything from another land lacks the essential harmony. Therefore, all the recipes recorded on this long scroll are omitted. Our material is limited, and this is not a treatise on physics. This scroll was among those added. Chapter 33 Annexed Scroll 1 O great city, O heart of Egypt, your habitations are overthrown and your sacred shines lie buried beneath the sands of time. The dust of ages enwraps you, as the dead one is swathed in a tomb. Your temples still stand and ring with noise, but the solemn shrines are silent. They have become an abode for the wild dog and scorpion, and your roads are highways of wickedness. Behold, in the days long gone down into dust, the whirlwind came and earth poured out her wrathful breath, so that you were burnt. The evildoers were swept away by the waters, and the wicked ones were swallowed up in fires. The days of the years were shortened, and the times of all things altered. The seasons were turned around so that the seed rotted within the soil, and no green shoots came forth to greet the day. All buds withered upon the vines. The land lay dead under its gray shroud. The moon changed the order of her ways, and the sun set himself a new course, so that men knew not where they were, and all were afflicted. The stars swam in a new direction, and the whole order of things was changed. Yet, O oh Egypt, even from those days of calamity you emerged unbroken, your spirit intact, your heart unshaken. What has happened to you, O oh land of mine? Weep, O land of Egypt, weep for the things that have gone. Weep for the spirit now departed, weep for the betrayed gods, weep for the great God so high above them that you scarcely knew him. Weep for the destruction that has befallen you, weep for all the beauty and glory that have gone down into dust, weep for the eternal ages and sleep forevermore. Your spirit has departed, your life had ebbed away, your vitality has burnt itself out, only the empty corpse remains. The generations yet to tread the earth will know nothing of you. 
They will see no more than the dead, dried, mummified things, the loving life that once vitalized it so gloriously they cannot know. O son of Kabu, forgive the people of this land for their ways. Reveal your greatness by serving those who no longer walk in the lights of your instruction, even as you served their fathers in days gone by. My land, what have you become? You have left the true path of your faith and wandered into strange byways. You have bemused and bedazzled with things that disturb the senses and have become like a ship adrift without oars. You have abandoned the spirit that inspired you and sought satisfaction among lifeless things on earth. You have spurned the stern discipline required to win the hand of love and trodden the well-worn path of carnal satisfaction. You have turned to the ways of the harlot, and out of your harlotry you have wrought destruction. You no longer delight in the serene mystery of the stars above. Your pleasures are in the filth beneath your feet. Where once you gazed upward in awe, now you look downward in degradation. Oh, that this is the self-chosen fate of my land. I go, for go I must. I depart, for destiny demands it. When his motherland collapses about him like an undermined palace built on a foundation of mud, then it is not a time for hesitation. One cannot stem a flood with his hand. When his habitation falls apart, it is time to seek another. Perhaps nations like men grow old and decay. My land is old. A hundred and twenty generations have passed through it since Osiris brought light to men. Four times the stars have moved to new positions, and twice the sun has changed the direction of his journey. Twice the destroyer has struck earth, and three times the heavens have opened and shut. Twice the land has been swept clean by water. The lot of man destined for exile is sorrow, but as a sorrowful man I would save others from misery. I would leave a memorial for their guidance and knowledge to increase the wisdom of their days. Let my voice of warning ring out to all men. Let it reach even the strange lands beyond the sea, even into Haunibut. Listen to my voice. Take heed to my cry. Be warned, lest you too fall under the condemnation of destiny, lest you too be struck down by the sword of tribulation. My motherland, the land I knew, is no more. It lives, yes, as a flower lives when plucked and dried as a fruit lives when pickled and preserved, or as a man lives when embalmed. About the days of noon, we have no knowledge. Before creation commenced, there was the one father slash mother being, and from this divinity came the heavenly twins. From these were born three, and the three became many. Thus, even in the beginning, it was divinely ordained that brother and sister might be wed. From the first heavenly twins were born those whose destiny it was to be eternally married. For theirs was the divine right of eternal and undying love, a love unknown to mortals, but to which, if they would be more than mortal, they must aspire. This love is the light of life, the light of the earth, the sun of the spirit. The originating divinity is called in many names among men, and in Egypt his names are hidden in other names. Among the chosen ones, he is called the craftsman creator, but men and women name him differently among the people. Likewise, some say him while others say her. It is all alike, for these are no more than words and distinctions of mortal man. Heaven is the sphere of God, the true abode of his spirit and essence. There is the heaven above, which is the high heaven, and the heaven below, which is the reflection of the high heaven. The true center of God is in Nuit. The craftsman of creation placed heaven and earth apart. He set the sun and stars in motion and spread wide the earth beneath them. His wisdom he enclosed within the hearts of men, wherein it still lies sleeping. Heaven goes his daily rounds like a husband foraging for his wife's sustenance, while earth is busy with the duties of a wife, feeding and cherishing that which she has brought forth. Is not all life known to man born of earth? Is it not nourished upon her breast? Unless it be that they derive pleasure in company, why do heaven and earth remain together? Without earth, how could the grass grow, the basic substance of life? How could trees, fruits, and flowers bloom? Without earth, what could the water and warmth of heaven produce? 
God put desire for each other into the hearts of men and women, that in their union the race of men should be preserved. Likewise, he has implanted in every part of life the desire for another compatible part. Thus life endures and multiplies. Earth and all life upon it are bent towards one end, one purpose, the service and development of man. Without man as the objective, earth would be useless. It would have a purposeless, futile existence. Even night and day, the daylight and the dark serve in the nurture and development of man. In the early days of Egypt was bounded in the west by the green bitter waters. There lay the land of Nilar, where men learned to bend the dead bodies so that the earth-bound spirits of departed ones should not wander to molest them. Out here was the city of Miro. From whence came the mighty men who smote the giants in the days of yore. Northward lay the entrance to the kingdom of darkness under the earth. The portal lies behind a veil of air mixed with water. It is covered with a mantle of cloudy thickness, which eyes can scarce see through. The floor is of water, not too deep that the dismal stony bottom cannot be seen, hence men require a boat. Both sides of the entrance are flanked with giant blocks of stone from which rise huge pillars set one against the other, so that there is no space between them. The whole is overset with an immense rock greater than any cut by mortal hands, and it is shaped like the rump of a man. It is in a cold region of long darkness, where the calf of gold shows his displeasure. Now to the west of Egypt all is barren and sandy, except to the north which is the habitation of wild men who dwell in holes within the ground. Out of the land of God to the east came Osira, who was one filled with the Spirit of God, the first viceregents of God on earth, truly a God who walked among men, a true Son of God. He learned by communicating with the heart of God what lesser beings can hope to learn only by long contemplation of the sacred writings. Yet, he said, not all can hope to see. It is not a thing granted to men. But even he who only hears and has faith in his heart, who stretches himself out to do good, who conforms with the teachings, who was one with us, he also shall attain to the glory of an awakened spirit. He too shall share the joyful heritage of a righteous man. I, who have journeyed to the full distance to the fount of fire, lit a torch there and turned back to meet you with the comforting light of its flame. Hence, there is no need for you to journey the full length of the long, weary road to see truth. In the book of the bearers of light is written, God speaks with Osiris. Have you measured my words in silent communion with mine own self? Has the darkness of earth's delusions been dispelled by your own inner light? And Osiris says, By the grace of the communication granted me, I have seen the light of truth, and all the delusions of darkness have gone. My doubts are now no more. My faith confirmed. It is firm. I am the steadfast one. I say in truth, your will be done. Osiris speaks to men. I heard these words of glory spoken within the silence and solitude of the great cavern, and they filled my soul with awe and wonder. By the working of a wondrous thing, I heard these words in the sacred silence. I knew the mystery of life. I will ever remember the things burnt into my soul. I came out. When I spoke with men, my tongue danced with exaltation. These things are written. Later, Osiris went up into the sacred high place and there learned the ordinances for the well-being of men. He was given the rules for safeguarding the sacred mysteries, and he was also shown the workings of the great law. When he came down, he chose the best of those about him and appointed the Council of Light, which numbered twenty-four. These are the words he spoke to them by the sea of death. These are things to be explained to none but to those with understanding and enlightenment. The path of the true way will be long and arduous, its trials and tribulations manifold and harsh. It is not a place for the faint-hearted, and the oily-tongued or double-tongued will not be found there. Yet it will never lack a pilgrim, for there will always be seekers of truth and fighters for goodness. Nevertheless, treat this not as a light thing. Weigh these words well, and do not belittle the perils of the road ahead. Take good heed of my warnings. The path of the true way is one beset with the sharp stones of suffering and sorrow. The mortal flesh shall be torn by the sharp thorns of pain and tribulation. 
Thus it will be well to choose those who aspire to journey the true way with great care and discretion. Never overlook the sacrifices that you may be called upon to make. These are words spoken by Osiris. In the book of the bearers of light is written, Osiris says to those about him, I am the first among light bearers. I am the one who instructed by the great God. I am the one with knowledge concerning the building of the first shrine of mysteries. I alone of those now upon earth hold the key to the sacred mysteries. I know the secret things that are past, of things that are and of things that are to be. The act of birth enwraps the soul of man in a mantle of unconsciousness. It imprisons the spirit in a state of slumber. His own true self is within him, but it is as one dead within a tomb. All the great spiritual powers lie latent, locked inside, even though the mortal abode be formed to perfection. The true way is the road to freedom. It is a process of awakening the spirit and the key to spiritual self-awareness. It unlocks the door and reveals the light. It banishes all doubts and grants an assurance of life everlasting. It is man discovering himself. Such is the true way. God says to Osiris, Behold the land before you. It is a chosen land for safeguarding the sacred mysteries. And out of its womb shall come the child of truth, which shall die and rise again to lead men in the struggle to glory. In the day of his rising, the earth will be distressed and unrecognized and even be despised and mocked. Yet in that day will be produced a salve to heal the scars of mankind. In that day, when men shall have forgotten the way of righteousness and turned from truth, the light will come unto them. These words were spoken by God. When Osiris came to Egypt, the people were unlearned and wild. They lived in huts and holes, seeking their food in the wilderness about them. He gathered them together and gave them laws to guide. He taught the growing and gathering of corn, the making of the waterways and channels, the building of habitations for the living and the dead. The gods of the people were dangerous gods to be feared, to be approached fearfully by none but those who were familiar with their ways. Those alone could interpret the signs and portents rarely granted in those days. Osira did not deny the people these gods, but he changed men as times changed trees. Even so has Osiris changed in the hearts of men, and he is as they have made him. Before the coming of Osiris, men and women dwelt apart, men going into women of their choice. But the women kept to the fires while men roamed about, though in those days they never defiled the land of another with their feet. Osiris drew them together and taught them the laws of marriage. But still, he let men and women dwell apart if they so willed though now no man lay with a woman, not his wife. Osiris taught the making of bread with gathered corn and sown corn. It was eaten at the floodwater feasts with salt and with honey. For Osiris knew the nature of salt, which is of the bodies of men, and the nature of honey, which is of heaven. Salt is found in bitter waters which wash far off shores in the land of the salt mountains. Men who have sailed far have seen great mountains covered with salt. They lie under the steadfast stars gleaming in a strange light. Honey comes airborne from heaven, to be gathered by the bee. Once the earth was veiled within an awesome cloud, and in those days honey fell as frost upon the ground, and it fed man and beast when the herbage withered. When Osiris had drawn the people together so that they dwelt peacefully in the land, they inquired of him whether he knew the likeliness of their gods, whom none among them had ever seen. Therefore he fashioned the likenesses of the gods for them. He built cities wherein to keep them and cultivated the land. He caused temples to be set up, and in these were placed the likenesses of the gods which Osiris equipped. The likenesses he made satisfied the people, so that their hearts were made glad. Then the gods entered into their bodies of wood and stone. Yet Osiris was sad. His heart was heavy for the people. He knew their nature and the ignorance of their ways. Therefore he assigned a protector to be the guardian of the people, one who knew truth, who was an enlightened one, who was greatest among the twice-born, one to be an ever-open channel to God so that a flood of spiritual power should inundate the land, spreading bounty and peace over its expanse. He assigns to them all the people in the land that they may prosper. Osiris placed the land in the hands of the appointed one with all the water within its bounds, all the herbage, the cattle of the pasture lands and beasts of the wild places, and all things that fly and crawl. 
This appointed one was the king, the pharaoh, the lights of God on earth, the physergent of God over men. Him, Osiris endowed with the essence of the spirit outflowing from God, the power that reaches towards divinity. He was the link, the bridge between God and man. He was the task to bring men the knowledge and awareness of divinity and to preserve the special spirituality with which he was endowed in a select portion of one race. By his authority alone, all places of worship should be built and kept, and their ceremonies controlled and performed. By his decree alone, all canals should be cut, all waterways opened, all lands marked out and all war hosts raised. Under him, all food should be gathered and stored, all men fed, and every burial permitted and performed. He would be the supreme channel of contact with God. He and all who came from out of his loins should be ladders of light. Osiris, it was who himself ordained that as their bodies were filled with vitalized spirit essence, they should be preserved, to keep such power bound to earth for its good. Such was Pharaoh, a god below gods, a man above men. He was bound by the decrees of olden times and must ever set truth over falsehood. He was the narrow channel between God and man, one whose task was to reveal God to men. The family of Pharaoh was in the first place chosen by the Council of Light. In those days a few families were selected and some chosen from them to be carefully bred, so that all the less desirable traits were excluded. Their aim and objective was to produce men and women perfect in goodness, the ultimate in perfection. These were the qualities in which they were trained to the highest degree. In duty and responsibility, obligation towards the people, in dignity, justice, and benevolence. They were a family, a race apart, trained wholly to govern in goodness. Every moment of their lives was to be devoted and dedicated to the elevation of mankind. They were taught to regard the people as their own children, to be guarded, guided, and inspired by the finest examples possible. The family affair was to reach out to the very summit of aspiration, to aim for the pinnacle of goodness and spirituality. While the common people labored under them, the whole life of royal families was to be devoted to service and goodness, to the preservation and administration of justice. Originally, this worked perfectly, but earthly conditions are finely balanced between the call of the divine and the demons of the flesh. Somewhere. Down through the ages, the dam of spirituality sprang a leak, and that which had hitherto been hoarded and guarded ebbed away. The divinity, the spirituality in the blood was diluted. It became weakened, and when goodness diminished, its opposite crept in. What has this glorious institution, the great Pharaoh, become today? He is no more than the clacking tongue of a bell, a hollow, empty shell, a vein in the wind. He is not the owner of his own time. His days belong to others and the hours of his nights are controlled. He follows a shallow, futile ceremonial. He performs empty, meaningless rituals. He eats according to instructions and bathes at the rising and setting of sun, not for his own pleasure, but because he must. Where is the glory in this? Oh, for what once was, oh, for the joyful days of the past. What has happened to the glorious spiritual inspiration? Where once there was a purpose, now there is foolishness. Where once there was a sacred being, now there is a puppet manipulated by puppets. Where once there was a divine insight, now there are dead precedents. All is gone, all is dust, all is woe. Now this Osira of whom I speak is even he whom the people of this land have made a god. For the twice born who have wisdom have let it be thus. Call him man or call him God. It is a matter of small importance, for the boundary between them is not impossible. Petty men will argue about the distinctions of words, but they would be better engaged in discovering the truth. Osiris was ever enshrined in the hearts of the common folk, who had believed in immortality from the beginning. It was not so much their ignorance that obscured the light of truth, but rather the structure erected by hypocrisy and pomp, by avarice and ambition. Down through the ages, this belief in immortality persisted over the official view, which held that 
no more than a few might hope for immortality, and that mainly ensuing from the efforts of others. In the days of the first pharaohs, it was different. Then, immortality was the reward of all people, though only collectively and under the leadership and guidance of the king. Nevertheless, the immortality of the common folk and the immortality of the twice-born were not alike. Osiris came not into a land of powerful kings and great cities, but into a land of ignorant and unenlightened men. He came with seven strangers from a far land far east of the Sea of Death, a land not as old as Egypt, but long since dead and forgotten. When Osiris came, he found two peoples of power on the river, the people of Ro and the people of Haru, and Haru was of the body of Atem. There had long been war between these two peoples, but Osiris pacified them and united them as one. Then he taught them the ways of peace and the ways of prosperity. When people began to build places to dwell in and to grow things, they were troubled by men who came out of the wilderness. These were a people ruled by women, and though the men were small in stature, the women who ruled over were tall and lean. Their only weapons were such as could be thrown from afar, but they had shields made of hide, woven in a manner which caused anything coming against them to become entangled. Such were the men who came out of the wilderness and the wild places there, strong men and hairy. The queen of these people was not as the other women, for she was good to look upon, besides being a great huntress. She was fairer than the other women, even more fair than the women of Egypt, who put all others to shame. Her name was Neth, and I know of no man who has knowledge of her father. Perhaps she was an undying one, who was always there, though I cannot believe there are any such things. Yet even in these days there is a race of men beyond the mountains whose span of life is thrice that of other men. I need not describe the manner in which Osiris went out to meet Neth and his bow, the first bow seen in the land of Egypt, won her in contest. This can be learned from the tales told to the people, which all contain within them a core of truth. I will not indulge in the recounting of such tales. They can be found in other places. The bow Osiris gave Neth as a pledge is the same as that upon which men will make oath and pledge their word. Osiris did not act at once to take Neth to wife, and this is little understood, but it was a thing that could not be done in those days. At first, she was adopted by him as a sister, according to the custom. Later, men called her Asita, she being the same whom men called Esetis in these days. This is a name of the same meaning, for in the tongue of the old river people the name became Ness. Later, this was changed to Nesit, which in the old tongue meant she who was Ness. Then it was ordained that Osiris should marry his sister, and Esetis gave birth to the man-child Horai. He is the same after whom the kings of Egypt, even in these days, take their title, for he was the first true pharaoh, though others may disagree. Men lacking understanding will say I write about mortals and not gods, and this is true as it is false. The truth is that there are no fixed regions of gods, spirits, and mortals separate one from the other. Neither are all these entirely separate and different forms of beings. There is no impenetrable boundary between mortals, spirits, and gods. Neither is it to be understood that mortals reach the status of gods entirely by their own efforts. Gods are chosen by the people and raised to godhood by the people for the benefit of the people. If they choose wisely, they are blessed. But if they choose unwisely, then whatever befalls is upon their own heads. As the people conceive their gods, so will they be. This is something hardly understood in these days. The worship of such gods is of itself neither right nor wrong, for this depends entirely upon its effect and objective. If it serves the purpose of good, if it is to be the spiritual benefit of man, it guides in the right direction. If it does not, or if it be sterile or purposeless, then it is at best a misleading phantom. In its worst aspect, it is an instrument of evil. When a man ceases to believe in his God, the fault is not wholly with either. Each is at fault, and each has equally failed the other. The man no longer serves the God, as the God no longer serves the man. Neither gains, and both lose. A man without a God is neither a free man nor a whole being. His life is incomplete. He lacks something vital to his experience. 
When, from some cause, a god loses worshippers, he is no longer wholly a god, he becomes a god without ties, a wild god or wandering spirit retaining some of his powers, but none of his rank. Such, then, is the nature of gods, who are but beings originating as mortals, further advanced along the road towards godhood than other mortals, who chose them as representatives and leaders in the heavenly sphere. If you would live with truth, never confuse gods with God, for gods are but a step upward on the stairway from man to God. There is still one true temple of Esetis, but it is unknown to men in these days, though many others hypocritically declare their allegiance. The true temple itself is hidden from behind a false facade for protection. It is still dedicated to the ennoblement of men. It still upholds the virginity of its maidens and dedicate them to modesty and innocence. It is still a bright light in the gathering darkness. It still remains the flame of spirituality which, in days to come, will light the fire, which consumes evil and purges men of wickedness. In these days, the priesthood is corrupt and temples are places of evil where wickednesses are made more wicked by being condoned in the name of sanctity. Asitis left her people, and Cetus, her brother, ruled the people of the Sand Barons, later gaining power over many of the people of the river. He was one who was great among men. He led them in the ways of men for the easy ways along the wide road beloved by the multitude and followed so unthinkingly. There is no point in retelling here the accounts of the deeds of Osira and Cetus, nor of how Osira was betrayed by his blood brother, from whom he did not expect treachery and slain at Nadit and Tawara. This was after he and those with him had been lured there and enclosed in battle. Though there had been much shedding of blood, Osiris still believed the best of men, but he was deceived. His body was dismembered and scattered so that none should worship at his shrine. But this only spread goodness throughout the land. When his body was united, his spirit rose in greatness above all spirits. Cetius was later slain by Horai and now awaits men in the dawn halls where he bids them sit patiently, passive and at rest. Horai too awaits men there, but he says, Arise, O glorious one, move and be active, for you are reborn. Horai was the staff of his father, but he could not bring the people to walk in the way of light. Therefore the light was withdrawn from them. He ever exhorted the people to change their ways, but they stopped their ears to his voice. His words were launched vainly on air. In the Book of the Bearers of Light, it is written of his efforts. Horai brought lasting peace to the lands of water and sand and to their peoples. He gave long life and prosperity. The bounty of the waters was theirs, but still they gave no heed to his words of enlightenment. They declined the call to spiritual austerity and discipline. Thus it came about that he brought before him the council of twenty-four and said, Go, speed on your way. Send men through the length of the land ever unto the three peoples, and warn them lest they bring down the wrath of the great Lord, he who was the eye of the dawning day, down upon their heads. Say unto them, Forsake the paths of evil, turn aside from the byways of wickedness, and cast down the shrines of false gods, who have misled you. Let their names be utterly obliterated from your hearts and cut out the spaces where they were engraved. If you stop your ears to my words, so these things be not done, then the wrath of the great God shall surely come down upon you and do punishment meted out by the waters. Thus spoke Horai, but his words were as good seed falling upon unwatered ground. Instead of plants, all manner of weeds sprang up to smother the tender shoots of the good seed, even before they rose up into the sunlight. Then he cried out to the enlightening God, O oh great God, I have always failed miserably in my task, and the people will walk perversely in the ways of wickedness. Their feet incline away from truth. Men have taken to every manner of wrongdoing, and their lusts go unrestrained. The cities are stepped in iniquity. They are places where men practice every kind of abomination. Instead of the abode of glory, the bodies of men have become a lurking place for every kind of evil. Oh my God, where have I failed? What can I say to you? What can I do? Grant me an ear of understanding, God. The Spirit of God responded to the cry of Hori in this manner. My son, 
Take not unto yourself the blame for the iniquity of these perverse people. Leave them to steep in their brew of wickedness which they have prepared for themselves, for there is a point beyond which my administrators are not required to go. Leave the wicked, and gather the select few unto yourself, for thus it shall ever be. Many will cry at the gates, but few shall enter. Abandon the misled to their false shrines, for the day will dawn when all these shall be dust borne away on wind. Even then the words of truth shall remain unto men. Go cherish the few and abandon the many. Hide the sacred mysteries in places where they shall be least sought. Choose well those who are one thought with you. A roof is better supported upon a few sound pillars than on many unstable ones. Yet the day is not far distant when men shall give ear to the words of wisdom, for if their ears are stopped they are lost. Those from whom you incline your head shall be removed from out of your sights, and they shall become lost in restless spirits. To you is given command of men, as he who fathered you is given command of spirits. All things that God commanded, or I did. And when at last he lay in the arms of the great bride, he knew that the foundation for the temple of truth was well and truly laid. And the book of the bearers of light is the supplication of Horai. O ageless God of aging things, O constant one amid inconsistency, no mere words of mine can hope to make known the gratitude welling up as an everlasting spring within my heart. In the midst of my desolation you brought me comfort. Into the darkness of my spirit you came as a comforting light. You led me forth when the wilderness shut me, and guided my feet when they became entangled in the chaos of waters. When my enemies descended upon the people to devour them, you scattered the foe like frightened asses fleeing before a lion. You have magnified me in the eyes of the faithful. I am made great even among the chosen people. My people you have made your people. You have favored us among all others, and had granted us a knowledge of your laws, that our way may not be undirected. You have taught us the performance of your statutes, that we might conform to your will. You have revealed to us the boundaries between light and darkness, between wisdom and grace, between the spirits and the mortal, between the sacred and the profane. You have set the faithful apart from all other people, and revealed unto us our duties and obligations. O God, Grant that the days allotted to us be days of peace and plenty. Show us yet more clearly the path of purity, that we fall not into the abyss of iniquity. In the veil of temptation let us not stray from the path of righteousness, and in the wilderness of wickedness let us not become lost. Favor us with wisdom and skill, for if there be anything holy of earth within the grasp of man that is truly desirable, is it not skill and knowledge? Of all things outside of heaven these are most praiseworthy. Though these be not of the Spirit, grant them to us, O God, for you are the fount of all knowledge. When we stray, as oft men do, let not the force that brings us back onto the path afflict us too much. We acknowledge our weaknesses with humility and our failings with repentance. When we wander, bring us back into the lights of your laws, that we may not be swallowed up in the darkness of ignorance. Forgive us our deeds of wickedness, pardon our transgressions, grant us reprieve from the effects of our wrongdoing. Give us whatever this may entail, that which will benefit us the most spiritually. Teach us, O God, to accept with resignation the wondrous workings of your will. Everlasting glory is with you. Sanctity is yours. Therefore we honor you with submission and service. We, your servants, acknowledge our obligations. We, your children, declare our love and loyalty. Horai died after the manner known and was buried in glory. There is no recounting of his deeds. Then there was peace throughout all the lands beside the Nile, and contentment reigned everywhere. Many great kings lived and ruled, and gradually the light of truth was again revealed unto men. It never fails to appear when men are deserving. Is this not sufficient indication of the forbearance of God? Chapter 34 A Next Scroll 2 This is written on a scroll found in the temple of Athorahara, the possession of Nati, a free woman of Pibes. Then there was peace throughout the land, and the two priesthoods dwelt together in tolerance. But behold, the day came when the hearts of men turned again to strife. 
Then the land was rent in twain, and the forces of the red reed crown strove against those of the white lily crown. Once again the dark mists of ignorance descended to envelop the hearts of men, and again the sacred shrines of truth were closed, and those who served truth withdrew behind the veil and were hidden from the eyes of those who would profane her. Again the sacred shrines of truth were closed, and those who served truth withdrew behind the veil and were hidden from the eyes of those who would profane her. The whole land was torn apart, from upstream to downstream. From the right hands to the left of Egypt there was strife. Then came one who was mighty among men, one who also knew truth and saw the wickedness of people. He was a declared one, for unless a man be such, he has no value among the chosen. He carried the sword among the striving peoples, and in his day the might of Mansethrope prevailed. The spirit of Horai, who took the land from Nama and of Minas, who united it, were with him. Then the lands of the north and the lands of the south were delivered into the hands of the king, and they became one. They were united, though they remained two. They were even as they had been before. Yet the multitude declared themselves for the ways of the multitude, and the light of truth remained obscured behind the dusts raised by their dancing feet. Though peace and plenty reigned throughout the land, righteousness did not attend the throne of later kings. They ruled as kings, but the days of their rule were dark days of sorrow for the followers of truth, for they became few and feeble indeed. They were lost in the land. Again, as in other days, the high servant of the sacred mysteries, who held the key, commanded that the sacred shrines be closed. This was so that any knowledge of the great secrets should not pass into possession of the unworthy multitude, which would profane them. Again, as has happened many times, the great light was removed from the midst of men. Then came the year of the great floodwaters, though some say it was before these days, when the salt seas rose upon the east and covered the land. Men were warned beforehand by the shortening of the days of the years, and the five days now added to the days of the year are days of sorrow for the alteration of things. It is said that seven days before the coming of the waters, the sun appeared in a different quarter. But this is not easy to believe, as the sun remains ever constant. The sailors of the king certainly departed for strange places during the chaos of waters. Perhaps this was because the sun had left his steady course. Kings came and departed to their place. They ministered unto the people according to the light revealed unto them. Most knew only the veiled truth, but in olden times they were better kings than in later days. There were long generations of men who walked with wisdom, and among them was the generation of the first great master, he who established the brotherhood of the chosen ones of light. In those days men learned the rites for coming forth by day, but the inner wisdom was not declared before them. Yet there were days of wisdom, skill, knowledge, but the knowledge of the spirit still languished, and the secret secrets remained hidden. In fact, never have they been revealed to the multitude of men, for never has the multitude of men been worthy. Now men say that all the wisdom of those so wise availed them nothing. Have they not long gone down into dust? Have they not departed to the land of no return? to the place that may or may not be. Where is their memorial? Where their shrines? Can even their tombs be seen? They say amongst themselves, as it will ever be said when men are deluded by their mortality, the life of man is short and uncertain, the one certainty in life being the approach of death. What awaits hereafter no man can tell, for no man is known to have returned from out of his tomb. We are all children of accident and mischance, and in a short generation shall be as though we had never been. Our bodies shall harden and be ground to dust, and the fire of our hearts shall burn itself out and turn to ashes. Our shade will hover for its day, and then be wafted away on the wind, and as the waters come and go, our names will pass from the memories of men forever. The works of men shall pass away like the shadow of a cloud upon the sand, and his life will vanish like the dew of morning that disappears in the heat of the rising sun. What are the days of man but the shadow of a shadow? And he passes away to an end from which there is no returning. He goes throughout a door which is immediately shut, and there is no way back. They say, 
come, therefore, and let us be joyful. Let us cast aside the long face of learning and the melancholy face of discipline. Let us enjoy the good things of life, which are all about us. Let us take no thought for an uncertain future. Where is the profit in that? Let us eat and drink to fullness. Let us grant our bodies all means of satisfaction. Let no means of pleasure and enjoyment pass us by. But whatever comes our way, let us make the best of our lot in life. Let us turn our backs on all doctrines of spirit, for they deny us much. Let us give full rein to our senses and feelings and let them serve the ends of pleasure. We will take no heed of the poor and helpless, for where is the benefit in this? What have we to fear from them, we who are strong? Let the widow weep alone, for why should her sorrow disturb us? Let us avoid the encumbrances of the aged and maimed. Let us use our strength to obtain all that we need for our own well-being. Let our strength provide the rule and establish the right. Let strength and power, riches and position alone be valued, and let the weak and the feeble survive as they may. Perhaps in our generosity we will spare them a few crumbs or bestow upon them the things we do not need. Let us take no more of their criticism and their objections. Have they more swords than we have? Are we to be overawed by a God whom they cannot produce? Such are the things spoken by men today, and if they declare them not openly, they hide them in their hearts. This is their law, their way of life. Be the law declared before men or hidden in shame. The life of their years cannot answer them, for the answer lies hidden in the life of ages. Gold is not gathered by the wayside. Yet the wisdom of our fathers did avail them. Whatever is said in the streets today, they have indeed left a memorial worthy of reverence, and they are not without shrines. The wise words they spoke have not gone down to be eaten by dust, nor have they been carried away on the wings of the wind. As for the enlightened ones, who passed among the people and strengthened them since the days when the gods walked with men, their names have become lasting even though they themselves have gone. They did not make themselves tombs of stone and memorials of metal, nor did they desire them. Some were unable even to leave an heir alive. Nevertheless, they made heirs for themselves among those who study their writings, and they have left treasures of wisdom for their estates. Their memorials are the words which came from their mouths and remain still alive on the tongues of men. Books of wisdom are the heritage they have landed on, and they forged the frail reed into a mighty weapon. Where are their like today? Men sneer at the achievements of the past, at the greatness that has gone, but are these not achievements and greatness they cannot themselves hope to emulate? If men have climbed high today, did they themselves build the stairway, or was it erected by the labors of those long gone? Was not the first step laid down in ages long past? Is the first step of least importance? Is the foundation any weaker than the superstructure, even the superstructure of today? Yes, the great men of wide wisdom have gone, they are forgotten. Yet through the greatness of their works they are honored and their spirit moves among us still. The chords they struck will echo within our hearts. Where today are the rulers and princes this land once knew? Where are the similar officials to be found? Today bribery creeps behind the seats of judgment, corruption lurks on the right hand and perjury sneaks around to the left. What of the flow of fine words that accompany a magistrate to the seat of his appointment? What have these noble utterances become but a more meaningless babble? Yet are they not a glorious thing capable of moving the hearts of men with their inspiring messages of hope and the ultimate attainment of justice? Let them be recorded for all time. He who is peer of hands comes forth. He utters the words that have come from the temple of Mant. Those with panther skins bear the symbols of authority. These words are spoken. You are the ever faithful servant of truth, the humble one who begs for her guidance. You are not the Lord of justice, but one who ever seeks it with humility and perseverance, praying it will bless your decisions. You are henceforth one whose words are heavy with authority, whose eyes see without prejudice and whose ears are closed to intolerance. Your thoughts are clear and clean, your heart pure. It is free of malice and to you a vindictive verdict will be an abomination. The mantle of wisdom rests on your shoulders and the robe of learning is your garment. Your tongue is the servant of truth and the sword of justice. Your mouth is the shrine of honor and the cave of retribution. 
Your heart is the temple of purity and the storehouse of wise judgments from the past. Justice will ever be your guiding light and rule. It will lead you even to the appointed place before the mother of the king. Wherever you go, uprightness will take command. You will wield the sword of justice without fear. You will bear it before the sight of all men. You will carry it to the rich and powerful, to the poor and lowly without discrimination. You will strike down all merchants of falsehood, all fork-tongued deceivers, all who bear false witness or break the statues of the king. Let wickedness perish in the sands. Justice is not a thing less than the measure, but that which fills it to overflowing. It exceeds the bounds of mortal requirements. It endures everlastingly and is not denied one who is entombed. It passes over with the spirit to bear witness. It is the great brightener. It is not a thing bought and sold. Justice cannot be bartered. Be ever above price. One worthy of the greatness you reflect on earth. One ever above mundane things. Be not as the ferryman who demands payment before his task is fulfilled, who bears upon the water the man who makes payment and no other. Be as the sun whose brightness seeks out every nook and cranny and pours light into their hidden gloom. Be one who shines among men to lighten their days. Spread uprightness and honesty across the two lands as the sunshine spreads brightness and warmth. Cover the land with goodness as the rising waters cover it with fertility. Fill the land with strength, as the north wind fills it with contentment. Guard your heart as a father guards his daughter, as a mother guards her baby, for it is the stronghold of integrity. Be vigilant concerning every deed, for the eyes of men are ever upon you. The life you live is not yours alone. You are the image which men will imitate, and you are before every eye. The blowing wind will open its ear at your windows and spread wide its report. The flowing waters beside your door will uncover their eyes and carry what they behold through the land. Your position makes you a supporting pillar of the government. If the pillars be rotten, the roof crashes. Your responsibilities will beset your life with care. The road you journey is stony and encompassed with pitfalls and thorns, and the cup you drink will be more often bitter than sweet. And though you will judge all men impartially, do not in your diligence incline towards the poor and unprotected because they are such. Your duty is to see that all things are done according to the statutes of the king and the manner in which they have been done previously. You are not wise enough to set aside the wisdom of the past. Every man must be dealt with as though he stood before you naked and unknown. Let he who is permitted entry into your courtyard be as he who was left standing outside the gate, and your decisions must be given with indifference as to whether they serve him well or ill. Such were the words uttered at the installation of an official empowered to give judgment. In other days, such words were honored and adhered to, yet now they are ignored. Now justice lies buried in a tomb of past precedents, swathed in mummy bandages of formality. It consists of the impartial, heartless administration of the recorded statutes, rather than the redress of injustice. Where has the glory gone? All is lifeless, all is dead. The hands that guide are dead, the hands that rule, dead. Men may ask, in days yet to dawn, how it came about that the flame of glory died in Egypt, how her grandeur passed away into dust. How, when man had climbed so high, he could climb no longer. But there is no simple cause. The seeds of degeneration lie dormant in every nation, in every man. As the man, so the nation. These seeds are as weeds, which spring up when the cultivated soil is neglected, when it is tended with indifference. The road to greatness is, for nations as for each man, a hard and stony one. Greatness is a gift requiring constant effort to retain. When men decline the effort, greatness departs. Greatness and glory will abide only in the habitations of the worthy. They depart when no longer treated as honored guests. What are justice and truth today? They are no more than words mumbled by the lips. But once, 
they were an inextinguishable flame burning within the hearts of men. What is left of honor when men cease to regard it as more than an empty symbol? It is like the lyre in the hands of a man with blistered fingers, or as the flute played by one with scabby lips. The instruments remain, but where are the musicians? Without the musicians, where are the melodies? In the land of Egypt, periods of righteousness have come and gone like ripples passing over a quiet pond. There have been periods of material greatness, ripples of longer duration, but they have not been at one with the ripples of righteousness. Throughout all times, there have been two visible forms of worship, with their many variations, that of the highborn and that of the people. Now, they have been blended for many generations. The worship of the high God and the knowledge of the sacred mysteries, kept hidden by the enlightened ones and the twice-born, were behind both and veiled within them. Where else could these things be better concealed? The house of the hidden places was established fifty generations before the reign of the Mighty One, who was Pharaoh, and in those days the High God was known to men and was revealed even after. But twenty generations before the evil Amulika descended like locusts upon the land, there was strife most grievous. This is set forth in the scroll belonging to Kabitkant, son of Nemirath, copied from an old writing, copied from another which was the property of a temple in Pinhamur. It says, The twin powers drawn down entwined about themselves and grew ever stronger. Even as waters are dammed to be drawn upon, so was the united power built up into a reserve of force. A storehouse of strange energy was prepared. The thoughts of Set Shrar ever churned about within himself. And behold, the day came when he believed the secret key to be his the key that would open into the inner chamber of sacred mysteries. Yet he made the mistake of all such men down through the ages, unaware that his very unworthiness forbade his admittance into the inner mysteries. That though he could deceive himself and others, he could not deceive the inner guardians. It is true that some who were admitted to the outer chamber were indiscreet and spoke carelessly before the ears of unadmitted men. It is ever thus when goodness is not persecuted, for goodness blooms best in the barren soil of intolerance and injustice. Anyway, in this manner the seeds of strife and suffering were sown. Then Setsra conceived a plan, whereby the multitude would be admitted to participate in the sacred mysteries hitherto kept exclusive for the worthy ones among men. He gathered together a following of his own from among the people and promised, in return for their devotion, that the knowledge of sacred things Hetherto kept from them should now become available. He called those who followed him the enlightened ones of the gods. Naturally, such folly could have but one outcome, for the experience of ages has shown that sacred things cannot be revealed to the profane. Not only would the things revealed be disdained by the ignorant, as swine would trample pearls underfoot to gobble up a handful of filth, but the multitude in its sinfulness would destroy the delicate beauty of the hidden mysteries, like goats devouring hangings of artistically patterned loveliness, they would decide that the gross things to which they were accustomed were more satisfying. The new teachings grew in strength and spread throughout the whole land. They went from city to city, gaining followers in every one. The multitude is ever powerful. Therefore, he who controls it by whatever means is himself powerful. Thus it came about that eventually Set Tra was able to challenge the authority of the twice-born. This authority was always vulnerable as it sought to rule by wisdom and goodness rather than by power and subtlety. Only when wisdom and goodness rule the wise and good can such rule succeed. Such time may never come. Though the followers of Setra could not discover the higher secrets, they learned the lower ones, and these were twisted to their own ends. Thus was developed the worship of dark spirits, a vile and poisonous thing that perverted the thoughts of the people and led them away from the path of spirituality. They strayed into all manner of strange and corrupting byways. Then their hearts hardened by earthly sordidness. They rose up, clamoring for the blood of the righteous ones. Now Setra gained the ear of the king, 
and pouring in his flood of venom wrapped up in fine speech, he overwhelmed the heart of his majesty. None in the land had a tongue more subtle than that of Setra. Then, new shrines were set up in the temples, new forms of worship appeared, pandering to the weaknesses of men. The hidden places of the enlightened ones were profaned with wickedness, and the secret chambers of the twice-born were polluted with vile rites. Therefore the enlightened ones and the twice-born withdrew from the eyes and the knowledge of men. Their day was not yet to dawn, but none among them would ever have thought that never in Egypt would that day be. Yet dawn it will, even though it be in some strange land where the ways of men are different and in some manner inconceivable to men of our times, will they be people such as we? O oh, my land, having known you, how strange all others appear. Away from you, I will be as a fish cast up onto dry land. In the temples dedicated to many different gods, the forms of worship were subtly changed to serve another end. The servants of the Dark Ones were able to display wonders before the multitude, but these wonders were works of deceit. They revealed mysteries, but the mysteries were not the most sacred ones. These were never known by any likely to betray them. The thoughts of the people were poisoned. All manner of rites aimed at satisfying carnal cravings were introduced. Simple, satisfying answers were given to content the hearts of people, and all manner of rewards were promised. For payment made, men were promised forgiveness of even the most grievous wickedness. It is well that the ears of the dumb gods were unhearing, or they would have been deafened by the clamor of pleas for petty things. The servants of the Dark Ones left not even the dead to rest in peace, but sought to satisfy the living with words from beyond the tomb. Even the blood of men was offered in dark places, while in others of greater evil men, yes, and even children, were tormented to give pleasure. Such is the nature of men when the scales weighed down against righteousness. The hosts of the Dark Ones were well skilled in battle, and they drove out all those who stood against them. The forces of righteousness were scattered, the sacred shrines which stood before the veil of truth were spoiled. The ornaments of beauty and the sacred vessels were taken away to be profaned by sin-soiled hands. The Enlightened Ones and the Twice-Born were hunted down like beasts of the chase, they were slain and buried in the ground like dogs. Their resting places remain unmarked and unattended. The leader of the light cried out, O great God, what can I do? How shall your servants be saved? What shall be done unto those who have profaned your sacred shrines? What can I do to turn back the rising waters of iniquity and temper the wild winds of wickedness? How can the black cloud of ignorance be lifted? What shall be the just reward of those who have slain the faithful? The voice coming forth by the Spirit of God said, Concern yourself not with those who have persecuted you. Leave them to follow the path of their own choice. Vengeance is with me. I will measure without stint. Justice never sleeps and never forgets. The reward of the wicked awaits them. In the hall of no hiding place, justice will speak the final word. The leader of light and those with him fled into the land beyond Shari and built there the temple in the rock, which stands against Shina. In this land the forces of the Dark Ones were cast back, yet still some among the faithful beseeched their God to save them. Thus it has ever been, this is the nature of man, that in his hour of distress he cries out to God in bitterness of heart, and they who deserted God in better times expect him to turn towards them. Yet such is the nature of God, that this he would do, were it to the good of men, which it is but rarely. In the land of Egypt, the great shrines were deserted by the enlightened ones and abandoned by truth. They became places of darkness. They were as lamps without flame, as fields without crops, as wells without water. The generation of those days passed down into dust. Their spirit arose in the everlasting halls to stand before the inescapable one. Then, in the generation of Pahopha, the name of Osiris began to be known in the land, and for twelve generations it grew in greatness. The Apuru departed, 
the Ameluka, came. Ten generations entered into their eternal habitations, and Tathomasis came to make the name of Egypt known throughout all the land. He too could no more stay the hand of decay than could the meanest slave. Then in his day, Nabihatan came to rule in the land of Egypt. While he was still a child and yet at nurse, the young woman who tended him at night took a man in lust without attending to her purification. Therefore, when she came back nigh into the sleeping prince, she broke the protective wall about his sleeping place. Thus a formless one came up from out of its lair beside the flaming lake and entered the bedchamber. Because the young woman was as she was, it could not be seen by her. It was a formless, flowing thing that spread itself out in darkness to slink across the floor. Its fluted snout was in the midst of a face twisted backwards, like all its kind. It raised an awful mouth up to kiss the sleeping child, and the child was stricken. In the morning, the child's body was consumed with an inner fire lit the night before, and the breath of life struggled against the occupying demon to enter the body. In those days, there lived a great physician named, and he drew out the demon with things of power, and doused the fire with impregnated water. None but the greatest of physicians could have released a tongue from the grip of the demon, Yet this was done by Mahu. Perhaps it is well to give a fuller account of this pharaoh, not as a matter of history, for this I am not competent to record, but to show what can happen when those unqualified seek to reveal the light, also the perils that can attend such folly. Nabihatan rose to rule while still very young, and though it is said that he died in the grip of a demon with blood welling up from within his mouth, the other version, that he died as a tombless wanderer, seems more probable, for it is so written on the tablets of Ammon. In the days of his father, the enlightened ones had regained strength in the land of Egypt, though there remained a hidden force, and all their deeds were secret. Nevertheless, they were not unknown to the priesthoods, which were then strong, though they were regarded with much disfavor. In those days, the charges made against the enlightened ones were that they stirred up the lowly against the powerful, that they tried to turn the land over to change that which had ever been. Therefore, those who knew the great God dwelt in seclusion and hiding. Their names were unknown, their faces unseen. The mother of Nabihatan was Toi, one of the chosen ones. In those days, there were still four ranks of faithful, the twice-born, the enlightened ones, the chosen ones, and the dwellers in light. Among the dwellers in light, there were seekers in light and laborers in light. Even then as now, the wife of Pharaoh, though of high blood, was no more than half Egyptian. Her ways were strange. While he had still not come to manhood, the mother of Pharaoh taught him the ways of light. She revealed many of its secrets, probably without proper authority, though this cannot be known. However, though the leader of light in Egypt was never far removed from the Pharaoh, only during the days in the far distant past were the kings numbered among the enlightened. Only in the days of true greatness, days long gone down into dust, days long forgotten in the land, yet ever we have hoped. The kings bred for goodness, the families reared to conserve spirituality, were swayed between two influences, that of the spiritually inspired ones and that of the earthly oriented ones. Earthly conditions being what they are and the purpose of earth being what it is, it was too early in the generations of men to expect goodness to triumph. It is in this that the forces of good are confounded. They anticipate too easy a victory. Yet though the pestle grinds slowly, it grinds with every blow. It was the wife of Pharaoh who influenced him to disclose some of the mysteries, which, since the time was just mentioned, had been completely withdrawn and very carefully hidden. Thus, though the forces of evil had prevailed in the land, they had not uncovered the inner shrine of the sacred mysteries. Such mysteries as they had discovered proved of little value to them, and were soon so distorted and perverted as to be useless. The great secret of how to penetrate the barrier between the two spheres of mortal and spirit was still completely secured. If nothing else, its very dangers would have safeguarded it. Actually, Though it is said that secret mysteries were disclosed, this did not happen. All that did happen was that Pharaoh used the knowledge he had to try and give the people a greater insight into the way of light, the true way. 
As is ever done, he veiled the all-consuming brilliance of truth, leaving just a sufficient glimmer to light the way, to become a beacon. Navihatan himself saw the truth but dimly, for though he tried, he failed to meet the tests of an enlightened one. Perhaps it was this that inclined him away from the faithful. How many, when they discover what the knowledge of truth entails, falter on the path? The Pharaoh, the Great One of Egypt, was ill-formed in body. He was subject to uncontrolled trances, unproductive of any vision. This was because at such times his spirit would withdraw, thus permitting a dark one to enter its seat. He would fall down upon the ground, and the demon spoon would issue from his mouth. Therefore at such times he had to be kept from the eyes of the people, lest they were seized with fear of demons devastating the land and sapping its fertility. Yet not everything could be kept hidden from the people, for the pharaoh lived as the fish within the garden pool. Therefore the people learned of his grievous wickedness and turned from him. Nevertheless, it was not as bad as the marketplace chatter stated. This pharaoh had many powerful opponents in high places. The tales are much exaggerated. Some not knowing the inside of the pot declared him to be the very light of goodness. Perhaps the truth is that in him good and evil swung out to the extremes of the balances. Yet weighed one against the other, evil bore down no more in him than in the case of those with much less evil, and the scales and much less good to counterbalance it. The son of Nabihatan, one conceived in wickedness, was slain in battle. Therefore the younger son, one also born of the union of evil, became king in Egypt in his day. While yet young, he became a follower of the new rites of mystery, which his father had set up in imitation of the mysteries of the hidden god. These new rites themselves hidden within a new form of worship set up by Nibihatan. Of themselves, these were not things of wickedness, but they inclined too far towards ritual which was futile and ceremonial that was purposeless. Though the new mysteries served to spiritualize and could awaken the spirit, they went just so far and could go no further. They led to a dead end. They went as far as the grim threshold, but could not lead beyond it. As far as the faithful were concerned, the setting up of a new form of worship made little difference to their position in the land, but they did not attempt to draw the young prince wholly within their fold. Because of this manner, the king, his father, was precluded from this. I will go back to when the father of Nibihaten, a man of great valor, much beloved by the people, became feeble through a wound that troubled him in his old age. It was then that his queen, the noble Tawi, priestess of the faithful, urged him to send for the young prince Nabihaten, though he was not then so called, to become his staff and take up some of the burden. In this manner it was hoped to secure the throne of Egypt once more for one of the faithful, an end towards which the faithful had long labored. Undoubtedly, the enlightened ones and the chosen ones from among the faithful played some part in the introduction of the new form of worship. But unfortunately, they were not equal to the opportunities of the times. This is an instance when too much concern with spirituality, too little interest and involvement in mortal affairs can prove a fatal handicap. The lesson to be learned from this, the whole purpose of its telling, is that at all times, a good balance must be maintained between spirituality and earthly existence. However great the spiritual goal ahead, nevertheless at present our feet are firmly bound to earth. Whatever the eyes behold, it must not blind men to the pitfalls before their feet. To say, as many have, that the new form of worship clashed with the old established worship of Amon is true in part only. The hopes of the faithful were nurtured in both and could not have been a reconciling force, weak in power and numbers, though it might have been seen. Superficially, and among the mass of lesser priests and followers in the two beliefs, there was antagonism and strife. While the flame of Aton waned, the sun of the new form of worship rose. But it was the popularity of Queen Tawi among the people, her wisdom and insight, that enabled the young prince to maintain his place at the king's right hand and share the royal symbols, despite hostility by the priests of Amman. He had dutifully followed the path of the true way, all would have been well. Perhaps, and this seems more likely, he did not quite understand it. 
Probably his intentions were good, but good intent is not sufficient. Good intent is nullified by lack of wisdom and lack of knowledge, and confounded unless supported by example and deeds. It is not sufficient for a man to proclaim a way of life for others unless he lives according to its principles himself. Too often have men tried to direct others along a path they are reluctant to tread themselves. This is not the least of hypocrisies. When his father died, the young king Nabihatan ruled in equality with his mother. They shared the royal seat and symbols, but he acted in a manner unbefitting of a son. He inclined away from the high-born ladies of royal blood. His interests were not those of a pharaoh, and this caused the hearts of those who opposed him to rise in hope. It also isolated him from the faithful, who would have been his most ardent supporters, though their loyalty remained with the queen. When their pharaoh showed no inclination to marry, and strange rumors were heard about him in the streets and marketplaces, the people became disturbed and uneasy. Also the high-born ones about him, the court officials, the princes and the governors of the land, were perturbed at his interest in the mistress of songstresses at the temple of Amon in victory. The faithful were perturbed also, for within this temple was one of their secret shrines. This could have been the turning point for the faithful in Egypt, had the king been other than he was, for there were several princesses of the royal blood numbered among them. As it was, the faithful were antagonized. The new form of worship introduced by this pharaoh was simple enough. Outwardly, it had all the symbols and ceremonial beloved by the people, with sufficient substance in it to attract the spiritually inclined. It could have formed a fitting gateway to the path of the virtue way, another light guiding men along the road to the embarkation port for truth. Behind the symbols and ceremonial, the pharaoh worshipped the spirit behind the sun, the spirit of life and life as a direct, fully conscious member outflowing from the great God behind all. The king, however, cut him off in the midst of his instruction, perceived the road but dimly. There is little doubt of his genuine desire to bring the true light to the people, but he was not wise enough to know. Firstly, that one who brings light must be one in whom light burns brightly, and secondly, that the multitude cannot be exposed to its unveiled brightness with impunity. The king, severed from his weaknesses, could not have been a truly great ruler, a steady light before the eyes of men, the guide to a new age for the people of the land. But he was one who cast heavily on both arms of the balances. Nabi Hatsun knew enough of the secret mysteries to realize that he would need a new place of worship, uncontaminated by previous concentration of the Twin Powers, if he were to succeed in opening even the first door. Therefore he moved his court to a new city, within which was a temple outwardly dedicated to the new light, which he enshrined before the place of flame. It was a sanctum for those whom he called the Awakeners of the Spirit to Light. From this we get the expression, light within the light, behind the light, used even to this day. The priests of Amman were impoverished to pay for the new city. The king had a son by the Lady of Songstresses, one destined for greatness, though his greatness was not perceived by the eyes of men. When later his son was exiled to wander in strange places, his mother cast herself into the arms of Sebuk. But this is something, the telling of which has no place here. However, with the removal of the king's household to the new city, its power was diminished. The people under the two crowns became divided against themselves. The rulers became unsettled in their posts, and there were revolts in the colonies towards the east. It was a time of unease because of the dispersion of power. Now also, because of the most grievous wickedness of the pharaoh, all the protecting divinity of his blood, which, though diminished by the generations of willfulness, yet remained potent, was dissipated. Thus all the land suffered and was restless. Then it was that some of the faithful from the city of the old royal residence, not from the new one as told, contacted the eyes and the ears of the king, so that the pharaoh was counseled to take himself a wife. In this manner alone could the clamor of the people be stilled and their hearts be put at ease. It was then that the high priest at the temple of the visible light, by a cunning move, brought the young princess called Nefare, in our tongue, before Pharaoh. She was a temple maiden, daughter of a king, and one devoted to the great god in silence. 
Pharaoh took her to wife, but he showed her little affection, though she was not unbeautiful, even if with a beauty not of this land. Nevertheless, in the eyes of the people, the marriage appeared successful enough, though perhaps the outward display of affection was overdone. Still, the queen, being more frail than Egyptian women, could bear only daughters. There is another reason for this, but it cannot be gone into here with propriety. It is something between women. Things were not as they appeared, and the Pharaoh despised the king in her heart for his secret wickedness. I have mentioned the surviving son of the king, one born under the darkest cloud, the secret of whose illumined birth had been unrevealed, though it was known to a few. Some of these were antagonistic to the new form of worship proclaimed by the king, and they used this knowledge to their own advantage. I have also mentioned another son, one born to the Lady of Songstresses, and he was bound to a different destiny altogether. The son born to Pharaoh by the Lady of Songstresses was also born to high estate through her. I will not record his name, lest even now it be used with evil intent, for it is a name of power. I will not disclose his title, but just call him what he was, the master. When the master was born, Pharaoh was quite indifferent towards him, though through the nature of his blood he was not unexposed to danger. The account of how the child was stolen from the temple garden by the priests of Ammon, how it was rescued by a Syrian in the services of Nefare, disguised as a woman vendor of spices, and Celtis, a captain of craft, is known and need not be retold. However, though it is true that the child was carried away by a vessel, he was not taken to the lands of the Henbu. He was not brought up in the household of the captain of craft. The child was left at the temple of Anthor in Splendor, where sweet waters kissed the bitter and brought back to the city of the horizon at dawning. Later, both child and mother were taken into the royal household, for the two women had long been friends, even before Nefara became queen. Yet Pharaoh knew not that the man-child within the household of Nefara was his, for the tale had been put about the son of the Lady of Songstresses was dead. Thus, even in the shadow of the royal household, the master grew up to walk in the path of truth. Now as the years went down into dust, the land of Egypt crumbled and began to fall apart. Nefare, because she followed the pure light, could not dwell with Pharaoh while the life he led was an abomination against purity. She was an ever faithful one, though in her disgust she must have been tempted to be otherwise. The queen removed herself and her household in the fifteenth year of the reign of Nabihatan. It was then put about by those who licked the feet of Pharaoh that she was a fickle woman of wanton ways. They said she was an adulteress and called upon her beauty to bear witness against her. What they said was false. It is equally false that all beautiful women are fickle and wanton. True, such women may be subjected to greater temptations, but if they resist these, are they not so much the greater? Are they not so much more what a beautiful woman should be? The True Inspiration of Men Surely there can be no doubt that the fair was abnormal, for how could any but an abnormal one treat such a woman thus? Nefare sought refuge in Labados, where there was a secret shrine to the great god, and resigned herself to a great life of great virtue. With her went the master, then on the threshold of manhood, but his true mother did not go with them. With her went the master, then on the threshold of manhood, but his true mother did not go with them. Without the temple gates at Labados, beneath a sycamore tree, dwelt a three-eyed man, Hepoa, one who could foreknow the future who had the gift of far-seeing, but he was aged and infirm. One day the master chanced to pass that way, and he came upon Hippoa as some youths mocked him and cast sand upon his head. Then the heart of the master was filled with wrath, and taking up the staff of Hippoa which lay upon the ground, he laid it on the backs of the youths, and they were discomfited. When they had fled, he secured the old man, and returning into the city, brought forth food, so that Hippoa ate and was made content. Then the master sat at the feet of Hippoa and his words, for they were words of wisdom and truth. Hippoa was one who knew the mystery of the great God and the secrets of the hidden places, for he was one of the twice born. Thus the master became the old man's staff. Eventually the day came when the two journeyed to a secret place within the wilderness so that the master might approach the threshold. When Nefare left, 
Wickedness consumed good Nabihatan, and the chambers of his heart lay open and unprotected. And then a dark one entered into him and drove him out into the barren places of the wilderness. It is said, And Pharaoh fled through the wilderness, uttering horrible cries and howling as dogs howl, so that all men departed from him in fear. Thus it came about that Nabihatan came upon Hapoah and the master as they sat beneath the shade of a rock in the heat of the day, and the tongue of the king was blackened with the fire of the dark one that held him. Hippoa cooled the fire within the king and expelled the dark one, so that the king was made whole again. Then they went, the three of them, to the place where the fighting men of Pharaoh were encamped, the king riding upon an ass. When the king was again bedecked in his royal garments and girded with the symbols of power, he gave Hippoa a place of honor, and the master dwelt at the gates of Pharaoh. Within the city of the horizon at dawning was the temple of the sun's dawning, at which Nebuchadnezzar officiated as high priest, but after his return, at which Nebuchadnezzar officiated as high priest, but after his return to Hippoa, he built a residential temple up riverwards, called the sun's blessing. Some men have called it the temple of the blessing of light. This was erected in three courts, one of which was called Nefares Memory, a place dedicated to womanly virtues. There, when she came of age, his daughter by Nefare, a maiden called Meriten, was consecrated in service. There is a description of this maiden in a scroll kept at the shrine dedicated to the martyred maidens of chastity at Nomen, the city of forgotten wickedness. It says, As I stood before the gate, called Treasurer of Life, on one pillar, of which was engraved the words, When the eyes see, the ears hear, and the nose smells, they transmit to the spirit, that it understands. I saw the young daughter of the king. She was not tall or fat, and her feet were delicately formed. Her curls were long, but tied back from her face and anointed with sweetly fragrant oils. She passed close by, and I noticed her garments gave out a delicate perfume. Her eyes were large and unusually long-lashed. Her glance was soft and restrained, her whole bearing modest. Her skin was lighter than the pale copper of Askins like the cherished ostrich egg, soft as the finest oil. Her nose was perhaps slightly larger than usual, but fine and delicately formed. Her mouth was small, though the lips were full, and even then tantalizing with secret promise. About her head was a circlet of gold, and she wore a necklace of gold and blue stones. She was clad in a pure garment of fine linen fringed above and below with blue and red. Upon it were workings of gold ornamentation. On her arms were bracelets of burnished copper interwoven with gold and silver. She had just come from the sacred grove, and the glistening dew of morning still dampened the lower fringe of her robe. In one hand, she carried two small bells of copper, and in the other, a small hammer of gold. She was the daughter of the king. Yet among all the high-born ones throughout the long length of the fertile lands threaded like a necklace upon the Nile, there was no man to truly love her. Certainly, many desired her, but who among them could say it was for herself alone, desirable as she was in the eyes of any man? No, she would have gone to her marriage bed unloved as a woman should be loved a pawn in the game of power, a sacrifice at the altar of ambition, a chattel bought as a means of winning favor in the eyes of the ruler, would not her fate have been better had she been born to a herdsman, or were she the daughter of a craftsman? Then she could have delighted in the kiss of the hot sun and the caress of the cool breeze. She could have been loved and wanted for herself alone. Such, however, was not her fate, all things she could have, except this. It was after the consecration of Meriton that the eyes of Nabihatan wandered towards her lustfully, but perhaps, to do him justice, he should not be judged by the same standards as other men. He was the pharaoh of Egypt, who, according to ageless tradition, was above wrongdoing. There is not much doubt but that at this time he was under the control of either a demon or a dark one, which had taken possession of his heart. Also, he had been brought up to a code, where inter-family love and marriage were accepted as the rule where the sanctity of the royal blood and the need for its conservation and purity was believed in as law. 
Then, too, despite his unnatural longings, which he lacked the strength to control and subdue, there is no doubt that he could and did experience extremely deep feelings of affection. He also had an unusually strong, perhaps overwhelming, appreciation of beauty, as can be seen by any of his writings still in existence, though few remain of the great many there once were, and these ever in danger. Anyway, he did take his daughter in awful wickedness, his evil thoughts displaying themselves uncontrollably. Now he took no care to hide them. Throughout the new city, he caused the name of Nefare to be struck out, and the name of Meriton was put in its place. Perhaps the best indication of his state of mind is shown in the prayer he composed for the offering ceremony at the festival of the interning year. With this sacred outpouring we sanctify you, great God of golden goodness, Upon your altar we offer pure butter, cakes of broken barley, fresh meats of clean beasts, dark bread and honey in three shades, two kinds of beer and dark wine poured out before you. Now we open our mouths in praise, Eternal One overlooking heaven and earth. This we do not for ourselves alone, but also for the sanctified dead. Humbly we come before you, humbly we offer our meager sacrifice, and humbly we receive the gracious gifts which grant us our sustenance from day to day and even greater gifts beyond our understanding. We thank you for your peace filling the land with contentment. Teach us the meaning of your ways which we cannot understand. Look down upon us with benevolent kindness when we err. Permit us to assist in accomplishing your will. O Lady of Loveliness, coming forth from your place of vigil, O Lady of Protection, coming forth with your maiden attendance, Speak for me with the tongue of simplicity and the heart of purity. O dedicated maiden, be my mouthpiece in the inner shrine. O sanctified one, be the listening ear before my people. Let your goodness shine upon us as the glory above shines upon earth. Pacify any wrath that rises in the glorious hearts of heat. I know not all the weaknesses and wickednesses of my heart. I who am mortally blind and mortally frail. I know not all the impure longings that possess me, I who am mortally blind and mortally frail. I sought for help, but it came not. I wept, but there was none to comfort me. In the night I cried for succor, but none answered. I who am great have less than the least. O Lady of Loveliness, intercede for me in purity and devotion. Never before had such a prayer been offered in sight of the people by Pharaoh, and the people murmured that divinity had departed from the king. Nabihatan, Pharaoh of Egypt, was a strange mixture of goodness and wickedness, both carried to their extreme. I know not what his form will be in the place where the spirit stands forth in its true aspect. Certainly we are taught that goodness cannot entirely obliterate the evil effects of wickedness. Yet, how much was the king really to blame? How much can be laid at the door of his affliction? How much apportioned to the demons in his limbs? How much to the dark ones that possessed him? These things are beyond judgments by mere mortal men. They can be properly dealt with only by a higher judge, an infallible reader of hearts. Although it had been accepted that the kindred of the Pharaoh could intermarry, any union between parent and child was absolutely forbidden. This law from days long past was still binding, though the law which decreed that any one of royal blood suffering a demon-induced deformity or becoming possessed by a dark one should be given the drought of death was no longer enforced. This proves how evil ensues when old and trusted laws established by the wise ones of old are cast aside. It is folly to thoughtlessly discard that, which has ever served well. Now, when Pharaoh took Meriton in grievous wickedness, the people murmured, but none arose among them to do more, for such is not the custom of the land. Tawi, the great and good, who had lapsed into but one form of wickedness, was no longer there to restrain him, nor in all probability could she have done anything for he was Pharaoh. But when it came to the ears of Hippoah, he took himself into the wilderness and fasted there for seven days. He then returned and gained audience with Nebuchadnezzar. Hippoah went before Pharaoh, and there in the midst of his court he denounced him. These were the words issuing forth from the mouth of Hippoah, as set down by the attending scribe. O great and mighty Pharaoh, where once the storm wind raged, there is now a gentle breeze. 
Where once the diligent shepherd stood, now a musician sits and idly plays. The land is no more as it was, and no man remains content within his dwelling. The north wind has ceased to enter the land, and the south wind eats it up. A heavy hand lies on the hearts of men, and their limbs are sluggish. They are languid and move no longer as they once did. Wherefore has all this come about, the people ask, and I answer them truly. It is because the protective power has departed from the blood of the Pharaoh. It is because the iniquity in the palace. This is a time of woe. These things I have spoken before the eyes and ears of Pharaoh beyond the palace gates. Yet it is not in me to leave them unsaid before the face of the king himself. Where is the great one who sets goodness in the place of wickedness? Where is he who replaces injustice with justice, who hears the cry of the lowly, who causes right to prevail in the land? Where is he? I look and I look in vain. I see only one who has defiled the protective treasures, the glory of Egypt with iniquity. I see only one who has polluted the pure stream with the sewage of evil, who has succumbed to the ultimate in wickedness. This I see, as all men see it. But I am one who sees more. I see an Egypt gone down into dust. I see plague and death stalking the streets. I see the fertile black waters churned back on themselves. I see the black land buried beneath the sand. I see grim-faced men coming from out of the east to stamp the land flat in blood. I see the dread things of the past recurring. I see desolation spread out on every side. Woe to you, great Pharaoh. Woe to the land of Egypt. Goodness lies dying beneath the triumphant foot of evil. Virtue is betrayed into the foul hands of loathsome lust, her despairing cry unanswered by any coming to her aid. Wickedness walks unhampered through the cities, and wrongdoing is seen on every side. Woeful are these days, and doomed are those who endure them. What does the great light shining forth from the palace conceal? Sacred mysteries or secret sins? Then the arm of the pharaoh stretched forth to stop the mouth of Apoa, and it was stopped. He was led forth, and whips were laid on his back, and he was placed within a dungeon. The events that followed remained within a shadow, and none knows the truth, for it was a time of confusion. Meriton probably died of poison administered by her own hand, as was befitting. Her tomb was known, for she was not unhonored. Some say that the same potion slew the king, but others that he died of a dark demon within the heart. It seems that the poison was not a quick one, and while Meriton died in her chamber, after pledging of the king was made, he fell forward with an issue of blood from his mouth. His spirit was heard in his throat. Thus, it does not appear that they were slain with the one cup. It is unlikely that Meriton died by any hand other than her own, though this is said. Some say the king died after being carried to his chamber, others that he had recovered, but the truth is unknown. For at this time the signal was given, and the people arose in the streets. The new worship, which nevertheless was an outgrown from the bulb of truth, died away as the growth dies back on an onion. But like an onion, the bulb remained. The new worship was not unwelcome in the land of Egypt, and would have survived, had not its founder led an impure life. The hostility by priests of the other forms of worship would not have alone sufficed to extinguish its light. It was the maggot in the hearts of the flower he raised that caused it to fall apart. To establish a pure form of worship and beliefs, its founder must also be pure of hands and heart. Whatever happened, Nabihatsun was never placed within the tomb that he prepared for himself. Some say because Hippoa cursed it, but this I doubt. I know of such a curse, but I do not suppose Hippoa would have used it. Some say Pharaoh was buried with his wife, but... Who knows the name of the woman, and whose tomb is she said to lay? I think, however, it is more likely that he is a tombless wanderer, which is not so strange when the record is considered fully. As told, it is not beyond belief that such a fate could have befallen Pharaoh and does accord with the laws of olden days. The next Pharaoh married his sister, conceived in wickedness, and therefore died while yet young. The predictions of Hippoa were averted by the happenings in the land, happenings that purified it during the days of Pharaoh's short-lived successor. 
Then came a great one to rule the land, and peace and prosperity returned. Of his times this is written, Be joyful, O people, for a time of gladness had descended upon the whole land. A righteous and royal king has been set over us, one truly favored in the eyes of the great ones. The waters rise and fall in moderation, the days are long and productive, the hours of night are measured and restful, the moon maintains her appointed seasons, and sunship steers a straight course. The bright torch of heaven burns steadily, and the stars retain their stations. Once more, men must qualify by goodness for the right to govern, and to hold official positions. All is well with the land. If this could be but written of these days. Of the Meritian, wife of Cupola, men said she established a sisterhood of sin. But this is untrue, for they misunderstand the writings. The written things are misread. The writings of men are as plows which cannot follow a straight furrow. Every one at birth is a twin and has a spirit twin. Namertian was, of all women, the most virtuous. Yet surely no woman ever evoked such malice in the hearts of her sisters. Once men said that the king was the shepherd of every man and that wickedness was not in him, that however lowly the man in distress, he would devote hours of his time to bring him justice. If our fathers had but known the nature of the men who would follow as kings, or had the kings of olden days foreseen what was to come, the sons of the kings would have been destroyed, even though they were the seeds of divinity. Perhaps we do injustice to our rulers, for when the governors are bad, maybe they are no worse than a corrupt, degenerate and indifferent generation deserves. When you decry your rulers, read the hearts of your people. The good ruler should not speak falsehood. He should be as great as his responsibilities. Each word should be weighed before spoken, for it is accepted as gold and not as thistledown. He should take heed of his own judgments, for the judgments of eternity draw near. He should be above all an example to all men. The gardener of wickedness waters his land with deceit, and it brings forth falsehood. The good ruler should be above every deed of meanness. He should be the father of the orphan and the husband of the widow. A true leader of the people should be free from every kind of avarice, a man above every kind of pettiness. He should be a man of wide vision. He should be like the rising waters that feed the fertile fields. He should be swift and sure to execute judgment on him to whom punishment is due. Oh, where does he sleep today? In what generation will he come forth? The end of this scroll is unknown. This was not one in the great chest. It is one added in the days of preservation. Oh, hello. We've, we've come to the end here. It's showing six hours long, but I have to edit it down still, so we'll see what it comes after that. Thank you guys so much for joining in. If you're not subscribed by now and you've listened to this entire audiobook... I ain't even mad. I'm impressed. I am impressed. Anywho, I will still be more impressed if you subscribe. Leave some comments. Please leave comments, you guys. The comments help the algorithm. The likes help the algorithm. You guys sharing the content helps the algorithm. Um, please consider joining our Patreon if you made it this far. These projects are pretty substantial, and I could use all the help I can get. Um... Excuse some of the minor blips and stuff you might hear in the background. My child playing the piano, the neighbors hammering on things. You know how it goes. We we don't have our official studio yet, but I love you guys. And, and, and we are growing the channel for exactly that. So thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the content. I really enjoyed this book. Looking forward to the rest of the Colburn Bible. Um, thank you for your support. And I'll see you soon. All right, you guys. This is Keith, you are a man of letters, here to bring you knowledge, information, and hopefully at the very least a bit of entertainment, saying good night or good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good day, Godspeed, and I'll see you soon.